fresh information, but there is an enormous amount, enormous amount of existing data for which we have already invested. Countries have invested, poor countries have invested in collecting data. There's an enormous amount of data out there. And I think it is a, is morally incumbent, 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 morally incumbent on us to be able to, on the international community, to be able to exhaust the possibilities of this data. We are not going to let investment from poor countries into data collection and then do nothing about it. There are also international databases which have to be used, exploited much, much better. That's the first. Second uh, point I would like to pick up is, um, second, 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 connect existing sources. This is, this is something that was picked up also um, by Animesh's overview. There is an incredible amount of siloization. There's no such word, but now you have it. Um, siloization. So the people, we are all, I mean, I can right off the bat today be able to list you about maybe nine or 10 very, very good global databases. None of them communicate with each other and none of them cooperate. Communicate, you know, communicate is a big word. We all communicate, I know all of them. What is more important is another word that, that was used earlier on is interoperability. These silos must be interoperable. Maybe not entirely because some of the, the, the data is, um, is privately owned or has some proprietor, uh, you know, the insurance companies and things, but everybody is willing. Everybody is willing to actually open up and work together to harmonize. So that's the second point I would like to make. The third point, which has not really been much discussed, at least in, in the communities that I move, and maybe you discussed it yesterday, but it was mentioned nonetheless, that is linking the data with end users. I think we have for years now, decades, decades, been solutions without a problem. You know, Pirandello's, uh, um, a drama which was called Six Characters in Search of an Author, Pirandello, the Nobel Prize winning author. Pirandello wrote a piece, drama piece called Six Characters in Search of an Author. And I think we are guilty of that. We just jump in and do what we like, what we think is useful, what we think, but we in academics or in you know highly placed UNM, we think it's useful, we do it. I think that's not going to pass anymore. That is simply not going to pass anymore. And that is thanks to the climate movement. So today we really have to be able to understand what is useful for the frontline workers, what is used at the national level and what is used at the, useful at the regional level. And based on that, these silos have to be broken. So the things, these are what I've said today, the three points are not parallel tracks, they are actually interconnected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. I think deserves a clap for sure. Solutions without problems. Are we uh, heading in that direction or are there some green lights? I think we need to look at the scientific community, Virginia, in terms of uh, the ongoing work on data standards. A lot of work is moving into it from health community and so on as well. So let's hear your views on the question. Thank you, Thank you so much. And my slides are up and hopefully you can see them at the back. I've tried hard to make them work today. But what I really wanted to say was thank you. Thank you to all the scientists in the room and I will be calling out a few, just so you know. So I'm really trying to bring together the incredible UNDRR International Science Council Technical Working Group and the many authors and reviewers who've contributed to the work for the Sendai Framework, Definitions and Classification Review and the Hazard Information Profile. In 2018, in November, we reviewed the Sendai Framework Monitor System. Did it work? And one of the problems that came out was that people struggled with what do all hazards mean? And that became quite an issue so I was asked to support and chair a technical working group, bringing together so many wonderful partners from UNDRR. Where are you? Can you stand up? FAO, you're amazing. WMO, Jim, 
I couldn't have done it without you. But WHO and so many others were just remarkable. But then we had all our International Science Council partners. Osvaldo, are you here? Yes, hooray. But so many of you contributed through the integrating research on disaster risk, co-data and many other groups. But we also brought in the Insurance Development Forum and of course the international humanitarian organizations and many volunteers and many others contributed to trying to work out whether or not what was a hazard. We had a very detailed process. I will not take you through it, but the outcome was a report that was published in July, 2020. We had 302 hazards agreed, hydromet, extraterrestrial, geohazards, environmental, chemical, biological hazards, technological, and although not part of the Sendai framework, societal hazards. But that was for completeness. Each hazard has a primary definition, a scientific definition, which Kansa has asked me to make sure is statistically relevant. Kansa, where are you? There you are, thank you. But also the metrics needed to be there, the key relevant UN conventions, but also the thing that seems to be more important now are the drivers, outcomes and risk management in the essential annotations so that we can help to build what is needed for the future. And then who owns the hazards definitions? I show you a quick example of what they look like. I show you monkeypox in particular. Monkeypox only this week has changed its name, according to the World Health Organization, to MPOX, so we have to update them. So although we published this incredible resource, which I have a copy here, <laughs> it's huge, but we know we need regular review and update. We know we need to be used. We know you are using it but we really need the answers of what you think could be better, could be changed, or what we've missed, or how we can make it work more easily. For I, all the policymakers, scientists in evidence-based national risk assessments, disaster risk reduction, risk-informed sustainable development, and other actions totally relating to data. But we also need to address your complex and cascading hazards and risks that you mentioned, Animesh. But so what we've done is to build a taxonomy that has been driven by the UN landmark agreements of the Sendai framework, the SDGs and the Paris Agreement by providing a common set of hazard definitions, which include monitoring and reviewing implementation. So we need your help. Please tell us what you need. We've also tried to test it to make sure whether it works. So we published this this year. And we did a, we've obviously linked so closely, Jim, to what you do with the cataloging of hazardous events. We link very closely, Animesh, to the interagency expert group on disaster-related statistics with Kansa and many colleagues and Michael. And we also link to the World Health Organization who've done so much to deliver so much of this. But we now need to link to early warning and many other things. So we need your help. So I offer you these images to remember what we've done and where we need to go to in the future. And please help us as we move forward to the next phase of trying to make sure that we update this so we're ready for the Global Platform 2025. Many thanks. Thanks a lot, Virginia. This adds a lot of sense to what we have been discussing since yesterday. And one thing which we can ensure at the minimum is that the new generation disaster loss tracking system would indeed have these hazards reflected. We would also ensure that the Sendai framework monitoring system will have all these hazards reflected so that as we move forward, we have the right level of categorization of hazards so that we can do the right level of analysis. If not, we will never be, we'll keep talking about interconnected and cascading events, but then we need a logic, we need a nomenclature for the events to be connected. And this is where this classification comes into the picture. But we now move to Sani. Sani, yesterday, you were very vocal about use cases. Why are we collecting the data? What are the incentives? Take a step back can we, and kind of elaborate a bit more on the challenge in terms of the data value chain. Are we just talking about solutions without problems? Um, and so on, over to you. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, solutions without problems, I would say there are so many problems. <laughs> Uh, complex uh, that we are facing with. So I'm not worried about uh, solutions without without problems. But but certainly based on what you asked me to present, uh, you know, when the team of UNDP came here, we had to say, uh, secure approval of funding our uh, engagement here. 
And the first question that they ask me and Rajesh, my colleague is, you know, what are you bringing back? Does that help the work that we're doing in the Pakistan flood? And, and I think this is a, what, what we're searching for, no? It's uh, probably a direct answer to your question, you know? What, what is this group adding value to a country like Pakistan, where there have been a lot of tremendous gains already in disaster risk reduction, but the complexity of, of, of the risk that they are exposed to require a different strategic context of how we work together. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues here who are sitting here, who are also part of this process. You know, Jeanette uh, was leading the post-disaster needs assessment, Jan Jeanette Fernandez from Latin America. We have to import him from Panama to help us there. Uh, Rita is uh, leading the disaster recovery framework, the DRF framework. And as we speak today, there's a stakeholders meeting in Islamabad to consider how do you bring the PDNA into more practical investment options. Uh, I am involved in a very difficult question about what should we be doing differently? Uh, if, if, for example, if there's a perfect forecast, should we, should we have avoided the tremendous loss and damages there, about $40 billion? So it's really for, for UNDP, it's uh, the strategic context. And I referred to Rahul Sengupta's first slide yesterday that, yeah, indeed, disaster risk reduction had gone a long way. Some of these are parallel to, to my life and Debbie's life for more than 30 years. Uh, but are we doing enough? Uh, and, and, and this is where, Animes, the, the, the question really is about the, the, the new rationale for being us as an international organization, for governments, for being us who have the authority and resources and power to do something about it. And the discussion about uh, the, the digital, uh, the, the, the chain, the value chain becomes relevant if we are looking at the problem in that broader context. From UNDP, uh, you know, especially for all, all, us who are working at the country level, and we have heard it from the discussions yesterday, it, it's about uh, you know, the questions that Angelica, my colleague here, is leading on the UN resilience agenda. You know. Uh, what, what, what has changed since the pandemic happened? And what does the future look like? Uh, shouldn't we just be looking at only early warning system, but we should have more and better capacity and foresighting, sense making and portfolio development. You know, these are jargons that would basically say uh, how we, how we work, work collaboratively together. And, and when we say we, I mean, we're all threatened by different fear. Uh, and this is part of the human security report. Uh, both developed and developing countries are, have fear and greater anxiety uh, compared to 10 years ago. And of course, as we say at UNDP, as someone who had been working on the SDG, most of the development goals will not be achieved by 2030. Now, let, let me shift to, towards, okay, what do we do then? Uh, and, and, I, and I'm happy to hear from Debbie what he's saying about the, the three things, and I agree with that. Uh, but I'll give examples to, 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 to illustrate that we could do more. Uh, we, Rajesh and I work, started working with UNDP when the Indian Ocean tsunami happened in 2004. Uh, and here, this is one very good demonstration of the value chain. You know, uh, Yuichi would know about this from Tohoku University when he was still with UNDRR and WMO. But the international community collaborated to establish one of the most successful regional tsunami warning service provider, uh, RTWSP, which is established in Thailand through Rhymes uh, to in, 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 uh, Australia, uh, in Australia, in Indonesia, parallel to the official JMA. And uh, I think the Australia is the other one. So the, 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 the value chain is not only local, it, it brings together expertise from different organizations. Some of the modeling happened here in Germany. Some of the assessment happens in Germany, but the actual application happened in Banda Aceh, in places that were affected in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, and all of those things. So that, that's a very successful one. And what we have heard from the previous discussion and what we are also aiming here is how do we scale up this sustainable, scalable model where you know, not all of the capacity may not be in one location. It could be in different locations. And, and we heard from, uh, from uh, various, uh, at least in Group C, uh, some, some efforts, for example, in addressing 
uh, many aspects related to, for example, uh, uh, as part of the value chain uh, uh, for for Abdin, for example, that ESCAP is talking about. Uh, ESCAP has pro just produced a risk and resilience portal. You know, for a country who cannot afford a geospatial web-based platform, this is one of the regional organizations the commission who can put, put that together. But it, it, it also doesn't displace what's happening at the ground level. In the pandemic, one of the most successful data generation is data generated from the community and from volunteers, uh, which this is what we call sentinel surveillance, which is monitoring of specific diseases from volunteers on the ground. So from a, use, from a business case, I think we, have, we, we, we take the Davis challenge of let's move towards an action, a business model starting from at least three elements that we're talking about here, data governance, data standards, and data architecture. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sani. So as we Shukran, start Jazeera, moving towards the second part of the discussion, now. The key point which is coming up very clearly is what should we, we be doing differently? Should we be doing more of what we have been doing or should we do something transformative? Um, perhaps my answer would be both because things are working and there are gaps, but we need to build on what we are doing and not start from the scratch. So I would ask the panelists to provide a short solution from your side or something which you really want to impress upon the participants in towards a solution while you do that, let me open the floor for some reflections from the floor. Any of you, well, not a question per se, but any of your thinking that you would want to bring up. Coco. Thanks so much, Animesh, and thank you and congratulations for this really remarkable technical expert workshop. Um, I'm Coco Warner. I'm from the UNFCCC here and just across the way. And um, like many of you have just come back from Sharm El Sheikh and reference has been made to some really remarkable work on adverse climate change impacts. One is of course, new arrangements for funding um, for such impacts to address them and to figure out what to do. Of course, the Santiago network that many of you have contributed very substantially to, including UNDRR. So a reflection and also a little bit of a question. For those of you who are looking at the decision on funding arrangements um, for loss and damage, there's a paragraph, it's paragraph six, and it really orients the work on funding arrangements for action, as many of you said, towards this recognition that we're spanning rapid onset slow onset, a lot of processes that, like you said, Animesh, we understand, and many more that we don't really have a good idea what's upon us. So there's both what's known as well as uncertainty. There are um, stocks and there are flows. For example, human mobility has been drawn out. They're non-economic and economic. And this is a huge opportunity. So I actually nodded my head vigorously to what you just said last, Animesh, um, more from you as an expert community and also definitely different. So the main question that I have is exactly the one that you're all grappling with and providing leadership. What are the immediate next steps, the 1% shifts with your donors, with the way that you classify your data, the headers and the columns of the data that you do gather that can lead in a transformative direction. So I, I think transformation means a different horizon that we're aiming for um, rather than doing a larger scale of what we're already doing. And I'm really curious, what will you go back um, in December and January and talk to your boards? What would you ask your donors to allow you to do to enable all of the things that we've talked about here. Would you ask your donors for flexibility? Would you ask for new types of partnerships? I'm just really curious, what are the specific things that you would do differently to start filling some of these important gaps? Thank you so much. Sorry for the long preface. No, thanks a lot, Coco. And that, that is definitely a question that we should be further discussing and brainstorming on. What came out very clearly from yesterday's first discussion as well, is that as this loss and damage discussion and thanks to this COP27 as well with the funding arrangement in the Santiago network uh, galloping moving forward, is 
transitioning from just being a political issue to a technical and substantive issue. These are the discussions which will inform it further because the first question we need to understand is when we talk about funding for loss and damage, we need to know how much we're losing. And unless we have the right matrix standards data in place, we will not be able to answer that question. So, but that is what this forum would want to do. Let me take a couple of quick more thoughts. Uichi san okay. Yeah, thank you, Animesha Yuichi san from uh, Tohoku University. So, my I have a play that uh, you know the 110 countries uh, having uh, loss and damage data started having it, and 115 to start with the sender monitoring. Rest of the countries, 80 some countries, are left out at this moment. So rather than setting the bar too high at this moment, we should stick to the existing um, Sendai uh, terminology and indicators. Beyond that, I, I, I like your idea to have a standardization and framework uh, setting. That's, that's good. But please uh, do not forget about those left out countries who are not here at this moment. So for that, the practical solutions would be for the, we depend need to depend more on the country-based uh, organizations. Well, UNDP is already here with us, but uh, JICA or COICA or the USA, the US, many bilateral donors. Uh, if you have a good strategy to ask them to have a help, then they'll be more efficient to do that. And also the last point is uh, connectivity. You mentioned some of you. So for example, the WMO's hazard catalog and the loss and damage database, or well, that's connectivity is important. So uh, one solution for more than 20 years already, the uh, CRED is also adapted, uh, the, and uh, this GLIDE, GLIDE is a numbering system to connect other data and already used by the humanitarian agencies. So as a chair of the GLIDE system right now, I would really want to help out uh, this connectivity issue. Thank you. Thank you, H. San, and I believe everyone would agree that it's, uh, it will always be feeding into each other. We need to have the right standards and methodologies only when we will have the right level of uh, reporting on the Sendai framework as well. We also would need to understand that we have 110 countries that have this inventor as of now, and 155 countries reporting on Sendai framework monitor. So there are 45 countries that do not have this inventor, but are reporting. What are they using for their data collection? And I think there's a lot happening there as well. We need to keep an eye on. You would also see that the 110 countries which have a disaster loss database through this inventor, and if you look at the countries which do not have, many of the developed countries have their own data system. And this inventor was geared towards more developing countries that would need technical assistance to develop databases. So I think this is the whole ecosystem in which we need to further operate. I'm looking at Rita, but okay, Rita, and then last one there. Wait. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Animesh, uh, for this opportunity to speak briefly. I don't want to preempt Jeanette's uh, presentation, but just in the context of what we were speaking right now and what uh, Devarati said in terms of connecting, I think one of the important things that as, as the global anchor for post-disaster needs assessment along with the EU and the World Bank, I would like to also state at this point of time that when we do post-disaster needs assessment based on the national sectors of the national economy, we do uh, a loss and damage assessment or damage and loss as we call it in the PDNA. And within that, we have very uh, strong baselines that are built up. For us right now, the, the mandate is how do we then connect the baselines, establish it very well, and connect it event after event, and then the interoperability with something like the descendant are something that we should have explored earlier, but we haven't been able to do it, but now it's become imperative for us to do that. So it, through this uh, whole, I, and I inserted myself literally into this conversation, um, when Rajesh and when I heard Rajesh and uh, Sunny are coming here only because there's a tremendous opportunity there and we should not lose that opportunity. Countries are adopting the baseline data systems for necessary for conducting post-disaster needs assessment. And these are based on the national sector of the economy. So it's very important that we, we think through about how these data sets will be stronger link to other data sets like this and and Sendai monitoring framework so that you know we we do have something more concrete to offer particularly for countries who want to access the loss and damage front which is the most exciting thing for me that coming out from the cop 27 thank you thank you i think that's a very concrete suggestion in terms of having the right baselines and these databases contributing to that for the for informing pdnas but then pdna feeding back into these databases as well last point from there and then i'll get back to the panel 
Yeah, I want to thank everyone for their contributions this morning. Really fascinating uh, topics brought up. And Paul, I think it's uh, really fascinating that you talk about what not to do, because I think everyone wants to shout about their successes, but I think equally is important. So other people don't waste time and resources pursuing the same thing we did as to talk about where we would have done things differently. Um, but just as a quick follow up on Virginia's presentation on the hazard information profiles, uh, UKHSA has heard a few rumours that they are being unofficially translated by colleagues in other countries. Uh, we're hearing that some people might be putting a lot of work into translating it into Bahasa and Portuguese and Spanish, uh, though we haven't heard who's doing this and that would obviously make them a lot more accessible to uh, other colleagues. So if you are working on, tra on a translation or know of any other translations out there, can you please let UKHSA know because that would be great to know about. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, introduce so that we, no for no takers? Yeah, thank you. This is Megan Cook from UKHSA. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. And we will contact you for further discussion on this. Virginia, you want to directly respond something on this? Thanks, Megan. Absolutely right. But I also wanted to respond to Coco and Arita. Um, I wanted to say something that you and I have known for years. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. We have to measure and the hazards give us that route to be able to measure at least what's going on in our country, but also transboundaries and sharing that. And I really want my final message is the climate crisis, Coco, is a health crisis. And as a health person, I'm really worried about what we're going to do. Your help will be so important. Thanks, Virginia. So let me try to conclude the panel, but with uh, closing remarks, short, what are your proposed way forward solutions, Paul? Thank you very much. I think the one for me is learning, co-design, co-create together. Learning is my big one and collaboration. Thank you. Debbie. Um, I'll pick up on what Coco said earlier on, and she asked a very specific question. And uh, for me, the answer to that is really um, the main issue over here. There is no business as usual anymore for disaster data. There simply isn't business. We have done business as usual for last many, many years. And since, say, the middle of this decade, not this one, sorry, the previous one, um, it has the, the, the changes in technological uh, advances and the, the cheapness of technological advances. That is today, it's very, very affordable. You know, 15 years ago, it was not available, uh, affordable. Satellite images cost a fortune and you had to pay. All that is finished. So technology has changed fantastically. Data sources have become much more varied, much more varied than what we are used to. And interoperability because of the technology has become also extremely easy. So what we are looking for here is a transformative change. We are looking for a transformative change. We are not looking for business as usual. We need a sea change. And I think donors, Coco mentioned donors. I think donors, there is an appetite amongst the donors for this trans. They are willing to take the risk. If you come with a well-founded solution, they are willing to take the risk. They will take the risk and see whether this investment works or not. So yes, transformative change. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, Virginia. I'm allowed another go. Thank you very much. I think to me, the most important thing is everybody working together and having you all in the same room is fantastic. But now we need to pull this together to make sure that we can bring all the evidence together that we are going to be able to, to support the transformative change, but also how we really make a difference and document these events more clearly so we understand what the impacts are properly. Thanks, Virginia. That was a scientist sitting here who gave you the second chance to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny. How many chances? <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Uh... Uh, first, let me just uh, reply uh, to Coco uh, because I'm for UNDP. I'm the technical lead of UNDP, following the loss and damage discussion. The first point I wish to make is that uh, there are many other things that are happening outside of the COP27. Uh, the COP27 has the processes. But really, if you look at the organizations around here, you know, they all represent, and you will, if you listen to the next present, set of presentations, they all represent, you know, efforts that are already being undertaken, whether it's a development program to address de development deficit, whether there is an issue of 
uh, enhancing early warning system uh, or looking at more comprehensive risk management within the Sendai framework for DRR. Uh, and there also there are sectoral work that's happening in the health, in human mobility. Uh, and these are all in the Article 6 that you are referring to. So that, that's my first point. I think the challenge is not only for donors, but, but for the challenge is also for this group here. And as you just said, those that are not in here too, uh, that has to be accepted. So, so for me, I think you know, the, the, the way forward is, I agree with the co-creation. Uh, that is why we are here working with WMO and DRR, but also to, to ensure that the co-creation require the engagement of people and users who should be working on this. Uh, we call it the human, human centric approach, the human centered approach. You know, if we are to look at enhancement of early warning system and data ecosystem, you know, we have to look at it from the perspective of users and leave no one behind is a very important principle in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sani. So we come to the end of uh, this panel discussion and the key takeaway, um, I think one thing which I would want to reiterate as was uh, picked up by other panelists as well, that um, it was very clear as the discussion on losses and damages and within the climate community continues to happen, we need to further appreciate the fact that it's a very complex issue and the, the climate emergency has solutions, not necessarily within the framework of the convention of UNFCCC, but there are solutions happening outside. And unless we bring these all together, we will not be able to solve the climate emergency and its challenges. So let's work all together and also happy to inform that this was precisely the reason that this event is also part of the work plan of the executive committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism, in particular, the technical expert group on comprehensive risk management. So we are also contributing through this event to the loss and damage discussion of the UNFCCC while learning back and providing and developing a feedback loop in the process. So thank you very much. I think this is a very good uh, start of the day. And now we move towards the next session where we have presentations from different international organizations for which I pass over to Matthias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Animesh. And uh, before we move into the next set of presentations, um, collaboration is key. We saw it in the Slido exercise. We heard it here on the panel. We need each other. We need to collaborate with each other. So uh, in order to have some physical activity before we um, move into the next uh, session, why don't you get up and high five a couple of people around you? Yeah, just give some high fives to the ones next to you and behind you, yes, and say, we can do this together. Very good. I see some good energy here in the room. So at this point, I want to invite uh, Miss Anna Vukoye of UNFCCC to the podium, Janet Fernandez of UNDP, Andrea Salvi of the European Commission, and Jonas Weiss, IBM. Would you please join me here on the podium? Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi. Hi. Good morning. Thank you so much for not sharing business cards. That was yesterday, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So the 
goal of the next session is uh, to discuss solutions and approaches and to respond to the question what is being done to facilitate and standardize event and impacts recording and i'm delighted to be joined by colleagues from international organizations um, we begin with unf triple c secretariat um, Ms. anna vukoye um, you're with the WIM Secretariat at UNFCCC. Over to you, and let me remind you that you have uh, seven minutes each. Um, please uh, stick to the time. To hmm? you wish. I wish. Yeah, and you can do it. You can do it. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I will do my best to be very brief, but please feel free to cut me off. And um, I first would like to thank everybody for the very concrete and very technical discussions that we have had in the last couple of days. No, well, yesterday and today. My uh, presentation will be a bit different because I will try to uh, give a bit of context to all the comments we have heard connecting this meeting with COP27, and also to try to give a partial answer to the lingering question of what we need data for, especially in the context of loss and damage. So next slide, please. Um, we have heard quite a bit on the fact that there aren't um, very stringent definitions around loss and damage, which is true. We do rely a lot on constructive ambiguity at the UNFCCC, but we do have a, a working definition of what we mean when we talk about losses and damages. And it is uh, climate change impacts, not only from disasters and extreme weather events, but also from slow onset events. And we have a pictorial representation of a non-exhaustive pictorial um, representation, and we refer to both economic losses, meaning those that are usually um, traded on markets like losses of income or damages to physical assets, but also non-economic losses, meaning damages and losses to individuals, society, and the environment. Next slide. Uh, and while uh, COP27 has definitely been quite a breakthrough uh, for loss and damage uh, as a topic, Discussions around loss and damage have been followed, um, have been present in the UNFCCC process for quite some time now, since the very beginning. They have first become present in a negotiated outcome at COP13 as part of the Bali Action Plan, but um, they have really uh, followed the, the very establishment of the convention itself. And here we see a bit of a timeline that can be divided into more or less three phases. An initial one, uh, which really uh, focused mostly on scoping and assessment work, which went from COP13 to roughly COP19. At COP19, we had another big breakthrough for loss and damage with the establishment of the Warsaw International Executive. Uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism and its Executive Committee, which started um, a second phase, which was really the initiation of technical work around loss and damage. And then a third phase, which we are entering into now, which really focuses on catalyzing concrete solutions for, for developing countries. And so next slide, please. Uh, talking about the Warsaw International Mechanism, it uh, has been established in 2013 and has been reaffirmed by the Paris Agreement as really the main vehicle under the UNFCCC process to address loss and damage associated with, uh, with climate change impacts. It has uh, three functions that the Executive Committee supports uh, in implementing, which uh, revolve around enhancing knowledge and understanding of comprehensive risk management approaches, strengthening dialogue, uh, coordination, coherence, and synergies. And we've heard so much about the need to strengthen collaboration and synergies. And then finally, enhancing action and support, including finance, technology, and capacity building to, to address loss and damage. Next slide. Since 2013, the institutional uh, ecosystem of the, of the WIM has grown quite a bit. And apart from the executive committee, it can now also count on five expert groups. Many organizations present here in the room are part of those expert groups. Animesh before referenced how this is contributing to the plan of action of one of our expert groups, which is the technical expert group on comprehensive risk management. But we have expert groups focusing on slow onset events, on non-economic losses, on action and support, and we have a task force on displacement. Uh, next slide. One of the important uh, new aspects of the ecosystem of the WIM, which has been referenced uh, in, the, in the last couple 
well, yesterday and, and today, is the Santiago network, which was established at uh, COP25 uh, in the framework of the review of the Warsaw International Mechanism. And the idea behind the Santiago network is to really catalyze technical assistance of relevant organizations, bodies and networks and experts for the implementation of uh, approaches to avert, minimize and address loss and damage at the national level. The UNFCCC Secretariat has the interim mandate to provide support while we're waiting for the um, selection of a permanent host. And there has been quite a bit going on concretely in the meantime. We have had marketplace meetings where countries have been put in contact with uh, technical assistance providers. We have had a Santiago Network survey where we've tried to identify the needs of countries and 24 countries have responded so far and data has featured quite prominently in the needs that have been identified by countries on what kind of technical assistance they need to, to respond to loss and damage. And data needs have varied from collection of data, management of data and information, but also analysis. Um, next slide. These are just uh, briefly uh, the, the functions um, of the Santiago network to, to give you a bit more of an idea of what the Santiago network aims to do. And next slide, trying to be very brief, um, wanted to focus um, on the um, outcomes of COP27 that have been referenced um, quite extensively. Um, they can be structured around three parts, uh, those related to the WIM EXCOM, um, which is a uh, standing item uh, at the COP and the CMA. We have had, uh, as we usually have every year, recommendation based on the implementations uh, or implementation of the WIM uh, EXCOM five-year rolling work plan. But the novelty this year is also the fact that we have um, endorsed a new five-year rolling work plan. And in this new five-year rolling work plan, there is again this shift towards implementation and towards catalyzing concrete solutions on the ground for countries. Data features quite prominently also in our new plan of action. And is, as it does in the second plan of action of the tech CRM and in the third plan of action of the, the task force on displacement. There is also a mandate to strengthen collaboration with the CGE. Um, which also is quite linked to data needs for countries to, to be able to, to really report and strengthen reporting, especially in the context of the um, enhanced transparency framework. Then there are those related to the technical assistance for loss and damage in the context of the Santiago network, where the institutional arrangements of the Santiago network has have now been decided and finalized. There is also a concrete process for the selection of a host, which we expect to be finalized by the end of 2023. And then the, the new kid on the block that everybody has been referencing so much these days, um, the new funding arrangements that have been established for loss and damage. And just last slide, and I'll uh, try to be really, really quick. Um, there has been, uh, the decision to establish new funding arrangements. We have, uh, in the context of the funding arrangements, uh, a new fund has also been uh, decided. And we have a year to really understand what this fund will look like. A transitional committee uh, will meet at least three times next year, and with the idea of providing recommendations to COP28 for consideration. And these recommendations will focus on the institutional arrangements, modality, structure governance, identifying and expanding those that are the sources of funding and ensuring coordination and complementarity, which we have heard so much about. Just one last second on caveats for, for what are the data needs, um, because we're trying to really, through this, answer the question of what we need the data for. I think for us, it's very important to highlight that the data that we need for loss and damage goes beyond disasters. So for us, it's really essential to consider also slow onset events and that it also goes beyond economic losses. And we really need to know also what is happening for non-economic losses. Thank you so much also for the indulgence. Thank you very much, Anna. Very exciting. Thanks for putting our discussions in the context also of the UNFCCC process and for making the link uh, back to COP27. We move on to PDNAs and uh, Jeanette Fernandez um, of UNDP. And 
Yes. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to present uh, some of the key aspects of the post-disaster needs assessment methodology. The next slide, please. This is a methodology that has been uh, jointly developed by the UN system at large, the World Bank and the EU, and has been jointly promoted <laughs> since 2008. Uh, the PDNA is uh, basically a framework that it's uh, intended to assist the governments to estimate the extent of uh, disaster effects, as we call it, and we are going to clarify this definition of effects and impact across all sectors and social groups. On the basis of these findings, basically we are promoting uh, not to stick only to the assessment itself, but to move forward and try to understand how we can uh, inform a, a comprehensive recovery uh, program and recovery processes that looks into the physical aspects, but also, and more importantly, keeping uh, the person as a center in the, this uh, reconstruction and recovery processes. Next, next slide, please. Basically, the methodology looks into um, uh, specific sectors and how these uh, different sectors have been affected by the disaster that we have at hand. Uh, these are the main groups of sectors, and these basically are aligned to the national systems uh, accounting uh, in each one of the countries. And basically, we are going to look into the productive sectors, the social sectors, the infrastructure sectors. But also, we have um, uh, what we call the cross-cutting issues that need to be looked at in each one of the different sectors, right? Which are related to, to uh, key elements like governance, environment, gender, disaster risk reduction, employment, and livelihood. Um, once we have uh, uh, analyzed what has happened in each one of the different sectors, we conduct a comprehensive and, uh, analysis of the overall impact at large at the subnational and national levels in order to inform the recovery strategy. Next slide, please. And I think I, I would like to, uh, to speak a little bit to this slide because it's key in terms of the definitions that we are looking for and how we can harmonize these definitions in terms of damage and loss. Basically, the methodology looks into what we call uh, four dimensions of the analysis. And basically, the first part of the analysis is uh, looking into what has happened into the infrastructure and physical assets in each one of the different sectors, right? For example, if we are looking into schools and hospitals uh, in the health sector and the education sector or roads and bridges in the transport sector. Uh, and. Um, I think it's key to make an emphasis here because most of the assessments in the past were concentrated into this um, dimension, no? physical infrastructure and how to rebuild. Uh, but the PDNA has added three other, method, uh, um, three other dimensions in the analysis, basically trying to understand what has happened in terms of disruption of the production and goods and services, but access to, to do those goods and services what happens to the decision-making capacity at the uh, uh, community level, but also at the national and subnational levels, and what happens with these increased and risks that are uh, derived from the uh, disaster that we have enhanced. And I am using um, three, uh, two different colors here because there's a direct linkage between what, how we understand the cost to repair or rebuild the infrastructure in terms of, of what we call the damage. And some other some countries and some other initiatives, they call it direct loss, for example. This is something that we need to harmonize. The three other elements, which are uh, in light uh, blue, basically are linked to what we call the changes in economic flows. And this leads to the concept of, of loss, basically, where losses in the PDNA methodology are, are understood into three elements again. Uh, the foregone income, basically, but also the additional costs that you need to put in place uh, in order to, to, to put back your services and in, in order to provide access to those basic services. Um, I think it's important to mention that the methodology is very flexible, can be adapted and adjusted to different conditions and circumstances. Uh, for example, we have used the methodology to address the, the pandemic, for example, recently, where uh, you can understand that the pandemic, for example, it doesn't create any uh, physical destruction, right? Where the losses then are very important because of the measures that we took in order to close the 
the, the businesses and, and these kinds of measures that we took. So uh, depending on the type of hazard that we are looking at, there would be a preeminence on the uh, damage or what we call the loss, right? For example, in an earthquake, damage would be very high as compared to, to losses. But uh, in a pandemic, there were only losses and no damages, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a quick definition. Uh, damage uh, refers to the total of, or partial destruction of infrastructure and physical assets. It's important to understand that damage is an economic concept in the PDNA. And uh, just to add some details, the costing is um, estimated in terms of the cost to replace and rebuild infrastructure and physical assets to the situation, um, to the pre-disaster situation. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of loss, we are looking into, as I said, the changes in economic flows. It's important to understand uh, the, 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 the time frame uh, no, in order to understand how long would it take to cost your uh, foregone income, for example, and also the additional cost that you need to, to put in place. Next slide. Uh, this methodology has been uh, promoted uh, extensively since, since 2008. Uh, it's important to mention that this methodology is based uh, on the DALA methodology, but has added these ad additional components which are related to the human impact assessment. Uh, trying to understand uh, what you have said in uh, the previous intervention, the non-economic uh, uh, issues are around the, the disaster impact. Um, next slide, please. Uh, also, this methodology, the PDNA, has uh, been um, linked closely to another methodology, which basically is trying to understand uh, what's happening in terms of uh, in those countries that are um, in conflict situations and where uh, different but uh, related analysis needs to be done. Uh, next, next slide. And um, I think it's important to mention that uh, since 2008, the methodology has been um, has put together, um, or the, the joint partnership has put together a large capacity building and training in, in many countries. So far, there's um, a um, solid uh, uh, documentation in terms of the methodology itself, uh, where you can understand how to undertake this process in um, 16 uh, sectors, for example, but also how to move with that information uh, sector-wise uh, in, in, in an integrated manner to put together recovery strategies. Uh, there are training packages uh, for online uh, and self-paced training, and also a solid roster of experts globally and regionally in different countries. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Jeanette. We move on to the European Commission. We have Mr. Andrea Salvi with us, um, who's uh, working with the Joint Research Center. Thank you for being with us. Over to you. Thank you. So it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to present one of our activities. And in particular, in the framework of the Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Center, we have this activity called, that goes by the name of Risk Data Hub. And Today, I will highlight a bit the main features of this platform, of this activity, and its disaster and loss data um, damage module. Uh, next slide, please. So the Risk Data Hub is really a web GIS application that aim to host, curate, and disseminate uh, pan-European DRM data. We support multi-hazard estimation, multi-asset, and multi-sector, and I will be detailing a bit um, how we approach uh, that for losses in a minute. The activity is structured in a modular way as it is composed of six main modules that aim to serve different ends and to serve, support different stakeholders in uh, their, its functioning itself. The next slide, please. The module that are detailed as uh, follows in the slide that you can see projected there. We have a risk analysis data portal that is essentially curated European-wide data risks, thus looking at the future in a time horizon that I will uh, um, deep in a bit later. We have the disaster loss and data portal, which I think is extremely of interest uh, for this context. Uh, the DRM data from other projects, which is uh, closely tied with the so-called user corner, another module that we have. And the reason for that is that the user corner together with the 
DRM data from other projects section allows user to use the platform, to use the risk data to store their data, make their analysis, um, and use all the capabilities of our, of our platform and of our open data sets. Then we have the learning space, which is mainly a training section. And I strongly recommend to visit that for more info on, the, on our activities. And the facts and figures section, which allow to generate ad hoc reports on our extensive data sets, both for risks and losses. Now on to the next slide, I will present some general concept of how the platform work, how is it is intended to be um, built. And uh, then we will move into the next, the last section. So the whole platform is based on a map viewer that allows to map one or more hazards onto one or more assets. So we do support multi-asset and multi-hazard assessment. The time frame for the map viewer covers one to 25 years, both in the past, from one to 25 years, both in the past and in the future, respectively, for losses and risk. And we offer different level of aggregations that are based on the GISCO administrative boundaries, therefore country, NATS2 and NATS3, but we do support also municipality and local administrative units um, if data are provided. Our data set stops at NATS3 at the moment, but if users are interested to conduct specific case studies, we do support lower level of uh, um, detail. We also support different units uh, uh, and different metrics. So our main um, product works on a 0 10 indicator, normalized indicator, but we offer also raw data and absolute values and ratio based on uh, values of the administrative boundaries as well. Different metrics that are compatible with the Sendai target set, as I will show you in a minute. On to the next slide. We discussed extensively the benefits of collecting accurate um, lost data in those days. So I'm going to skip on that. But what I want to highlight is what we actually do with our dat data and with our activities. Um, we actually really want to contribute and support, and we are actively engaged with several EU missions and several EU activities, including the EU mission on climate uh, adaptation, the knowledge pillar of the EU civil protection knowledge network, and we support different DGs of the service uh, with our data activity and data generation process. Now, onto the next slide, we dive into the actual uh, loss and damage data that we offer. We do offer a data set of open source collection of extreme events and related impacts coming from those events. We have over 40,000 of them at the moment, uh, ranging from the beginning of 19,000 to 2022. Um, as you can see, we follow a breakdown by categories that um, he, he does geophysical, hydrological, climatological, and so on, with a certain prevalence of meteorological and event. Here on the graph, you can see the event count. And here you, on the right, you have a, a disaggregation by source uh, for floods, for instance, of how our data set is composed. I want to reiterate again, this is all coming from open sources. Um, and I will be detailing the, a bit the, pro, the, pro, the process of recording in a second. We made some comparison, of course, with alternative data sets uh, of loss and damages. And uh, the really good news is that given to the fact that we store also zero impact events, we do have on average 50% more events uh, than other data sets, than several of the data sets out there. We tend to overestimate uh, slightly the uh, number of fatalities actually, but this is mainly due per single event. But this is mainly due to the fact that, as I said, we do have zero impact events. So if something happened but had no impact, we still record it and we put a zero onto that too keep it in our data sets and know the prevalence of the event in a, in a specific location. If we look at the aggregate, however, we do have uh, roughly 15% more casualties than um, uh, other authoritative data sets that we compared with. There is a upcoming report on this uh, data set validation that um, will be made available on our website. And now on to the uh, actual recording. So the next slide. How does it work? As I said, it's all about open sources. So we have a process um, 
and several systems to gather all this information from newspaper articles, crowdsourced uh, resources, even Wikipedia and the like, uh, specialized data sets. We have, you have some example here for floods, like flood list, and that's DF, the graph is from DFO, the flood observatory. And then we encode all these impacts and events onto our data sets with different metrics and store that into our uh, data set, database, disambiguating the uh, duplicates and the recurring events in the same area. So we have some time threshold and space threshold that I'm not going to discuss here in details for time constraints, but we do take care of making sure that there are no repetition, that each event is disambiguated and uh, um, validated. Uh, on to the next slide, you have a brief example of how one event is encoded. We have 16 unique descriptors for each event. Uh, detailing the metric, what really happened, what is the metric we are looking at, uh, what is the start date, uh, and, and the like. We cross-check the lo location of the impact, and if that is uh, interesting several areas, we have an estimation procedure to divide the impacts across the, in the, the areas of interest. Based wherever it, we, it, we can, we prioritize um, the accurate information on the specific location of the impact. If not, we resort to our exposure data to assign that to a specific area. On to the next slide, uh, we'll uh, detail a bit the metric that we offer for uh, our events and impacts. We do have economic loss, as I said, we both for the um, hazards and assets, we follow the UNR, uh, UNDRR definitions and our system is able to generate, and as I will show you in a second, on-demand graphs of Sendai targets and Sendai indicators. So we try to make to be as compatible with other systems with other systems as we can here. We have direct economic losses, so we have a estimation of economic damage that is then um, essentially actualized to our year of reference set to 2015 for our particular approach. On to the next slide, we have uh, human losses divided into fatalities, people affected, the people injured, and we also offer another, another metric, uh, which is basically the area affected by um, a certain impact. This is an example from EFIS, uh, so from uh, um, European data on uh, wildfires. And on to the next slide, you have several examples of how the platform is able from the basic map, map viewer, where you can actually see an aggregated version of the data localized at country level, province level, or um, region level, or even, again, municipalities, if the data allows. It generates figures on demands on trends, rankings of countries, but also, again, Sendai indicator, as, uh, uh, as mentioned early, earlier. Here we have the, um, the one based on people, essentially A1, B2, B1, and B2. And in the next slide, you have another example um, with direct economic losses disaggregated by sector. This is something we also offer. So uh, all the assets we have are um, as much as possible disaggregated by sector, agricultural, commercial, and the like. Now, on to the conclusion. Uh, we, of course, strive to keep enlarging and deepen deepening our collection of data to encompass also further hazard that we were detailed in the previous section. We can't, for, of course, um, forget man-made threats, physical impacts, uh, pandemics risk, and so on. Uh, there are, of course, some geographical limitations attached to the, our approach, given that we cover mainly um, the European continent, and that kind of makes us miss all the potential indirect losses and spillover effects stemming from uh, nearby impacts, for example. But we do um, bet a lot on our user corner, as I mentioned earlier, which allows essentially project consortia, local authority institution, or whoever has interest to use the platform to store their own data, store them safely, privately, or publicly, depending on on their standards, on the sensitivity, on the data and the like, and use our platform to harmonize their data, generate on-demand analysis, and as has been reiterated many times, I want to say that again, that 
collaboration is key because a tool is what it is to a certain degree without a true collaboration and true and true interoperability, which is achieved uh, with organizational communication, organizational cooperation among institutions, people, the researchers, and the like. So if you want to learn more about our activities, we have an extensive uh, webinars and video section. And uh, sorry for taking an extra minute here. And, and again, it was a pleasure to briefly present our work here. Thank you, Andrea. And we move on to Jonas Weiss uh, with a private sector presentation. Um, Jonas is a PhD in physics and AI for climate impact and is with IBM. Jonas, over to you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, as was introduced, my name is Jonas Weiss. I'm with IBM Research in Zurich. And it's a great pleasure being here and honor as coming from the private sector. I will be talking about the GeoLab and the climate network. Now, the story of GeoLab and the climate network started a long time ago when we started building or we actually built a small, tiny methane sensor. Next slide, please. Eventually, we wanted to deploy that little sensor in a, in a fracking field and needed to understand where do we put them because they only have like, we have, there's a finite number of them and we needed to understand where to put them. So we looked at geospatial data, uh, applied an inverse Gaussian plume model to identify spot sources so we had a better idea actually to place them. During the course of that work, we started understanding and kind of recognizing the need for a data platform to be able to handle and manage increasingly larger amounts of data. We couldn't find what we needed, so we built it ourselves. It's called Pairs. Next slide. And eventually made it into a, a commercial offering, which is called the IBM Environmental Intelligence Suite. Over the years, we've worked with customers on use cases, as you can see here, from renew renewable energies, uh, air quality monitoring, disaster uh, management, greenhouse gas monitoring, a lot of agricultural use cases or logistics planning and spatial assets management. Now, if you start working on these use cases with this kind of data, sooner or later, you encounter one big problem. Next slide, please. Data is becoming really, really big. And at some point, eventually, you won't be able to store all the data that you need for what you want to do on your own, uh, on your own premise. So that's a big problem. The next point is you actually need this data, these, all these modalities, if you want to create the insights, which are valuable. So you need big data, but you can't store everything. So naturally, you have to, next slide, uh, collaborate. You have to think about network, uh, collaborating with partners. But then slowly, please, thanks. <laughs> uh, so you have to think about exchanging data, but moving data is expensive and it takes time. So and specifically in a geospatial domain, so you don't want to move data. And you may have another concern. This is like if you have different stakeholders which are collaborating in a network, some of them might not want to share all of the data. Uh, there's, there's privacy concerns, there is uh, interests, different interests, security concerns. So what you have to do is you start thinking in such a network about using data and model for the federation across the instances that you actually operate. Now, data and model federation in that sense means uh, like representing data as if it was like locally, even though it's like spread across instances and model federation in that regard means like you look, you have a, a model which runs locally, but has like instances or sub parts which run at different locations. Now, the good thing about that is if you run these parts of the models in remote, in, at the remote places, first of all, the data that you need to transfer is typically metadata, which tends to be smaller than the raw data. So you have um, part of the data transport issue. And the other thing is that the metadata itself contains less information than the raw data. So you are under control of how much of your valuable data you actually want to share with the partners in the network. Next slide. Now, in order to pr promote that and build that, we built something which we call GeoLab. Uh, at the data, uh, the foundation is the data corpus that we built to pairs. On top of that, we have a modeling framework and the user interface. Next slide. Next. Now, pairs is a distributed cluster. It has more than 750 different kinds of layers of geospatial data. It, on a daily basis, it ingests 10 terabytes of new data, uh, is currently more than six petabytes large. And an important fact is it can ingest more than 100 different types of files. So once you put the file in and you get the data back out, you don't get your same file back, but you actually have a curation process and whatever comes out is in the same kind of unified format. So if you have a model for one kind of data, you can apply it to another kind of data. And the, the, 
the data itself is not stored as grid data, but more like as time series. So during the incubation, like in ingestion process, time series are built, everything is geo-referenced in one coordinate system, and you get like data cubes in, in time uh, when you pull one layer. This is particularly good for predictions and forecasts. Next slide. Now, additionally to the data corpus itself, uh, IBM owns the Reddit company. There's a lot of data coming from the company itself, but of course we have a lot of models that we ingest from a lot of people here and the, from the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services. Uh, so this data is like real-time data, but also historic data from, from the Reddit company that we ingest through the data corpus, through pairs. Next. The modeling framework that we have on top is mainly meant to create workflows. Workflows as, for example, here depicted with a, a flood model uh, workflow. So you, for example, take Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar data, you uh, do flood mapping next. In order to get an idea what's happening in the future, you take generative models, which, for example, can create precipitation patterns of the future, one in 10 years, one in 100 years, or one in 1,000 years severity. Next. And then you apply that onto the integrated flood model, which creates a flood map or a flood risk map of the future. Next. If you combine that with the population density or your asset location and apply an impact function, you get a quantifiable impact prediction uh, of a future scenario. Next. On the, user, on the user interface or user experience side, we have a, a dashboard, as you would expect. Uh, next, there is a REST API. So if you have your own application, you can also kind of attach it to, to, the, to the framework. Next. And there's a software development kit for your data scientists to actually go a little deeper if you want to access the, the lower level functions. Next. Now, we, in, specifically in Zurich, what we do with that, next, we're using it exactly in the way that's just with the, the workflow I just presented, we're using AI to map extreme events of the past next that help us to build and validate the models and to create risk maps next, uh, which we overlay with the assets and apply the damage functions next, which helps us to uh, define and identify uh, adaptation strategies. Now, once we have the adaptation strategies, we go back in the circle into the modeling and do the validation until we have like an outcome as, as we desired next. Next to the, the, this adaptation cycle and the framework, we have something which we call the Climate Hub. It's a tool which we have developed for other purposes, which runs well. It's capable of absorbing and parsing natural language documents from like scientific publications. And what we use it for is we extract, first of all, geolocation, but we're interested in the impact functions, which are very different for different areas of the planet, for different kind of uh, geographies, different type of how asset is being built. And this tool automatically next extracts geolocation. Next slide extracts the geolocation of the impact function. So if we want to kind of apply an impact function in the context of a workflow, we automatically know which impact functions have already been kind of used. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> I was hoping for that. Uh, and so we use that for impact functions, but of course you can think of, well, um, um, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so very quickly, what we have is we have pairs as a data corpus, which is the foundation of the, the GeoLab. Uh, the Reddit company feeds in with forecasts. We have millions of users, so we know the end, the end mile, the, the last mile, so we know how to get to the user. We have the IBM Deep Search NLP uh, processing that can parse literature of impact functions, but maybe also disaster reports and feed into Paul's new uh, event standards uh, records. Uh, and one thing we also have is operational risk insight tool uh, is for for operation for for more like for sites and not so for pe for people. It has its own models. It has multi can cover multiple risks for extreme events. It has custom alerts. It's operational and in the context with the WMO collaborations, we have also been investigating. Uh, like exploratory approaches, including quantum uh, quantum algorithms to try to understand what can be improved there. Now, to summarize, we have the climate network. It's being built. We have instances with ECC in Canada. DLR is com has committed to build one. We have two instances within IBM in, in the US. We have one instance here uh, in, in Europe. Uh, it's all based on data and model federation for a global cross board collaboration, it solves privacy, security, governance. You can run it on the public cloud if you don't have your own assets, your own infrastructure, you can run it on. And everything you build is built in containers, so you can easily port it between hardware, between partners, and you can collaborate. If that kind of is resonates with you, we have a Climate Network Summit next January. Uh, I'd like to extend the invitation, reach out to me or directly to Marina. And with that, I'd like to close. Thank you so much and sorry for the extra minute.
Moi, je pense qu'ils ont. Le texte n'est pas le même. Ah, very exciting, Jonas. Oui, Thank you. Um, we want to take time for one question um, before we then bring up uh, four further colleagues. Um, so, do we have one question from the floor? Okay, if that's not the case, uh, thank you for the very clear uh, presentations, very insightful. Um, may I ask you to do a quick switch uh, with our next four speakers? Also. Okay, uh, three, okay. Yes, okay. Um, so we ask um, Genti Kirschwood. <laughs> from um, Risk oui, Platform, Risk Information Exchange, um, to come up to the podium. And thank you um, to our presenters here. Can I ask uh, Inga Lenaya uh, from UNDP, GeoHub, um, to come to the podium? OK, we will talk about uh, GeoHub. But first, uh, we begin with the Risk Information Exchange, Risk Platform. Genti, thanks for being with us. Yes, if I may send you. I'm guessing that if many of you are like me, you're feeling a little bit giddy by the last session. There is an incredible, rich and beautiful ecosystem of information that relates to humanitarian risk, development processes, climate change risk, and it's really an amazing uh, moment for risk understanding that there are all of these resources out there. But I also know that it's sometimes a little overwhelming, at least, at least for me. And I've been doing this for the best part of, I don't really want to tell you how many years. And so one of the things that we at UNDRR have been trying to do in helping bridge that understanding across the humanitarian development and climate change community is to make risk information more accessible, to curate it, to make sure that it's quality, but also to uh, make sure that it's open source and, and hopefully more accessible for your decision-making processes in countries. Now, one of the ways that we've been doing that at UNDRR is through a corporate tool that is called the Risk Information Exchange. And for those of you who have your laptops open, please feel free to go to uh, rics.undrr.org and, and play around. Now, it's a data aggregator. So what you can see on this first page is that we've now got data in there that is pretty much well geo-referenced uh, about, for about 52 countries. And I have to, first of all, start with a huge thank you to so many of those in the room, including, I think, pretty much all of the organizations that were just on the podium, particularly JRC, UNDP, and others. Because essentially what we've been doing is aggregating, of course, Disinventar, Sende Framework Monitor, you know, the HIPS, which are, are the backbone of this in terms of the hazard definition. But we've been aggregating it into a platform to make it more usable. So you can see up on that map, but as you scroll down on the page, and please feel free to be doing this along with me on, the, on, the, on your uh, monitors, you can essentially begin to explore the data behind those tools. So Andrew, who is uh, very kindly uh, handling the website, but I, I think many of you know him through his country support, and I'm sure we'll, we'll feed in later on, you can see that we've been pulling together data around the hazards, organized, of course, around the hazard definitions, but also around exposure, vulnerability, and climate change tabs. If you can uh, also just scroll down a little bit, uh, and so you can really look across a range of different indicators and data sources for quality, open source, accessible data that likely covers your country, you can also access exactly where that data is from. And for the generators of that data, those generators, you know, we can take you to the links of the generators of that data so you can have a feeling for what is out there on your particular country. If you'll scroll down a bit, Andrew, uh, just to the second part of the page, we look at, for example, impact and loss, climate change, uh, and a few other tabs, as well as giving you an overview of some of the functionality around RICS. Andrew, can you scroll down a little bit just to give a sense of the rest of the page and then we can go into one of the country pages. So you can obviously look at impacts and losses, climate change, vulnerability, exposure and assets and hazards, but keep going down. Um, and you'll also get a feel of what is the RICS and what are the, some of the core functionalities. If we can now go into a country page, We've now been working with a number of different governments and it's excellent to see colleagues from places like Costa Rica, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Bangladesh, 
some of the countries that have been co-creating this with us um, and really working with our regional offices. But if we zoom into one, for example, for South Sudan, it'll give you a little bit of a sense of how when we really do collaborate and co-create with our regional office colleagues, with your teams, how you can really even improve that quality of the global data based on the, the kinds of resources that you can bring in within your country. So if you go onto the South Sudan page, you can see that through that collaboration with authorities in South Sudan, with the UN country teams, incredible data that came out at subnational level from a number of UN different partners, we can see that you're able to also get better disaggregated data at a higher granularity, even in a context like South Sudan that, you know, some countries may say, oh, they, they, they probably don't have much data. Well, you know, they've actually got quite a bit and, and it's now been aggregated, publicly accessible, open source access on that rich platform. What you'll also see, and you can, of course, pick certain layers based on the availability of data, whether you're looking at, for example, um, HDI indices, if you're looking at particular hazard threats, if you're looking at particular climate change threats, you know, there is very much an ability to explore and use that tool. If we can scan down a little bit as well, there's another function that I want to show, which begins to look at a little bit more in detail at some of the core climate change data and indices. Again, this is a work in progress. And one of the advantages of being an aggregator is that we're really open to being able to include better resources and, and the best available information that may come on board and to build it into the site, giving, of course, due recognition to the generators of that data. But we do have information on temperature, precipitation, runoff, soil moisture, and a number of different other climate indices, basically on a month by month basis, which we hope can also help begin to create that connection between how we think about managing development challenges and, and weather related risks to the longer issues of climate change. And then there's also a section uh, that may be of particular interest in looking at the ecosystem, which is about what data is already there. Gives you an overview of the data on, on a particular country. So you can see both the type of data, the format of the data, is the data mainly coming from government sources, international uh, organization sources, what kinds of uh, breakdown is there across geo-information hazard, uh, across, uh, for example, climatic or, or geophysical hazards. It just gives you a sense of what information is there. Again, that may be of use to you as a, as a government or a national disaster management authority thinking, okay, what information maybe do we need to think about updating? Or where are the areas that we have stronger or, or weaker coverage in terms of understanding our risk profile? Um, I hope that gives you a bit of a feeling. Please feel free to dig around on the site. And what I really want to stress to everyone today is this is very much a co-creation effort. So we very much look forward to hearing from you both on the feedback of the site, but also on the services and the training packages and the outreach tools that we've been developing with you to apply this. So for example, this year, we've been really actively applying in things like HPC processes, so humanitarian planning processes, in UN country team assessments, in some of the DRR planning exercises that are beginning to integrate DRR and climate change. We also are seeing other functionalities around early warning and, and other areas. Um, I think that there's also scope to improve on that, to develop that. We're looking at some video tutorials. We're looking at that next generation of support. And we'd love to hear your thoughts, suggestions, and feedback on how we can do that better moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Genti. And we directly move on to Inya presenting GeoHub. Hello, while you're, while you're trying to get it on. Uh, my name is Enya Lenanya. I'm a GIS, uh, I'm a GIS, uh, uh, I'm a GIS data engineer with the UNDP's uh, SDG integration team. And I uh, would like to say thanks to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present uh, this that we've been working on um, since, uh, since, October, since October last year. And I'm here with uh, my colleague, Yuan Ferencik. So yesterday, one of the there was one word that everybody kept saying over and over and over again. Next slide. 
Um, you know, it's like if we got a dollar for every time that that word was mentioned, you know, we might have enough money to be able to solve maybe one global problem. Um, but uh, fortunately, none of us thought about that business use case. Um, data. Um, data is, uh, um, you know, talking about uh, UNDP being able to advance uh, its 2030 agenda on uh, sustainable development goals. Um, it requires data. Um, and not just data, but data that is targeted and data that is timely. And, uh, and you know, after hearing so much about data yesterday, you know, it becomes important for us to kind of look at data uh, in a different way. You know, I mean, everybody collects data. I mean, we generate data by just waking up every morning. Um, but the problem, the problem is that, you know, we are not, we are not, we, we don't really understand what we want to accomplish with it sometimes. And as a result, that, that makes it easy for us to kind of uh, allow them to, 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 to live in a silo. Um, think about data from the point of, you know, you want to be able to inform people, right? You want to be able to give people um, re relevant, in timely information that they can use to be able to do something. Um, you don't want them to just go out there um, not knowing anything, right? Do you want them to be prepared? And one way to do that is by collecting data. And not just, the, and then the information is one thing, right? But being able to empower. Um, that is sort of where I feel like, uh, you know, we kind of get lost, you know, because, you know, there's the technologies there to collect data. You know, data collection has become easier. Someone mentioned that before me. But we need to be able to translate that data into some, into, into some kind of actionable, I mean, the keyword is actionable, like shovel-ready insight that, uh, that the decision makers can use to be able to do something with it. And then the other part of the other part about data is, you know, being able to look at it as a, as a tool for leadership. And you know, one word that you know we kind of reiterated this morning when we talked about collaboration, right? You know, and sometimes when we hear the word about collaboration, partnerships, sometimes it's really about leadership, right? It's about empowering not just ourselves, but empowering others to be able to do what needs to be done. Most importantly, it's, it's about being proactive. Next slide. And so the UNDP's GeoHub um, is, was envisioned as an online geospatial data, uh, as an online um, centralized ecosystem um, of geospatial data and services. Um, that can, that can be used to support policy, uh, that, that can be used to support development policy makers. And uh, it's envisioned on SDG goals and progress. Um, that is what the data architecture is based on. And, you know, we understand that, uh, and, and there are, and there are inter, intersections, right, between SDG goals and, uh, and disaster risk reduction. And it becomes important to explore those intersections, right? You know, we want to end poverty, but then we need to understand that there are, there are climate, you know, there are implications on climate action, right? It's another SDG goal. And we need to understand that uh, there are, you know, there are implications for sustainable cities. And we need to understand that there are implications for good, good health and well being. All of these things are interrelated. Um, and, so, and so the GeoHub allows that, uh, provides an online platform. Where, where all of these um, SDG goals um, can, can be explored for their intersections in order to be able to generate policies, right? You know, if you want to generate policies, you want to generate policies that not just target one, right, but also be able to influence the other. You don't want to, create, you don't want to solve a problem in one that creates another problem in the other. And that becomes, that becomes the reason why, you know, we see the GeoHub as, as a tool that as a tool that allows the data generators, the data collectors, the policymakers to be on the same page. You know, geospatial data allows, you know, you know we, we keep talking about silos, silos, silos. And yes, they, they are a disadvantage now. But at the time when that data was collected, it actually solved a problem. But the, the problem is that, you know, we, we kind of are not keeping tabs with, with what needs to be done. Like, you know, someone talks about repurposing old data, right? How do we move, how, how do we move this? How do we break down the walls of these silos? And geospatial data, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, 
a, a romance language for databases, right? It's a way to be able to integrate, uh, it's, a, it's a way to be able to integrate silos so that you are able to, to derive new insights from it. And uh, and the Johor provides because of because it has all these uh, because it's based on the STG goals. Um, it provides some functionality um, and data to be able to locate uh, hazardous events, their impact area, and uh, to be able to support the estimation of data losses and damages. And part of the and part of the advantage of the GeoHub is that um, it's it's centralized. It has a centralized location. Um, you know, we leverage the Microsoft uh, Cloud. Um, and it's able to, and it's also centralized the data and services um, that we can provide to countries that do not have these capacities. So they don't have to start afresh. And most of the time, data collection is always seen as a, is always seen as a huge exercise, but sometimes you don't even need to generate your own data because you can leverage data sources from other places. Next slide. And so we talked about uh, we talked about the space for collaboration, and uh, and we can collaborate on all of these uh, on all of these business use cases that you see that you see highlighted in in the circles. And uh, and one of the and uh, you know the other ones most of them you've sort of heard of, but the one I want to mention is engagement with government. I mean this allows us to be able to engage with government and, and, and to be able to embrace with the private sector and external partners. And then the other part is training, be able to train users, to be able to train users, to be able to bring people up on to the same page um, so that they are able to, so that they are able to leverage all this, these resources that we have. Next slide, please. And so it kind of find like an interest. This is just more like a demo of the GeoHub and how it's, uh, uh, how it's based on uh, on uh, on on the STG goals. Uh, it's, the video is moving really fast, um, but uh, you know we we have it arranged. Can you can you start the video again and oh you can drag it back. Yeah. All right. So right there, um, you see all the seventeen STG goals, and if you click on any of those links, it opens it opens uh, all the data that has been curated for each of those STG goals. And you are able to, and it provides all that information, and you are able to add a layer, and uh, and and you are able to do visualization. You are able to do like simple visualization, raster filtering, and we also have the ability to do vector filtering. So you are able to look at uh, not just one data set, but you are able to look at the multi-dimensional data, be able to understand how those intersections, be able to overlay multiple data sets to be able to generate uh, a composite index, um, depending on what you are looking for. Um, the other thing that I, I want to point out there is that we have a search function that allows you to not just search the data that we have within, but also be able to search external data sets, for instance, like the Microsoft Planetary Computer. And so, the, and so this is sort of our goal with the GeoHub to be able to provide that one-stop shop that country offices can use to be able to to be able to uh, um, to be able to understand the the to be able to track STG goals and progress, and finally, finally, um, finally, uh, we have the GeoHub re ready to go. Um, uh, the GeoHub is ready to go. We have the infrastructure. Um, we have the data storage space. We have data management capabilities and visualization capabilities that it can be rolled out to countries that are lacking capacities or that need help. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, we hope to accomplish the country pilots is to be able to do this in a collaborative manner. We would like to engage governments. We would like to get government buy-in um, and, uh, and also leverage external partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inya. <clears throat> Very insightful presentation again. So we've heard a lot. Um, we've deserved our coffee break and tea break. Um, at the beginning of the coffee break, there will be a group photo um, being taken outside. So please uh, collect your coats and come outside of the building to your right. That's uh, where I was informed uh, the group picture will take place. And we will take um, 
more time for the coffee break. Um, so we have full 15 minutes, um, which means we reconvene at 20 past 11 um, here for plenary session 5.2 then. Okay, enjoy your break and let's have a nice group picture. Thanks, Thank Sorry you. for oh, gosh, no problem. I, uh... Yeah. Can everyone please uh, uh, take the, this is an opportunity to take the photo, so please uh, yeah. go to the main entrance and turn left and left, follow the stairs to um, the old uh, water work building to take the picture. Thank you.
Okay, very good. Very good, yeah. Welcome back. And I ask Nico Spybrook to join me here on the podium. Zita Sebeswari can also come to the podium. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Sorry, <laughs> haven't seen you. Okay, just checking. Nico Spybrock is here. Yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, um, he will be the first speaker. Um, are there many people outside still? I guess so. Rajesh, maybe you can ask them to come inside so we can begin the session. Actually, that's a good idea. Uh, people always come inside the room when they hear that there's a lot of noise and atmosphere. So can I ask you to applaud like uh, you are seeing? <laughs> I'm so sorry for everyone who missed this moment. <laughs> Okay, if you don't mind, Nico, you can begin. Uh, Nico Spybrock yeah. is uh, with uh, CRED EMDAT and will talk on international databases um, in this plenary session 5.2, solutions and approaches. Um, our key question here is what is being done to facilitate and standardize events, differentiated impacts, recording and data application? And Nico is our first speaker. Nico, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Nico Sperbrook. I'm a professor um, of epidemiology at UC Louvain, which is a Belgian uh, university. And um, I'm going to present you today uh, MDAT, which is a global disaster database maintained at our university and supported by uh, USAID. So for those who do, don't, do not know MDAT, or MDAT is a global disaster loss database with uh, evidence-based information on disaster occurrences and their human and economic impact. We cover historical data from 1900 onwards, even if the data after uh, its creation is probably a bit more robust than the data before that uh, time point. We have a global coverage with uh, more than 180 countries included with uh, disasters and their health impacts. 
Uh, we use a set of inclusion criteria, like for example, uh, only including disasters with at least 10 uh, persons killed, uh, which of course results in certain disasters not being included. Um, one of the great things about uh, MDAT is uh, its open access philosophy, which makes it publicly available to anyone who wants to use it. So uh, this data set then allows to uh, create overviews, uh, for example, here an overview of the year, year 2021. We can compare that with previous periods. You see here that um, the number of floods is relatively larger than uh, the occurrences for other disasters. Um, we can, of course, also show the data in a, in a spatial way here, uh, again, use, showing flood occurrences and flood deaths per country for the period 2000 to 2022. And all this looks very nice. I mean, uh, the data set is nice. Uh, we try to validate it as much as possible. Um, but I have to say, but there are, of course, a number of weaknesses related to this database. And I, I think it's the right time to make a self-assessment. And I'm really uh, happy to listen to all your uh, advice and criticism. I'm just mentioning a few of the weaker points. Uh, first of all, the missing data, which generates um, a geographical bias, lower income countries having more missing data. Uh, our data are not in an optimal way at subnational level, um, and our geo-referencing system uh, may be optimized. We use uh, we are using goals since 2014, but there may be uh, a need for uh, improving this. And the three points really invite you to criticize. Come to me either today or uh, by contacting me to criticize the data in a way to in a constructive way to improve the, the database as much as possible. So um, in the meantime, we are not sitting still and I'm going to show you a selection of the uh, improvements that are ongoing and plans. First of all, we will try to optimize our search strategy. At the moment, we try to use all the authoritative sources, the, the, the reports in the media, the international reports, but it's 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 done by a human person and there may be some errors that we uh, may need to work on by op optimizing our search strategy using uh, these advanced analytical techniques like natural language processing which then allows with a certain algorithms to go and find the information in a structured way of course the human factor will always remain important i mean there is a need to always check the data that are summarized by using this kind of advanced techniques, uh, but it may help us to reduce the missingness, to reduce the uh, to improve the completeness. We also want to work on and are working on the georeferencing system, uh, trying to uh, um, make our spatial position a bit finer. Um, we want to standardize the process uh, that we are currently using, the temporality. I mean, when is a disaster starting? When it's, is it ending? We want to be more precise at that level as well. We want to work a lot, and we have already started working on this also in collaboration with um, uh, members here from the UN, on improving the classification. Our current improving by improving, I mean that we would like to make it more coherent with the, uh, the currently internationally used standards. We want to improve our definitions. We want to use a classification that is much more users friendly. And finally, we would like to work on the internal, but also on the external users interface, mm -hmm. trying to have direct links so that people working with Python and R, for example, can directly incorporate their data in their software and do their own analysis in an appropriate way. Yeah. I'm not sure the slide is not jumping to the next slide. Yeah, so we are not only doing this work within our team at a global level, but we would also like to offer our services uh, our technological services uh, at institutions or countries who are willing to use these techniques to also improve their data collection. Uh, for example, using the, the tools that I mentioned, the natural language processing tools, 
uh, we want we are currently working on improving certain weaker disaster types in our database like heat waves and epidemics the techniques that we use there to find the information can be useful in, in other contexts as well we uh, are working on advanced analytical techniques um, trying to develop indicators that go further than just looking at uh, killed people and affected people but trying to combine this in for example a, a metric like the DALI uh, trying to uh, connect disasters with these uh, studies. Uh, we are also working on the economic impact, of course. We use quite advanced uh, spatial temporal modeling techniques. Uh, we are currently testing this. We, 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 know, we know how to work with GIS, of course. And uh, of course, uh, we are willing to partner with or to work together with other groups at international level, but also at more local level uh, to try to use our techniques also um, to improve the data that can then be fed into uh, systems like the Sendai framework or MDAT uh, eventually. And we would also like to work on translating the information. It has been mentioned already a few times, translating this information uh, so that policymakers can use this in the best way possible. And then finally, uh, I would like to thank, of course, the MDAT team, uh, my university, US8, many others, and normally I'm not, I'm not thanking specific persons, but I'm going to make an exception by thanking Professor Guha, who's sitting there in the back, uh, who is in fact the founding person of this data set, and without her, this data set would not have been here, so I would really like to thank her for that. Finally, I would like to thank the organizing committee for having me invited, lovely people I met in these organizations. Um, UNDP, UNDRR, WMO, and feel free to contact us for uh, collaboration or for constructive criticism. Uh, we are open for any comments so that we can improve our database. Thank you very much for your attention. We are moving on to a presentation on humanitarian data and uh, global crisis data bank. Mr. Justin Ginetti is with um, the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent. Over to you, Justin. Thanks very much, Matthias. Thanks to all of you. Um, for, and thanks in particular to uh, WMO, UNDP and UNDRR for the invitation to be here. I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes about a new uh, public good called the, the Global Crisis Data Bank, um, which um, anyone who's interested can either get involved in or access the data contained within it. Um, I want to go back to Nico just mentioned uh, Professor Guhar. Uh, I want to go back to something Debbie mentioned earlier um, about the need to uh, ground this work into known use cases and to you know solve specific problems uh, with these databases. So IFRC we are a problem, what's called a problem owner. Um, and we actually own many problems uh, that the, the crisis data bank and that the, the work that you're all doing um, will help solve. Um, one of them, just to pick one, is that we spend currently about uh, 30 million a year on anticipatory action. And we're planning to spend 1 billion um, Swiss francs on climate change, uh, particularly climate change adaptation. And it may be in our interest to have the evidence to um, explain to our donors where we spend, why we spent that money and where we spent it. Um, so that's just one reason why we, we really need to have this evidence in an a easy to access, easy to use format. The idea for the Global Crisis Data Bank and for the work of on disaster loss data is not a new one. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, a screenshot from a publication in 1923 describing a project that was launched in 1922, exactly 100 years ago, for a global crisis database. So here we are still working on it. Um, the, the other reason I put this uh, screenshot on, on, the, on the slides is because IFRC has been around for a long time. Um, and as they say, we're, we're there before, during, and after uh, disasters occur. Um, and it, it behooves us to think in a long-term manner. We're not going to achieve the Global Crisis Data Bank and to pull all this data together overnight, um, but we're in it for, for the long-term. So what is the Global Crisis Data Bank? It's actually a very, very simple uh, concept. Um, it's a mapping of three different kinds of data. 
data on hazardous events. And here it's crucial that we build upon the work that's ongoing, uh, as Paul mentioned this morning, like the cataloging of hazardous events, events initiative. Um, so we have authoritative data on hazards and using standard formats combined with, um, and that's both forecasted and observed hazard data. Um, secondly, data on impacts. This is both, again, forecasted impacts as well as observed impacts from multiple sources, because it's very difficult for there to be one, uh, if not impossible, for there to be one single source of truth for any one metric. There are many different ways to generate the metrics we're interested in. And the idea is to figure out which are the best, um, most scalable methods for generating those uh, impact um, metrics so that we can then bring it to our 192 national societies. Finally, the third kind of information in the Global Crisis Data Bank is what actions were taken, when, where, by whom, and to what effect. And this is so that we can um, identify objectively what are indeed good practices and so that our 192 national societies can learn over time and learn from one another. Um, so the idea, again, for the Crisis Data Bank is to map all of this existing data together. So all of the data from, say, the Disinventar databases, the data from MDAT, the data from the IDMC Global Internal Displacement Database that Sylvain will talk about in a few moments, uh, et cetera, combining that with the hazard data, combining that with the data on what actions were taken vis-a-vis -vis those events before, during, and after them. And then as you can see on the right, there are many uh, potential applications of this, of this data. Um, the main benefits um, for us, I'll just focus on a couple, um, is to really be more transparent with the decision-making um, that we do within IFRC and to really help uh, sort of raise the bar for, our, for, the, for the national societies that we're supporting um, and to, to lower their barriers of entry and make it easier for them to access funding for both anticipatory action uh, as well as for disaster risk relief. Um, and then there are many applications for the humanitarian uh, and DRR and climate change adaptation community from validation of impact forecast and risk models um, to trend analysis, um, even attribution analysis for the impacts of, of climate change, as well as other socio socioeconomic factors. Going back to this point that Debbie made earlier, the idea for the crisis data bank is to really embed it into our known workflow processes. So here you can see on, on the screen how the information from the crisis data bank will semi-automate the population of certain forms that release um, funding to the national societies um, and trigger appeals for international funding and as well as just simply information sharing. And the crisis, crisis data bank is part of uh, a larger data ecosystem, both internally to the, to the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, but also, of course, globally, because as I said, this is a, a, a pure public good. Um, but it's, it's the point of this is to show that this is really embedded in use cases and answering specific questions that, that, we're, that we're trying to, to get answers to at, at the moment. Um, and here, just as you can see, there are a number of different agencies uh, that are involved in this, particularly to thank uh, UNDRR, who has contributed both um, financially and in kind uh, thus far, as, as well as WMO and OCHA. Um, and we'd love to bring UNDP on board, of course, too, um, uh, with Sunny and, and Rajesh. Um, but you can see a number of the other partners who, with whom we're working on this initiative, as well as um, the 192 uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies around the world. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Justin. Perfect time management there also. Um, we move on to a presentation on disaggregated data and we have um, Mr. Toshihisa Nakamura of UN Women with us online. So team, if you could switch to the Zoom channel, you should be able to see Mr. Nakamura there. I hope you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you and I hope uh, you can hear me. Hello? Can you hear me? There we go. Mr. Nakamura. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me?
Shall I let you sort out the technical difficulties sure, sure. and we move on with an in-person speaker first? Rahul? Okay, so um, let's move on to Ms. Sita Sebaswari, Deputy Director of uh, UNU um, Institute for Environmental and um, Health Security uh, here in Bonn. Uh, you are head of um, the section Environmental Vulnerability and Ecosystem Services, um, Ms. Sebaswari. Thank you very much. Um, so I also have a presentation. <laughs> Maybe just to start with, so I will be talking about ecosystems and ecosystem services. And um, uh, unfortunately, um, there are no good uh, databases where um, losses and damages related to ecosystems and ecosystem services are uh, uh, listed and, and monitored and, and uh, systematically assessed. So um, what I will be showing you is just uh, some ways how the situation could be improved and then eventually uh, ecosystem being taken up, for example, by databases uh, uh, of um, uh, IFRC and, and the like, so that they are act actually better included and uh, can better contribute to disaster risk reduction. So uh, just quickly, a picture from the North Sea coast uh, in Germany. This was this year when a winter storm washed away uh, the beach, but also part of the sand dunes, which is uh, protecting uh, uh, the islands of the North Sea coast. Um, so uh, this kind of uh, losses are uh, assessed and monitored because uh, that particular island, for example, uh, considers the beach and also uh, the sand dunes as an integral part of the coastal protection. So beaches would be uh, replenished, nourished, uh, and uh, there's uh, um, uh, measures in place to also uh, restore um, the, the sand dunes which are uh, destroyed. Um, another case I am showing is uh, Hurricane Sandy in, in the US where um, a large part of the coastal wetlands were hit uh, by the storm uh, leading to se uh, severe uh, side burning, marsh dieback, and uh, uh, because there was a previous ecosystem service assessment in place, um, it was possible to assess actually the losses uh, uh, caused by Sandy uh, to those uh, salt marshes and, and ecosystems. And also uh, there was an opportunity to track how the ecosystem system uh, services and functions are recovering. Uh, but this is an, an exceptional case. Um, mostly, okay, mostly this is not uh, happening. So our questions we are working are uh, basically, what do we know about ecosystem and ecosystem service losses in the course of disasters? How are these uh, impacts monitored and reported? And what are opportunities to improve the situation basically? Um, one of the little baby steps we have been doing is to do a, a scientific review. Uh, so what are uh, documented cases of ecosystem losses in the scientific literature, but also in PDNAs. So we reviewed 15 PDNAs and uh, uh, around 51 uh, scientific publications relating to drought, drought flood and storms uh, to see what kind of ecosystem losses losses are reported there. Um, most of the losses considered relates actually to agricultural losses, but uh, if you look throughout the entire um, scientific literature, uh, there's a, a much greater variety. So the methods actually do exist and it does happen in, in certain uh, cases. Uh, you can also connect those ecosystem losses and damages to ecosystem service losses. And uh, you can also connect these uh, to other elements of risk to hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. In most of the cases, ecosystem service losses feed in into vulnerability. So um, loss of ecosystem services leading to increased vulnerability, in some cases uh, to increased uh, uh, hazard and in in less um, frequent cases uh, um, to increase exposure. 
If you are looking into existing databases, uh, usually they are focusing on agricultural uh, losses if it comes to, um, if we uh, see agriculture as a type of ecosystem, but uh, other ecosystems are, are not considered. And we think that this is um, uh, really crucial to look into, especially because we are increasingly consider ecosystems as part of the overall disaster risk reduction strategy. So we are talking about ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, nature-based solutions for disaster risk reduction. This means that if we consider those ecosystems as part of our solution, we need to actually assess uh, the losses and damages they are suffering. And currently this information is, uh, is missing. Um, so, Looping it back to the Sendai framework, uh, it's mainly um, uh, in B5 and C2, you are uh, reporting about uh, agricultural, agricultural losses mainly. Uh, but in C5, uh, there is an opportunity to report about loss of critical green infrastructure. So this is where um, countries can consider to report about loss of mangrove forests or loss of coral reefs uh, or respective damages. And um, uh, the same holds true for, for D4, which, uh, which would allow the respective uh, reporting as well. Um, so zooming in, for example, into D4, uh, if it's come to critical infrastructure, um, if uh, a member state would consider, for example, coral reefs or um, a certain uh, type of wetlands as a key critical infrastructure, this is where it could be uh, reported. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, I always done. So in terms of um, ecosystem services, um, under D8, uh, which is about other basic services, um, these regulating ecosystem services actually contribute with flood regulation, water purification, erosion control, um, which could be considered basic uh, services and, and could be uh, reported. Uh, although this is much more complicated than uh, the reporting of losses and damages in terms of size uh, or, or number. And just to finish, uh, it's not reacting, but yeah. Uh, so basically what um, we are saying that uh, currently in these data banks, uh, ecosystems are not looked at as, as critical um, parts of the disaster risk reduction strategy. They are not assessed, not reported. And uh, especially because we are focusing more and more uh, on nature-based solutions, uh, at least those ecosystems which we are promoting with that uh, view, we would need to really uh, monitor and, and report there. The options are there and um, the methodologies are also there. Uh, it's a... Uh, 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 not so easy undertaking, but I think uh, we need to move into that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sita, also great time management. Uh, shall we give it another try to bring Mr. Nakamura of UN Women? Yes, no? thank you so much. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, so we move on to a presentation on agricultural losses with Mr. Piero Conforti, Deputy Director of the Statistics Division um, with FAO. You will, um, yeah, you will talk on agricultural losses. Over to you, Piero. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I also have a presentation. Maybe it can be here. Excellent. Thank you. So first of all, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, having us here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, let me stress that these are very valuable occasions for us to uh, hear mostly what's happening, what is going on at uh, the national level when most of the operations actually occur to touch base with the sister organization and other organization who are, which are working in this field. Um, on our side, I mean, let me first start by uh, in addressing the question that was posed to the panel, which are the challenges basically that we are encountering in building this information system. Let me start with a quick recap of what uh, has happened in FAO uh, on this topic recently. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, basically we have a mandate to produce global reports, which is something that our organization does. I mean, one of these is actually consolidating in the area of uh, 
uh, uh, damage and loss from uh, disaster and extreme events. And actually, we are working toward a forthcoming uh, a new uh, issue of this report. We had three previous ones. The idea there is to attempt a global quantification. So try to take stock of what happened. So looking back, taking stock of what is happening and uh, doing it with some sufficient, uh, or at least as, as much as that allows, uh, level of details by digging into the subsectors. So digging into crops, livestock, uh, fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, forestry, because each of these bears some specificities that are worth highlighting, and that can be useful, uh, those specificities, when we move towards trying and collect more data. So this is something we are doing. On the other side, and this is perhaps more relevant to this uh, meeting, uh, we are, we've been working on this approach and methodology to monitor the Sendai framework with the C2 indicator. Um, this method, and of course, also the corresponding 1.152 uh, uh, SDG indicator. On this, we have produced some materials that can be useful, perhaps, to member countries willing to engage. And this, we've been engaging with several member countries and running many capacity development exercises around these things. Allow me just to draw your attention to the fact that recently we produced, in collaboration with our office in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, a software, which is very useful. It's very practical. It's something that can be uh, disseminated as a tool for, for uh, actually people who are collecting the data in the field. So this is available. And uh, it's, I think it's in its final testing stage, but it will be like, available and we can demonstrate it. Uh, at the same time, we say we do global modeling and we have been trying to work more on the nexus with climate change. Of course, FAO has a lot uh, on climate change in general, but I mean, establishing this nexus between extreme events and climate change is where we are uh, working at the moment. Uh, um, data collection. We try data collection the way we do on many topics. So asking countries whether they have data to share, but that uh, show that there is a paucity of data around the world. Anyway, allow me to say that at the moment, the uh, uh, indicator C2 uh, of, the, of Sendai has a number of countries that is building up. It's up to 50 at the moment that are reporting in, in that context in the UNDRR platform. So we are kind of encouraged by this uh, by this uh, result. So what is this uh, approach that we've been uh, uh, um, uh, proposing for measuring Sendai and the SDG indicators? In this context, we talk about direct loss attributed to disasters. We look specifically at the four subsectors. Um, and of course, the, the overall damage is just economic. Okay, So we don't look in this context beyond economic. Uh, uh, losses, although we, of course, are very sensitive to what was mentioned before. I mean, looking beyond uh, what is the economic loss and what uh, it entails uh, affecting agriculture and uh, uh, the related activities uh, in terms of ecosystem services or the maintenance of territories, et cetera, et cetera. All this, so we are extremely uh, sensitive. Uh, again, uh, the idea here, and in this, we are pretty much aligned with the PDNA approach we distinguish for each of the four subsectors that you see uh, with the symbols here on the left, crops, livestock, uh, fisheries and aquaculture and forestry, we distinguish damage from loss conceptually uh, along the lines of the idea that uh, the loss is the actual disruption in the flow of uh, uh, things happening and income uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, due to disasters, whereas the damage is more the value of the destroyed uh, um, inputs and outputs. And we distinguish in doing this for each of the sector, what happens in actual production and what happens in assets, okay? This is something that we do, even though uh, typically the report in the Sendai context uh, is uniperiodal. So everything has to be reported to the same period. But we have a number of uh, uh, assets actually and uh, uh, very important elements in agriculture, which are kind of in between. So when you talk about livestock, when you talk about trees, you talk about matters that have do bear some uh, uh, um, benefits in uh, over several periods. So you have to, in a way, take these into account. So on these, as mentioned, we've been uh, running a number of capacity development. They were kind of stopped a little bit by the pandemic period. But we've been working with uh, many of our offices around the world in Latin America. There were quite a few activities in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We run a few of these and in Africa and the Middle East as well. So that, that we hope to be able to leverage more of these opportunities and to go 
uh, further. So how about the link with the, with, the, with the climate change? The link with the climate change is really in the pipeline, so we are starting there. But the main point on which we would like to focus, and this is also part of the report we're building, going ahead is around the attribution product, uh, problem. So uh, trying to understand what of the total uh, loss and damage that we observe from extreme events can be likely attributed to uh, climate change. This is a very difficult topic we understand uh, from a technical standpoint. We have a standing collaboration with uh, uh, the Peak Institute in Potsdam on this very topic. Uh, there is some modeling ongoing. Uh, of course, I mean, results are still in the making, but we believe that this is going to be something that is policy relevant, especially in the context of what happened recently in the COP27 meeting. So the idea is still to be able to disentangle these different effects and to cater again for the international monitoring, which is something that uh, we believe is, uh, is very important to countries and to do it by qualifying all the, the different type of, uh, of, uh, of hazards. So just take away messages. What are the challenges, the opportunities, and the way forward? We believe that, of course, we have to continue working together to enhance capacity, especially at the national and subnational level, uh, to report. I mean, the international reporting is a very good excuse to build capacity in uh, statistics. Uh, we need to connect the dots. I very much, I'm very much sensitive on this point, and I talked uh, already about the possibility of trying to leverage other existing efforts aimed at collecting more data in agriculture, such as this project that is the 50 by 2030 initiative, which is a huge World Bank led multi-donor funded project to collect service in agriculture, to have more data also on the impact of damage and loss and extreme events in agriculture and on climate change. My other point that which I would like to emphasize is that in order to build the proper and policy relevant information system, we need to support regular data collection on extremes, not only post disasters. Of course, post disasters is extremely important as a tool, but we have to embed some kind of regular data collection in, uh, on this topic in the statistical system in order to have data that can serve the purpose of policy design. And that's the last thing I want to mention uh, we always try to emphasize that we don't collect data just for the sake of collecting data. We want to collect data as, as far as these are useful for designing policies. And this is something we have to bear in mind. Uh, so the idea on our side is to build resilience in agriculture. We feel very much the need to have more resilient agricultural systems around the world as we go along. And uh, just as a curiosity, let me finish by saying that the return on investment in this field is very high. Okay, so if we see, I mean, we've been trying to quantify, and this forthcoming report will have more on this. We've been trying to quantify what is the impact of, uh, of this uh, preparatory action and anticipatory action on the actual uh, agriculture. And we get very, very high rates, like seven to one, or 2.2 times to one for changing practices. So there is a very good business case for collecting data. This is it, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Piero. I think we will first finish with all our in-person speakers before we then take it to the Zoom room where we have um, also Vladimir's uh, colleague from WHO headquarters. So um, let's move on to a presentation on displacement. Uh, Nicolas Bishop is with IOM, Sylvain Poncer is with the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, and you're going to talk about uh, displacement. Over to you. Good morning, colleagues. Maybe just a few opening words while the presentation is being prepared. Um, my name is Nicholas Bishop. I'm the head of the excuse me, disaster reduction unit at um, IOM. We'd like to thank very much the organizers of the Technical Expert Forum, UNDR. Um, and I think that resonates with our presentation on disaster displacement indicators. Um, slide, please. Effectively, what we've done uh, is develop a set of standard displacement-related metrics and indicators uh, following on from the Sendai framework targets, uh, all with the intention of strengthening the ability of DRR actors 
uh, predominantly governments, to integrate displacement in their work. So building on from COP27, there are at least four decisions, including the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan, financing arrangements for loss and damage, um, the WIM XCOM, uh, as well as um, one other that focus on human mobility. Uh, I think there's an increasing acknowledgement of the impacts of climate change and disasters on human mobility from a range of international publications and forums. Uh, what we're seeking to do here is build forth data uh, to backstop some of these considerations. So there are 11 indicators plus three optional that have been developed. They focus on some of the themes on the slide in front of you. The indicator synthesis report is available on the IOM Environmental Migration Portal website. You can use the QR code on this slide to download the report. Um, I would like to extend a thanks to many of the uh, stakeholders here in this room, um, in particular the governments of Indonesia and the Philippines, but also UNHCR, UNDRR, uh, Anamesh and Rahul in particular, um, and other actors for their um, gracious support to this effort over the last 20 months since we first initiated it. There's been a number of expert consultations that have taken place, uh, and we also offered uh, the indicator synthesis report on online until the 11th of November for additional public review. Um, slide, please. Just building on the indicators themselves, the way in which we seek to take this forward at the country level, um, presently under funding from the German Federal Foreign Office, is via IOM's network of primary data collection. Many of you will be familiar with the displacement tracking matrix. Um, as of this past year, we've tracked more than 40 million different movements. Uh, we have uh, some of the statistics on this slide are slightly out of date, but we have over 8,000 primary data collectors in the field um, covering a wide range of countries. Uh, DTM data is used to inform more than 84% of all global humanitarian response plans. So in that sense, at least there is standardization uh, across cluster-based responses in humanitarian crisis settings. In discussion with our country teams, uh, we hope to take forward indicator analysis in countries where governments have collected uh, rich amounts of previous historical analysis. And then uh, on top of that, do primary data collection via our DTM teams. So initially we're looking at countries which include Mozambique, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and potentially one to be identified country in the Americas. Uh, next slide, please. Just to highlight as well that there is an additional discussion. Uh, most of you in the room are obviously familiar with the Secretary General's action agenda on internal displacement. Um, flowing out of that, there are discussions with UNDP and IDMC uh, on solutions. Uh, IOM has something called the Solutions Mobility Index, which is currently operating in multiple countries. This is a much more nuanced look at factors around socioeconomic development, uh, social cohesion, community stabilization, et cetera. Slide, please. At present, this is the scope of SMI, which is an umbrella set of tools that exist in a number of, of countries in, in conflict affected by climate change. Um, and we hope that this tool will also resonate uh, with the indicators pilot themselves. There's been some discussion about including additional solutions related uh, optional indicators to this process, um, which is something that we're, we're very happy to discuss. Slide, please. And over to Sylvain. Thank Nick and thanks everyone for inviting IDMC also to co-present this on um, displacement today. I wanted just to highlight what we are also doing in IDMC is as Nick uh, from uh, Nico, sorry, from from MDAT, we are also aggregating all the data that has been collected by governments, by UN agencies like IOM, but also from media. And there it's like just a footprint about like disaster displacement that occurred in 2021 just to give you like is happening almost everywhere. Next slide, please. Um, as we are not a, a primary data collector in IDMC, we rely on multiple sources and we aggregate all this information to come up with the number of uh, movement of people. And last year, we collect information that give us the number of almost 40 million displacement that occur in 2021. And also using some standardization, we can also see 
which kind of hazard is behind the displacement. Next slide, please. But when we are talking about displacement, we are also to understand what is the definition of displacement. And there is uh, not a common agreement about the definition about displacement because the displacement could be a very short-term displacement where you have been forced to go to a shelter uh, to avoid like a negative impact about a typhoon or cyclone, or cyclone, for example. But you can be also displaced for a medium to a long term because you lost your home. I think these uh, pictures represent that. Next slide, please. But there is uh, several challenges that are attached to the collection of data regarding displacement. There is no um, any uh, standardization about, as I said, about the definition. The interoperability to get the data is very uh, difficult. The data availability is really difficult for us. The disaggregated data, it's really difficult for us to know who are the people that has been displaced, um, like gender, age. From where to where the people have been displaced is also like uh, a key metrics that we are lacking. Is also the duration of the displacement. Most of the time, there is um, um, an assessment that can go for like few few days, few weeks, few months. When when you lose your home, you can be displaced for even years. And sometimes we are lacking this kind of information. The reconstruction and the recovery it's part also of the duration. It's very important to know like the coping capacity of the of the people to recover from from having homeless. And there's also the nexus between the slow onset and the climate change. When it starts, when it ends, is really also difficult. And it can also lead to this displacement linked to violence or conflict in certain, certain area. Next slide, please. And I wanted just to um, conclude with this slide, just to show that monitoring internal displacement is a challenge because it's a three-dimensional uh, collection of- well, Audio goes out fine. There is a spatial dimension that we have to take in account. There is a temporal dimension and of course, the magnitude of the displacement, the number of people that are behind the numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick and Sylvain. We are now trying to uh, bring Mr. Toshihisa Nakamura, you and women, um, colleagues, are you able to? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. We can see you. Okay, uh, can you share the slide? Okay, maybe I can already start. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, UNDRR, um, UNDP and WMO and distinguished participants. Uh, it's very nice to be here. My name is Toshihisa Nakamura. I'm a program manager at UN Women's Global Disaster Risk Reduction Team based in Geneva. Uh, in this short presentation, I'd like to discuss the relevance, challenges, and a proposed solution on disaggregated data. Ne next slide, please, if you see already. So uh, let me first remind you the relevance of disaggregated data. Oh, thank you, it's coming. C can you go to second slide? So, uh, so it is a matter of a normative commitment. So in addition to the Sendai framework itself, outcomes from key international and regional platforms in, um, and also CSW sessions um, reiterate critical needs for disaggregated data. Can you go to the next slide? And it is uh, also, of course, a matter of efficiency of DRR initiative. So we all know that uh, hazards are not experienced by all people in the same manner. In fact, thanks to some disaggregated data, we know that uh, socioeconomic inequalities, uh, particularly gen including gender inequality, are often the underlying driver of disaster impacts, while specific impacts uh, change between contexts. And we know that uh, poverty is a main underlying factor affecting the impact of disasters, while other factors, um, gender, education, age, marriage, etc., cetera, also impact, um, influence the impact. And poverty is highly gendered. So girls and women encounter higher illiteracy rates, a higher informal employment rates, and they receive globally lower salary for their same tasks and with the same qualification as their male counterparts. And they cover most of the unpaid care work 
and domestic work. Uh, these and other gender specific roles, norms, and barriers cause higher poverty rates among women, while drive their disaster exposure, which drive their uh, exposure and the vulnerability to the disasters. Uh, the fact that women are largely excluded from the decision making on DRR processes also accelerate the gaps in disaster resilience. So with uh, increasing frequency and intensity of the climate related disasters, we need to use our limited uh, resources efficiently. Disaggregate data help us to do so. It helps us understand drivers of uh, disaster and also uh, help us to um, plan better and monitor progress among different groups. Uh, next slide, please. So now uh, when it's come to data disaggregation, uh, let me refer to Sendai Monitor, uh, which allows for optional disaggregate data reporting under targets A and B. Our main challenge remains the limited disaggregated reporting. So under Monitor, as of March this year, 58 countries have reported some form of uh, sex disaggregate data out of 195 countries to report. So as you see, this is far from sufficient. And additional limitation we have under the Sendai Monitor is that uh, only target A and B allow for disaggregated reporting so that we are unable to follow progress for vulnerable groups in other critical areas. Okay, can you go to the next slide? So, so now let's look at some common challenges and solutions to overcome reporting challenges. So at UN Women, we have observed that the following common and recurring obstacles for the production of gender statistics on disasters and climate change. So even when data is collected for men and women, sex disaggregated estimates are often not generated at the point of processing stage and uh, mostly due to lack of resources uh, we often end up in that only national aggregates are being reported. And the sampling strategy such as PDNA often do not take into account gender consideration uh, and, and also focus on economic uh, assets in disaster loss uh, leaves uh, disproportionate amount of women out of the picture since the asset ownership is typically reflected at household level uh, under the name of men. And lastly, indicators on disasters and climate change often do not reflect gender specific needs and the challenges. This means they're not good measures of women's resilience and vulnerability. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? So at country level, uh, solutions Proposed solutions to overcome these challenges may include, uh, we can maximize, uh, we can coordinate more to maximize resources. So for instance, uh, ensuring that uh, MDMOs well linked up with uh, national statistics offices to leverage technical support and also utilizing SDGs or other existing national committee to assist in Sendai reporting coordination. Um, maybe a national workshop could be considered to bring together all relevant stakeholders. And as a complement to this, UN Women and the partners have developed a set of indicators, a model questionnaire and national survey on gender and the environment, including disasters and climate change, uh, currently for Asia Pacific region to enhance the availability and the quality of gender statistics on disasters and climate change. And also uh, UN Women has an ongoing data project called Women Count, which seeks to bring about a radical shift in the use creation and promotion of gender statistics. Uh, next slide please. Oh, okay, it's, it's ending, okay. Okay, so I'm wrapping up very soon. And, and also lastly, we have also recently developed the policy tracker 
which monitors gender responsive policy progress in DRR and climate resilience law and policies across 193 member states. So we hope that will help identify good practices for easy replication for policymakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toshihisa. And uh, we come to our final presentation, joint presentation by Mr. Diamit Campbell Landrum uh, with us virtually from the WHO headquarters in Geneva. And um, then his colleague, Dr. Vladimir Kendrovsky, will add to what um, you, Diamit, will present. Over to you, Diamit. Can you hear us and see us? I can hear you very well. Can I check you can hear me in the room? Yes, we can hear you. And Fantastic. Thank, th thanks then to the uh, UN Women colleague for uh, sorting out the, the, the challenges we we're having uh, having earlier. Um, so I will be relatively brief and then hand over to my uh, colleague, Dr. Kendrowski, who's in the room uh, with you. Um, and uh, the, the reason for that is that I, I think, at least in our office, we were in, invited into this uh, conversation just, uh, just last week. So uh, we have some headline messages to uh, present, but there is a, a lot more detail, I think, behind that. So we're also very interested just in making the connection into this uh, conversation and flying the uh, the flag for health and the importance uh, of health. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't send a presentation, but um, I have uh, something I would like to share on screen. I don't know if that that'll be possible if I do share screen, whether it'll um, uh, whether that'll work or not. Uh, let me just. Uh, check if this uh, works for you. Hopefully this, uh, that, that's coming up um, uh, on screen. Yes, uh, and this is just to underline uh, the point, the, the importance for us of connecting into this uh, this conversation. Uh, those of you who are following the, uh, the COP negotiations and uh, just heard that reference in several presentations will um, be aware of the uh, the progress that was made on on loss and damage, and the establishment of the progress on the mechanism, the establishment of the uh, of the new fund, uh, and some of the key points that we have on this issue relate directly into this discussion. We we underline that um, impacts on health and loss of human lives are, are the most important. We will would argue non-economic uh, loss uh, and damage that is suffered from extreme weather and from uh, from climate change. And we therefore think it's important to connect up the mechanisms, the operational mechanisms that we have on uh, climate, extreme weather and, and health, and also the data mechanisms that we uh, have uh, into those into those discussions. So we just briefly published this policy brief um, before, uh, shortly before COP. And just to relate directly to this uh, discussion, we point out that extreme weather and climate change both have um, sudden impacts, acute impacts on health. So obviously the impacts of heat stress, people um, dying, excess mortality and heat waves, uh, but also the more chronic uh, effects of uh, either slower onset events or events that work through other causal pathways to impact on health, whether that's through vector-borne disease, undermining of food nutrition, um, the impact on, on longer-term chronic conditions, including uh, we're seeing uh, particularly now impacts on mental health uh, following extreme weather events and the long-term impacts of, on climate change. So we um, are very interested in connecting up all of our uh, capabilities with uh, National Ministries of Health and, and WHO on responding to these and also on the, the, the data and monitoring side and trying to do that in a way that connects not just the acute but also these uh, longer-term uh, effects. Um, because as you can see, the effects are quite diverse. They go from these direct impacts of loss and damage through impacts on air quality, food availability, water and sanitation, and so on. And as you can see, uh, quite a long list of health impacts that can arise uh, from those events. So that's sort of the, the problem statement that we have. Um, and just to put, uh, put on the table a couple more of the challenges that we have, that even for the acute and more direct effects, so the effect of extreme heat, for example, um, which you might think would be relatively simple to measure because for the most part, you can um, deaths are recorded, so you can relate deaths to uh, e e extreme heat, for example. Uh, for the most part, heat stress 
is not usually recorded as, as a cause of death or it completely underrepresents the impact of extreme heat uh, on death, which is mainly through the exacerbation of other conditions. So that uh, our assessment of these relies on epidemiological analysis to compare what we would usually have expected to have uh, to occurred during that episode to uh, what um, uh, if, if that sorry, for example, in a normal summer or under normal temperatures to what we observed um, uh, occurring. So even that is relatively complex. And as you can imagine, is much more complex if we're trying to attribute uh, disease outbreaks or impacts on stunting and, and, and wasting following uh, malnutrition. As I say, we do have um, uh, other exercises to, to collect those data, and that's what we'd like to, to, to bring forward uh, with you in, in a longer conversation. Um, I'll just put on the table one other resource that we have before turning over to Vladimir in the room um, as a joint project. Uh, product between WMO and WHO. Uh, we have recently launched a climate health portal, information portal, uh, which I think starts to make much of the connection we're trying to make here. Um, it uses the standard definitions, UN DRR definitions of hazards uh, and so on. And it basically uh, connects information, what, what, what we have on those, those hazard definitions uh, to, um, to, health, uh, to health impacts. So that's a new resource that we'd like to build out over time. Uh, final thing to say is that we have new projects starting, particularly around heat, heat stress, um, both on the data side, but also on the implementation side. And at that point, I'll hand over to, to Vladimir to give a, a more concrete example of, of some of the work that the WHO is, is doing in this area. So thanks for the invitation and, and back over into the room. Thank you, Dermot. I, I would like just to add uh, to this uh, uh, talks about uh, an example from our WHO European region uh, about uh, excess uh, heat mortality. As you know, um, in Europe, uh, uh, we just went through a um, very hot summer and the hottest uh, August in, on record. And we saw all, also the uh, devastating uh, wildfires uh, that uh, cause a lot of uh, 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 carbon, uh, carbon release and affect uh, uh, air quality. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, we have the Euromomo, uh, which is European Mortality Monitoring Activity, where the official national mortality st statistics are provided weekly uh, from uh, uh, 29 uh, European countries. Um, and it is supported by us, WHO European region, and also by the European Center for Diseases Prevention and Control. Uh, this summer, few affected countries um, like Spain, Portugal, UK, and Germany estimate the heat uh, attribution in weekly excess deaths uh, and communicate with the public. And uh, it was very important because we have almost real time information weekly to know what is happening in uh, this uh, uh, sub region. And uh, it is very important for the uh, health sector uh, in particular, in all of these countries, the heat health action plan in place to, to, to make so, some uh, communication with the public and the uh, most vulnerable group. Um, in nutshell, uh, this is very useful um, uh, tool uh, or network where we can uh, see the, the how the flow of, of information is uh, um, uh, can be monitored uh, based on the heat waves. Even originally, this network was established uh, to estimate the weekly said that from from uh, influenza and from from uh, pandemics. But now we can use it in in uh, other public health uh, threats. This is not obligatory, but the countries uh, use international uh, mechanism to inform us and to see uh, how uh, uh, we can uh, support also the, the health system in affected uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir, and thanks to all um, speakers and contributors in this session, also online. Um, we've widened the perspective now. We've talked about uh, humanitarian data. We talked about ecosystems and the services. We talked about um, health. We talked about displacement. 
So I would say we have time or we make time for one question. Um, if there is one from the floor before we move to the lunch break. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Maureen Wanzala. Um, I work with the WFP. So my question goes to you, Zeta, on ecosystems and services. I was wondering, is the data available? And if yes, is it uh, what geographical regions does it cover at the moment? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So we do not have a, a database ourselves, but we did this to do a global uh, review, um, how far um, those losses are reported so far in the scientific li literature and in, and in pd &E. So uh, that was global, um, but uh, um, there's no database be behind it at the moment. So uh, my attempt was mainly to raise awareness that we need to move uh, on this front as well uh, to be uh, um, able to include actually ecosystem losses also in the respective databases. Thank you. <laughs> well noted, thanks. Thank you very much, Sita, and for the question. Okay, two short questions. Okay, we take uh, your questions, yeah, Seychelles and... Um, I don't have a question. I think it's more of a comment or a suggestion. I'm happy that you guys were going through the Sendai framework. And my comment is when it comes to um, disaster related uh, information data platform, maybe it can cu be customized to um, fit a bit smaller, uh, smaller countries, such as um, small island developing states. Because, for example, let's just go on the first indicator of the Sendai framework. It's about uh, reducing the number of deaths by 100,000 per population. And 100,000 is all we have. So, so it looks like we are not successfully reporting, but the trick is, is that the platform is fit for bigger countries. So maybe you can think about the small island developing states as well. Um, let's first collect the second question, and then Piero, of, of course, you can answer to that. Ecuador. Sí, thank you. Um, sí, también es un comentario. Eh, es eh, como vemos, existen muchas herramientas, muchas metodologías que nos ayudan justamente a la recolección de datos en diferentes sectores. Eh, sería importante que todas estas herramientas y estas metodologías sean parte de un de una caja de herramientas que nos permitan a los diferentes países adoptar y adaptar estas herramientas y metodologías para poder fortalecer justamente la recolección de datos en, en cada uno de nuestros países. Entonces, es más un comentario que podría salir justamente de, esta, de este encuentro, poder tener todas estas, eh, estas metodologías y herramientas dentro de una caja de herramientas, valga la redundancia. Gracias. I am sorry, I don't know if we understood the question. I really struggle to hear French and English in a mix. Um, but yeah, are you able to respond to that? I first, Piero, yes. Con gusto, yo puedo intentar contestar con mi español, que no es tan perfecto, pero pienso que entendí. Eh, eh, por supuesto, yo creo que eso es uh, algo muy importante. Y reuniones como esa uh, sirven también esta esta ese escopo ¿eh? Eh, tener contactos y nosotros estamos eh, listos en compartir lo que podemos compartir eh, hasta ahora y con gusto están los correos electrónicos es, están seguimos en contacto eh, quisiera eh, if I may just use one second about the question on the thresholds that was raised by Seychelles that's actually a very good question, and it's something that uh, it's a difficulty for us because when we start moving into using global data sets, we run into the problem of deciding whether we should or not use a threshold. And thresholds are tricky because right before, I mean, because I mean, in, in the small island states, but in any countries that have a, a smaller population, you, you cannot discriminate this. I think the problem is more conceptual. It has to do with what you call a small scale disaster, what you call a large scale disaster. Our final decision in moving into global assessment is to pick everything. 
Also because coming from agriculture, we are quite sensitive to the idea that uh, even a small scale disaster can impinge on the livelihoods of people. So sometimes let's say it's a way of looking even beyond the economic loss. No? The economic loss can be negligible if you quantify it, but it can be huge in terms of the disruption of the livelihood of a small community that has limited income. Uh, it's the same problem in a way. So we believe that uh, uh, perhaps either a definition of threshold at the national data, at the national or subnational level should be adopted, but something needs to be thought through there because it's, uh, it's something that can impinge on the comparability of the information. So thank you. Thank you, Piero. Um, so for the non-Spanish speakers in the room, it remains a secret, whatever you discussed, uh, unless you let us know. Uh, during the lunch break, no problem. No, I can just uh, mention briefly. I mean, it was a call for putting all the tools that we have to collect data and so in one place, okay, and to make sure that everybody has access to it. And I, my comment was just okay, we are here for this reason. I think this is the purpose of this kind of meeting, so we're happy to share emails and to be in touch and to follow through. Please be in touch. Yes, the lunch break is an excellent opportunity for that. And uh, Rahul. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sure. But be aware that you're taking away time from the lunch break. No pressure. I, I'll be killed for this. Uh, but just to clarify on the point on the session, because I think it's an important point. Uh, it's not also the issue of uh, the num the population. It's how it is measured, and that's how the international comparability is done. It is as per what the open-ended working group approved as an indicator for per 100,000 persons, because that's how we can measure across countries, because the population can be from China to the smallest you know, uh, island state. Uh, the, the, the population will vary so much. And that is why per 100,000 is taken. As you know, for some SDGs, if it's percent is taken. It depends on what you're measuring. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something that the platform has decided. It is as per the target and indicator approved in the General Assembly resolution. But of course, this can be discussed, but this can only be changed by the member states. It's beyond our, uh, you know, kind of accept, uh, I mean, our authority. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And thanks again to all contributors in this session. Uh, we will now have the lunch break. We will reconvene at 1.30 here for the next plenary session. Please be on time. It's a very important session where we are presented uh, the new joint approach. Uh, so that's going to be exciting. Have a Great lunch break.
Colleagues, welcome back. And we will begin the plenary session 5.3, Prospective Solutions. And it's quite exciting that we will be hearing the new UNDRR, UNDP, and WMO joint approach on the proposed hazardous event and disaster impact tracking system. And we have with us um, Ms. Iria Tuzon Kalle, Program Management Officer with UNDRR. Mr. James uh, Dowris, Project Officer at World Meteorological Organization, and Mr. Rajesh Sharma, DRR and Resilience Advisor with UNDP. Iria, over to you. Thank you, Matthias, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and uh, you also have some coffee and ready for the afternoon. So uh, my name is Iria and work with the UNDR team uh, here in Bonn, moved very recently here. And it's my pleasure uh, today, along with the colleagues from UNDP and WMO, to share with you after hearing on the challenge, nothing on the solutions and discussing the innovations and opportunities and the initiatives um, across the data value change. We want to share with you how we use these inputs to advance tracking hazardous event and disaster damage and losses which is a process in which the three partners have engaged for some time already through multiple partnerships and organization specific initiatives, but that we want to take forward and continue. And this is an important milestone for us. So in this presentation, we want to share with you more concretely, what is this joint approach that we're proposing for a new model and a new system to strengthen the management and use of data and therefore strengthening its value as an strategic asset for more risk-informed decision-making, for more resilient and sustainable development. So we want to share with you some of the progress and the steps take so far, and what is concretely the new approach and how we plan to take this forward with, based on your inputs and your feedback that we will collect from the discussion in plenary, but also in a breakout group. So if, oh, okay, <laughs> it's working, good. So as we have heard in this forum, countries have invested in creating multiple damage and loss database management tools. One of the most used ones being this inventory that has been used over um, for more than uh, 110 countries with over 750,000 events recorded. But as highlighted by many participants, it's a good starting point to get a comprehensive picture of the human economic infrastructural losses of events <laughs> and of any magnitude including those localized recurring ones, as there is no threshold applied for registration of, of recording events, and with a subnational level granularity. So these national owned database have been registering data of disaster effects across sectors validated by government. And the Simbata has provided not only a software system, but also a methodology to have a system of data collection and analysis based on a minimum set of homogeneous variables, regardless of the scale of the disaster, that are recorded from the lowest administrative levels. And with this diversion, it enables more alignment with the relevant targets and indicators to measure progress in reducing risk and losses, which are understood as the outcomes of adopting uh, disaster risk reduction strategies. And, and through streamlined process that also um, uh, allow us in progressing the report, um, reporting on the progress on achieving the sustainable development goals. But however, despite this progress in establishing disaster loss database, in using these methodologies um, systems for recording effects of disasters, we have seen and we have heard from you, many challenges still remain, both in terms of capacities, the governance, the application. And for that reason, we have engaged in a process of assessing and understanding what are those issues, both the, the ones that continue for some time, but also emerging ones, and the needs. And that's where, why we also have gathered um, all these um, stakeholders and country representatives this week here. So we are proposing a new approach that will be of the cementar rather than a new version of a software tool or methodology we want to utilize the good features and the practices on uh, recording disaster loss data to propose a new model, which we hope will allow adopting some of the innovations in technologies of data collection, analysis, dissemination, and visualization, which I think we all recognize here that 
have changed significantly over the last 25 years when um, the cement car was first developed. And we want, we hope this um, new model and system will also address and, and help co governments and countries and stakeholders addressing some of these institutional and governance issues and capacity challenges we have discussed um, in quite detail during this focus, during this uh, forum, so that we all agree are not only technological challenges, uh, but are, are also these governance issues that we want to address uh, along with the technological solutions and new applications of software solutions to address the root of those causes and those sticky issues that derive from institutional cultures, practices, policies, and their application. So we seek solutions to enhance our capacity to further understand the triggering factors and causes of each recorded event and to be able to better link the impacts of events with weather related on, on other, other hazardous events. We, we stick with the new model to reinforce our understanding of the cascading impact of events and also the implications of this disaster. I was discussed, for example, just in some of the groups. Uh, how does effect ripple down through these interconnected systems, economies, societies, supply chains, and what their impacts that they have in terms of livelihoods, in terms of many other things. And we want to promote uh, further understanding and adoptions of data standards, common agreed methodologies, definitions, classifications that help us improve the comparability of the data, the interoperability that has been discussed so much in this forum, but also to reuse the same data for different analytical purposes. So as someone said very um, well in our group yesterday, uh, why we focus so much in collecting data, we should focus in connecting data. So that's what um, better um, um, standards al allow us to do. So perhaps just sharing with you a little bit on the progress of how we have come here. So this is not the first discussion. This is not the first analysis of the challenges. It's an important milestone, but we have come through a process to here. So this forum is a milestone in this process to understand the changes the needs and the challenge to assess how different solutions and approaches might help addressing them. So that started, um, I think now two years ago, with a discovery and need analysis process that was completed through a consultative process. So we, we discuss and gather many uh, users and producers of data at country level, but also international organizations and other stakeholders. And there were over 112 respondents uh, through surveys and more than 30 countries participated in this analysis. That led us to a vision and roadmap draft where we identify what are the objective, what's the vision, um, and what are the focus area and the enablers. So looking at enablers like partnership, people, culture, technologies, and partnership. Um, so it's, it's really not only about the technology solutions, the technological environment, but also about this aspect of culture and partnership. And then the focus area is really looking at um, aspects as we discussed here and the information governance, interoperability. So we explain the, the why and the how, and what are the key milestones on transforming current systems and, and, and what's the status and with different milestones from building off on the cementar, advancing the aspect of information governance, connecting and innovating lots of this data, adapting system-wide changes, approaches, and building on all these pillars um, on, on the standards, data governance, data architecture, and capacity development. It, another step um, has been adopting this, this framework uh, to assess data and digital maturity. Um, as you remember, the report was shared yesterday and how we have also bring this um, interesting assessment framework to understand the, the, the disaster damages and loss ecosystems. Um, and this help um, in making sure that the solutions and the, are contextualized to the different uh, levels of maturity. So we ensure that the new generation system, um, the technical assistance that uh, will be provided by partners like us, along with many others in the room, um, can be contextualized to the maturity level um, of the country in, 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 that we are um, trying to support in this process. Um, so another important milestone will be shared uh, by my colleague, <laughs> James. So leading up to 2019, WMO recognized that 
there was a gap in knowledge as far as or information with regard to events and uh, the linkage of those events. This is something is we empirically, when we see a cold front coming in, we see weather systems come in, we have heavy rain or snow or, or uh, uh, tornadoes, et cetera. These things are part of an overall system that comes through. And we, don't, we do not capture that very well. We have the individual temperatures and wind and you know, some information on the tornadoes and that, but actually to bring this together. So what we've done, please go back. Please. What the WMO has uh, uh, done in 2019 is they developed a new standard uh, for recording a systems-based type uh, um, uh, uh, event. Um, ah, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering when, when it was going to fly away. <laughs> so uh, a systems-based uh, event record whereby they would be recording this information on a standardized, uh, in a standardized methodology, very much like what we do, temperature, wind, and et cetera. Um, and creating a database just like we do for temperature. I mean, when we look at climate data, this is a, a, a culmination of 150 years of WMO standardizing this uh, type of information so that we can use it for understanding our Earth's atmosphere and its effect on us and what effect we're having on it. So this is a, a, a part of what we do as far as the WMO is concerned. So what we have done this particular um, uh, methodology uh, that will be employed uh, very shortly will be recorded at the Met service level and hydrological service level, as well as the regional climate centers of the WMO, um, where they will be uh, making records of begin date, end date, et cetera, for instance, for uh, a drought, you know, which is often a very difficult thing to, to record. Uh, be able to, with the best scientific evidence to say when it began, when it ended, over the period time, and uh, uh, any other information that we, can, that we have available at that time in the description type thing. It also has a very powerful feature, which is the, the linkage parameter, which allows you to link events to an, uh, other events. For instance, um, a hurricane or a typhoon has many different types of uh, hazards within it. You have the wind, you have the rain, uh, you have storm surge, etc. When you look at the disaster loss damages, the, uh, disaster loss uh, and damage databases, or the impact databases, but you, you don't find that resolution there. You find tropical cyclone. And so we're aiming to be able to record things at the hazard level so that disaster managers can say, ah, that ID fits this damage and therefore they can record it. And, and uh, uh, therefore we have the, 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 the granularity that we would want. So I won't go through the part, part there, we can go to the next, what we're proposing, and go to the next slide, please. Next slide. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, the other way. So we're proposing here is um, that we have the recording of hazardous events, which is without in, uh, impact information. Impact information is not the mandate of the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services. It is the mandate of other agencies, mostly the Disaster Management Authority when they do the assessments. So how to couple these things together, and especially when we're talking about Desventar, um, how it couples with that so that you get the granularity of information but also the linkages to larger systems so that you don't have a, a whole bunch of uh, events independently recorded. They can be compiled very easily into one. And that would be through the uh, event identifier, which is a, a random number, but that ensures uniqueness. But as I said, when the, they record the, the information as far as the, the impact, they can link to the corresponding causal uh, hazard uh, within the CHE, and therefore the, that linkage to the scientific or the physical phenomena that caused it is there. 
Um, and so you have various applications, of course, to strengthen monitoring and disaster losses, risk inform, uh, national local plans, better financing. You can read that. There's a bunch of stuff there. It goes into impact-based forecasting. Uh, it goes into research and how different uh, hazards interact with one another. These are the cascading and complex hazards, which we really, we talk about a lot, but we really can't fully understand until we know the hazards themselves and be able to quantify each hazard and then the linkages between. Uh, and a better, better design, uh, understanding of disaster impact and sustainable development and how we go forward from there. Uh, and there are three main uh, points here, and that is data standards from not just the hydromet side as far as the physical phenomena, but also the impact side. And this is somewhere I think we need to really work a significant amount on data governance, how the, how the country actually um, uh, allows for this stuff to be, um, or, or makes a provision is within their methodology and within their processes for data to be recorded in a systematic way. Um, and that it is incorporated into, it may be different agencies, it may be one particular uh, national statistics office, but in any case, it, it needs to be enabled from the governmental level. And data architecture, making sure it's interoperable and open open standards that's something that wmo uh encouraged its member and has a data policy to for the veteran of society to be able to have this data available to everybody thank you ah this is the linkage parameter sorry i already described this but this is the linkage parameter here um and recording of, um, of the event from the impact side and being able to put each hazard and, and linkage to that particular hazard. Thank you, Jim. So mm -hmm. with this, um, we just wanted to, to go back a little bit to this uh, concept and visualization of the data value change that um, we have been uh, sharing and discussing with you and using as a framework for our uh, a breakout discussion and anchor on it um, our new approach. So just to emphasize that our approach and the, the proposal is not limited to develop a new, a new product, a new software, a new database a system or a methodology, but also in, in providing support to improving uh, the capacities to countries to look at both uh, at the data producers, but the users and how to enhance the governance to make sure that we really enhance the value of the data um, harness that uh, is potential to inform action. So basically, we go back to the idea of the use cases as a starting point and the rationale for the data collection uh, to inform like why, how, and which data we we, we collect and which analytic, analytical products we develop. And then that will inform really the acquisition process in terms of collecting data, assessing or aggregating through common standards and classifications. And we want to support as well um, uh, options and technological solutions for data transformation to strengthen the capacities to export, import, transform into different formats for better use, more use. And with the new generation of um, uh, disaster loss data systems, we also want to improve the functionalities for analysis and provide technical support to utilize the new technologies and capabilities to produce better um, statistics, better analytical products, to support enhancing visualization with more interactive options, dashboards, charts, board, charts that are more intuitive and all based on the, this user needs and follow this user-centric approach that we've been discussing here. And we want to, um, and that we can um, really uh, support in interpretation. So we want to collaborate with technical assistance and capacity developments to help um, uh, partners, governments to interpret that data, to draw what are the implications, to understand the policy problems. So not just uh, uh, being a solution looking for a problem, but really um, already uh, helping in, in responding to questions and, and understanding policy problems and, and providing solutions and answering questions for decision making. And the end goal is really to, to be able to upon that data by supporting with decision to support tools for better programs, better policies at all levels. 
Um, and with this, uh, we want to open up if, if you have any questions and clarifications. We have some time before we, we, we share with you what is the plan for the next breakout session. Um, so we, we're really happy to, to open up. <laughs> Jeanette, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, James, in terms of the Sinventar and the way you're looking at the Sinventar right now, can you just clarify for me the What's, what is the definition of damage and loss that you're using in the disinventar or which are the variables that you are collecting in terms of impact in the disinventar? No, you, the, you were discussing the disinventar. So from, from WMO perspective, we look at impact. I mean, damage and loss is the technical term, damages and losses. And from the UNFCCC, it's damage and loss. And these terminologies can be a little bit uh, difficult to, to fully understand, but mm -hmm. damages and losses essentially is the impacts. But which impact are you collecting or looking at through the disinventar? Number of people that have been dead, number of houses that have been destroyed. What are your variables? Just for me to understand. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think. I mean, the, as you know, probably the standard discernment tar comes with the standard uh, data fields and some are more customizable. For example, uh, in terms of impact on population, it allows you to uh, record like people dead, injured, et cetera, et cetera, and then also disaggregate by male, female, et cetera, if you want to add that. Plus when it comes to impact on sectors, for example, housing, sometimes uh, it is by default because it has been going on for quite long time. And that's why we are discussing changing it. Sometimes it was just limited to recording how many houses damaged, number of houses. And as we all know that it does not go into details of no country has all same kind of houses. There are different kinds of houses, multi-story, single story, sometimes multiple, so, et cetera. So how do we bring that in, in terms of estimating losses? So sometimes it's limited to numbers only, likewise for roads. It is limited to just recording how many kilometers of road is damaged or destroyed. So it does not go into too much of detail. And if you are able to, for example, add more features, like if you are able to bring two or three kind of housing in the system, and for each one you have unit cost of, like what is the, in terms of money, you can estimate those losses, but then it's limited to that. And that's why we are discussing here, presenting here, that we need to move from discernment to a more sophisticated new system. And that's what Jim was presenting on the slide. Yeah, hope that clarifies. Yeah. If I may compliment, just to, to add that um, this inventory was um, uh, upgraded or aligned with uh, Sendai, and that was in 2017 that was launched this inventory some diversion, which means that um, the, the, the way the, the data cards and um, the event, um, the variables were aligned and um, following the same um, um, metrics that in the and the Sendai framework monitoring, uh, so it was slightly changed the, the way the data car is organized. So you have all the same variables in terms of um, um, deaths, in terms of uh, uh, as he was saying, um, infrastructure um, uh, damage, disruptions, all these variables. But then also because it has been there for some time, as Rajas was saying, um, and is a very customizable tool. Countries were able at any time to add any what was called extensions, any variables that were relevant for them to 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 include. So any uh, variables that were not there, and for example, if a country wanted to add something on related to cultural heritage that initially was not there, they can add. Um, and the this new version of uh, the cementar and die allowed already by by default was. Uh, you could enter the data disaggregated. So for example, in terms of that, you could enter disaggregated and then just the, the system will do the aggregation. Uh, but um, those were already included. You don't need to build, you didn't need to build a new variable to have a basic disaggregation like by gender, uh, sex or age. Uh, but um, in other cases, there were additional variables that were relevant for some country that were added. But um, as, as um, Rajas was mentioning, um, the information about the, the causal hazard, uh, the triggering hazard wasn't there. There is some field where, for example, for earthquakes was recorded very basically was, was the, the magnitude of the, of the earthquake, but there was very little about the, the hazard itself. So it's, it's harder to connect information. Carlos, and then you, Carlos. 
voy a hablar en español. Eh, es que yo creo que hay que tener presente el antecedente de Desinventar. Desinventar fue una herramienta que no era de Naciones Unidas. Y era una herramienta que apareció en el contexto de Latinoamérica como una propuesta para iniciar un ejercicio de levantamiento de pérdidas por desastre en un contexto donde no estaban definidos los indicadores, por ejemplo, para medir un marco de acción como el que hoy en día tenemos, como es el de Sendai. Eh, entonces, de manera un tanto arbitraria, en cada uno de los países que se puso a operar eh, desinventar, cada país reportaba según sus posibilidades y según sus fuentes de información. Una observación que, por ejemplo, el país mío hizo en algún momento que hubo una evaluación global es que los datos que Desinventar expresaba del caso de mi país eran datos que no eran oficiales. Este, y eso representaba a veces algún límite o alguna preocupación de algún gobierno de ser medido en sus avances con una herramienta que no utilizaba datos formalmente establecidos ni respaldados por un gobierno. Eh, después de que aparece, de, de, que, de que está el marco de Sendai, justamente se toma la iniciativa de emular, desinventar, emular, quiero decir, repetir una, una herramienta con el mismo nombre, y se denominó Desinventar Sendai para medir los indicadores de Sendai, eh, en el contexto, digamos, de evaluación de pérdidas que piden indica, los indicadores de Sendai. Este, y bueno, rápidamente quiero hablar de la experiencia de mi país con Desinventar Sendai, nosotros probamos la herramienta y no nos gustó. Eh, era una opción para nosotros, pero no nos gustó porque era una herramienta muy rígida eh, que no permitía desagregar los datos tal y como el país que yo represento los ocupaba. Parecía poder decir que cumplía las expectativas y necesidades de Naciones Unidas, pero no, las, no cubría las necesidades de mi país. Y, y así lo expresamos. Entonces, eh, omitimos eh, reportar en Disinventar Sendai y a través del de levantamiento de información con un sistema propio, recogemos los datos para reportar al monitor Sendai. Eh, entiendo que la versión que ahora se está presentando es una que ha considerado todas esas observaciones que en algún momento los países hicimos y se está presentando como una nueva alternativa. Y creo que, bueno, va a ser la oportunidad de revisarla y, y plantearla. Termino nada más con una observación. Y es que, de alguna manera, la taxonomía eh, que pueda estarse usando en Sendai sí genera alguna preocupación, porque, por ejemplo, la palabra impacto en nuestro contexto implica efecto económico y no el dato de, la, de una pérdida directa o daño expresado con unos números en, un, en una herramienta. El, el concepto de impacto implica un ejercicio econométrico para medir el efecto que genera la pérdida ocasionada por un desastre, por ejemplo, en la economía. Y entonces, este, eh, creo que hay que poner un poco de atención a esos elementos taxonómicos para que efectivamente la herramienta pueda eh, generar datos que permitan análisis compartidos entre los países. Nada más la observación. Can I just respond sure, to one sure. point? And I will do it in Spanish. <laughs> Muchas gracias por compartir su, su experiencia. Y, y es un todo feedback muy importante y por compartir tampoco, también un poco el, el historial ¿no? de, de dónde viene Desinventar y tiene toda la razón que esa es la historia y cómo se creó y para qué se creó. Y sobre todo yo creo que con la, in, la intención de que mm, pudieran a nivel nacional exactamente decidir eh, qué variables eran importantes y evitar que solamente se registren los eventos que, que, que van, van a registrarse a nivel internacional porque eh, cumplen determinados criterios, ¿no? como en el caso de EMDA, que tienen que ser unos criterios un mínimo de, de, de muertes o un mínimo de daños económicos. Um, yo creo que todas esas observaciones claramente han servido mucho para llegar a esta reflexión de que necesitamos un nuevo sistema y y solamente eh, responder en, en relación al nuevo sistema, estamos aún en construcción. Si no hay una herramienta ya construida, es todo este proceso de entender las necesidades, entender las críticas, entender los problemas, entender eh, 
las, nuevas, las innovaciones, las nuevas propuestas y en este momento se va a iniciar un proceso de un nuevo prototipo. Incluso con el nuevo prototipo queremos vol volver a, a, a solicitar su feedback, sus inputs, para, para asegurarnos de que todos esos inputs que ya han dado, todas esas experiencias son um, tenidas en cuenta y que van a informar el nuevo sistema. Entonces ahora va a ser el proceso que iniciamos ahora de, del nuevo prototipo, eh, User testing, eso será en los próximos meses para que el año que viene podamos tener todo eso consolidado para crear un nuevo sistema. Entonces, continuamos contando con su colaboración y con sus inputs para ese nuevo prototipo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Iria. We have three more questions here in the front, Justin, and in the back. Then we need to close um, the round of uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yuichi Ono from uh, Tohoku University, Sendai, Japan. I have just had a deja vu that uh, this conversation, and 20 years ago, uh, the International um, Task Force Group on uh, ISDR, the WMO was Ken Davidson Manor, then the UNDP was uh, Mr. Andrew Musgrave. Uh, then the two are talking about disaster data and hazard data, how to mix it. And uh, not in American countries, well, the examples. Then the ISDR was facilitating, which was me. So this, uh, this, uh, this is very good uh, again. This uh, NDMO and NMHS data, both are governmental data to combine, to make a link. Then the government do not want to use the other non-governmental data. So I really have a value of the government data to be you know, aligned with this uh, uh, policy making. So I really congratulate again for this initiative and we should uh, help each other. And we, we, um, I want to make uh, my best effort to combine this uh, data. Thank you very much, uh, ISDR, UNDR. Thank you, Justin. Thanks very much. I've got four points, but I'll keep them very brief. Um, firstly, um, as is no doubt obvious to all of you, IFRC welcomes this. Um, what you've just described is completely aligned with the concept of the Global Crisis Data Bank. Um, it forms you know, a key, key two of the three pillars, more or less, of it. Um, so we welcome this and are um, on board. Um, and also, as you know, in almost every country, the Red Cross or Red Crescent National Societies are auxiliary to the NDMOs. So we already have a, a, a role to play, essentially. Um, one thing to, to um, in response to the uh, Carlos's point um, from just a moment ago, um, I think, and in, in to Debbie's from this morning, is I think it's, it is critical that we, we build on the, the lessons learned and the, the use cases um, of actors who have, you know, who have um, developed such systems um, that are parallel or comparable for their own for their own benefit. So, for example, within the Red Cross uh, Red Crescent uh, network, um, just to take two examples, uh, the Italian Red Cross and the American Red Cross have massive disaster loss databases or incident report systems. Um, with many hundreds of thousands of events, um, often per year. And I think it would be good to understand how and why they develop their systems so that we can um, avoid um, you know, repeating any, any mistakes. Um, and then just maybe lastly, I'll skip my fourth point, but uh, my third and final point is um, in addition to the need for data standards and looking forward, I think it's also very critical that we take stock of the existing methods used to enumerate and to populate the existing fields in this inventor because, and other databases. Because if we don't understand how the data and what the, how the metrics have been produced to date, um, it will make it much more difficult to make that data interoperable and to understand the different biases um, that are, you know, uh, that are implicated when, when, that, when the data is produced. Over. Thank you. And we have the colleague in the back. Okay, eh, solo un, un comentario para complementar un poco lo que estaba mencionando ahora el colega Carlos sobre ese inventar. Y es que, eh, frente a la pregunta también que hacía ahora la colega Janet, entendemos que en Desinventar tenemos cuatro variables robustas, principalmente, que son las variables que, que digamos, que más data tienen, que son las relacionadas con eh, las personas, personas fallecidas, damnificados, heridos, enfermos, y eh, las viviendas, ¿no? Viviendas destruidas y viviendas dañadas. Esas son las cuatro variables que en todas las bases de datos siempre vamos a tener. 
Cuando se concibió el sistema de Sinventar, se tuvo una larga discusión precisamente en cuáles iban a ser las variables a considerar en el sistema, porque eh, entendemos que todos los países van a dinámicas y ritmos diferentes. En ese sentido, eh, se entendía que si exigíamos una larga cantidad de variables para ingresar al sistema, pues obviamente muchas de estas iban a quedar vacías. De hecho, cuando uno, uno, uno revisa las datas de desinventar, aquellas asociadas a, a, a sector, por ejemplo, como transporte, eh, como sistemas de energía, acueducto, etcétera, incluso el, el tema eh, asociado a la agricultura en función de los cultivos afectados y hectáreas de bosque, por ejemplo, afectadas o dañadas, son variables más débiles. Entonces, eh, las bases de datos históricas, por ejemplo, que en América Latina tenemos bases de datos de más o menos de 30 años en casi todos nuestros países, eh, son bases de datos que se construyeron, como mencionaba ahora el colega Carlos, basándose en fuentes hemerográficas principalmente. Y esto porque las instituciones nacionales, bien sea o no tenían los datos o simplemente el funcionario de turno no los quería compartir. Entonces, bajo esa limitante fue que se decidió iniciar el proceso con fuentes hemerográficas inicialmente. Ahora, dentro del espacio eh, con Naciones Unidas, pues se, la idea es trabajar a nivel de países, ¿cierto? Y que los países se vinculen. Pero en América Latina también se trabajó mucho el tema de las bases eh, locales, ¿sí? Que dentro, del, dentro de lo que es el desinventar Sendai no se concibe, pero en, en América Latina sí se trabajó, por ejemplo... Cali, la ciudad de Cali, Colombia, o por ejemplo la ciudad de, de, de Bogotá, con un ejercicio que se hizo en el año 2015, donde se recopilaron una base de datos de más o menos 130 mil registros para la ciudad, en un periodo más o menos de 10 años, creo, no, no recuerdo muy bien. Entonces, digamos que son procesos a escalas diferentes que se desarrollaron con la metodología y el uso de la herramienta eh, de ese inventar. Bueno, entonces la reflexión que quiero dejar aquí es que eh, pensar en las variables que va a tener el sistema nos, nos obliga necesariamente también a pensar en las dificultades que pueden tener los países para poder hacer la recolección de los datos. Porque entiendo que uno puede pensar en un modelo ideal, pero luego hay que hacer la bajada al modelo más aceptable, ¿no? Para, para que así pueda, eh, se puedan tener resultados, porque si no, al final vamos a tener herramientas con una cantidad de, de juguetes, digámoslo así, o de, o de funcionalidades pero que en la práctica no van a servir porque hay países donde simplemente no es posible aplicarlo por las dificultades que pueda haber en la, en la recolección de, de los datos. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rajesh, you want um, respond to that um, and then also take us to the guiding questions for the breakout groups. Sir? You want to have some more discussion after this? Maybe I just want to respond to this one first, yeah? Yeah, oh, okay, so, okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, I just uh, heard uh, colleagues from uh, Costa Rica, Carlos and other colleague also uh, on Desinventar. In fact, I have been involved in setting up Desinventar in so many countries in uh, Asia. And in the beginning, early days, uh, it was sometimes just confined to collecting data from newspapers. And uh, I will say that Desinventar has done a commendable job in terms of raising awareness about disasters, impact, initiated a lot of debates about why something should be recorded this way or that way, what is right, what is wrong. So all those discussions we are having, I think Desinventar has contributed in some way, in a positive manner to all this debate. And over the years in Asia, Pacific region especially, uh, after the 2004 tsunami, there has been a lot of emphasis and awareness about data information among the governments. And that has also brought about a lot of changes in the way governments are looking at uh, data information and its role in decision-making analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So I will say that uh, the days when Desenventa started probably in uh, mid nineties until today, and I have a lot of experience or working in several countries in Asia Pacific region. There were a lot of questions, very basic questions being asked from our uh, colleagues, counterparts in uh, national governments. Sometimes it was limited to how many years data we should collect. We have 8,000 data cards, is it enough? I mean, there were those questions, though, to me, those are all part of learning, learning for them, learning for us. And today we are raising a lo lot of questions, like uh, Janet was mentioning some questions. Those are very, very valid questions because over the years, government has understood that housing is not one type, road is not, not of one type or expressly not of one type in a country. There are country specific context situations. So we need to capture them in the system. And that's why today we have come to this level. 
only because of all those discussions, debates we had in the countries. We have also analyzed the data collected from newspapers versus data existing in CRED versus data existing collected from government records. We have undertaken an analysis of all three of them and demonstrated to government why you should be going this way or that way. What is the value addition? So a lot of work has been done. And to me, uh, what we are seeing today here, this discussion, this partnership, basically building on all that experience, our collective experience, all of us, Move, have moved from well, those early days of 1990s, 2000s to 2022 now, and trying to address the complexity, challenges of what, what has been posed to us by the current contest and situation of this multidimensional risk, et cetera, et cetera, and the kind of tools we have. We have not been able to utilizing uh, those kind of technologies and tools which are available to us today. And that's why I think through this uh, session and through this partnership, we are trying to build on all that experience, which is there not just with us, with all of us in this room and others. So let's let's pull in our expertise, resources, experiences, and uh, put it to this in terms of uh, testing it, building it. And as our colleague was saying, like uh, now we are basically building a system which is flexible. It will not be one system for all. It will be a system which will allow you to configure. For example, Microsoft Office, sometimes it has a student edition, professional edition, this edition, that edition, depending on what you want to use. So we will have multiple ed editions responding to various needs and allowing greater configurability by countries, uh, by stakeholders, and also in terms of language interface, all those features, challenges which we have been facing so far. We do not have a structure in place right now to share with you, but then whatever feedback we get from the session here today, all those will be incorporated in development of the system moving forward in 2023. And all of you and others will also be part, uh, party to testing it, giving feedback. So it will not be something which will come out tomorrow and we'll say, here it is, and please take it and use it. No, you'll be part of it if there are problems, you will be part of the problems. If there are solutions, you will be part of the solutions. <laughs> Let's put, let me put it that way. So yeah, that's all I wanted to respond. So over to Iria. Thank you, because actually that was the same point. Um, I fully appreciate um, the challenge that the colleague was sharing, like, um, and being very careful and mindful of the difficulties of data collection and if we are too ambitious. But I think in the new system, we want to keep it, as Rajas was saying, modular that can be um, um, adapted to the different uh, contests and levels of maturity. So if a country have that data, that they have a place to put it. Uh, um, so we don't need to be very rigid about the variables. So uh, those that will not have that data, maybe by seeing the option of um, registering that data, they also uh, build an awareness of why it's important. So giving an example, in the old cementer system, you could just mark that the water distribution network has been affected, but perhaps it's much more helpful if you could record on the disruption. So uh, for how long and how many people were affected by the uh, disruption in the water distribution uh, system, because that's very relevant. Um, but those that may not have that information might not need to fill it, but if you have that option uh, that even could trigger or encourage you to, to improve uh, the, your data collection or to think about how that can be helpful. And I think there was a very beautiful example yesterday, I think from Costa Rica as well on, on this uh, regulatory agency um, trying to um, um, uh, put some penalties on a distribution company that um, disrupted the, the service um, um, after an event. And then that trigger um, thinking of uh, requiring continuity planning from the utilities. So I think, uh, uh, we should think about flexible and modular solutions and not be too restrictive and just keeping few variables that we know everyone will have data, like uh, deaths or uh, damage in housing, but keeping the options for those that might have more data to have a place uh, and a way a methodology to register and recording and analyzing it. And then um, that even could trigger and raise awareness of others of why it's important. I think that's something that has happened also in the Sendai framework monitoring this indicator. So um, uh, raising the awareness of the importance of collecting some of this data, and then um, over time helping and advancing the systems and the, the way the data is collected and is organized. And with that, over back to you. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks a lot. Uh, three things, uh, because this is important. When we, when, when the rubber hits the road, know where, where are we going with this? Can, can I suggest three things? Uh, and it's not just for, for the, for the organizers, but also for those who are here and participating. Uh, note, noting the, the concern uh, about what had happened in the past, 
I agree with Justin from IFRC that uh, we have to be looking at those uh, lessons learned. And, and my suggestion is for those who have experienced this before, suggest principles, principles in, in that, that can guide the next step process. You know, the principle, for example, of uh, ownership, right? Ownership of data, uh, user uh, friendly, uh, of course, flexibility and others are, are, are some characteristics, but I, 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 I would suggest that we get a, a, view, a few more discussions about principles based on uh, experiences, and Yuichi actually talked about that earlier. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is uh, inevitably there will be different maturity levels of how every organization deals with rationale, usefulness, uh, uh, comprehensiveness, because every every organization will start from where they are, right? You know, uh, I agree that you know you cannot we, uh, a, a national government can just not uh, uh, follow uh, something imposed on, on them from outside. But at the same time, we also don't want those countries who have more advanced maturity level to advance forward, right? Because there are some countries here, for example, in the just work. Uh, in Indonesia and even in, in uh, Cambodia, where they actually have advanced already. Uh, and so I, I think the second one would be when, when you, when you tell, tell us during the discussion about, about uh, your, your suggestions, we should recognize that there's a certain level of maturity from one country to another. The third one is uh, process. Uh, would, would you, by way of example, suggest uh, how do we engage, continue to engage the community here? How, how do we engage the community here? So, for example, yesterday and today, we have heard a lot of very good uh, uh, range of institutions. Some of them are already fairly advanced in using open source software. Uh, a private sector is also offering something that's already existing and has a business case and a business model already attached to it. And so what, what I would suggest is that you, you also consider the idea of let's continue convening maybe a smaller group of a community of, of people who are working on data. And we know, you know Justin and uh, Sylvan and, and others, we have been working together, even if we have different association. Uh, but that's the point, no? Uh, you actually mentioned that earlier. You know, this is discussion 20 years ago. But but uh, but I think the community of, uh, data per persons will, will have to continue because this is not the end of of everything. There's still a lot of complex challenges ahead of us. So that's what we want to listen to in, in the discussion following forward. So so maybe we can uh, further expand that further. Let's have the guiding questions for the breakout rooms, breakout groups. So thanks, thanks a lot for the comments, suggestions uh, until now. Uh, what we are going to do, uh, we will just like uh, yesterday, we will break out uh, in groups. We will follow the same groups. Uh, everything will remain the same. Venue, everything remains the same. And uh, we ha here are just some questions uh, for the groups to discuss. Let me just uh, go through these questions. And uh, if there are like uh, more clarity needed, probably we can discuss them. So the first one is basically being the whatever we have presented so far, uh, how does it respond to the needs challenges which which which, which were mentioned and others which we are aware of and uh, uh, opportunities identified with different data producer users across the data value chain. So please keep that data value chain in your mind, which you have seen in, uh, since yesterday morning. And how does it, this whole approach, what we have presented so far, linking hazards, impacts, uh, uh, the way we should be going forward, including what uh, Sani was mentioning uh, in terms of principles, how do we uh, move forward, what are the important things we should keep in mind. And I will say that uh, these questions are suggestive in nature. Don't, it's like a, not a question answer session. We want you to think more like a, in a, like a more free flowing way. And anything you feel that it's not captured here, please include that from your group discussion so that we are able to, if we have missed something uh, from our side, we are able to consider that also. Second question being uh, for the proposed model uh, and referring to the data value chain, 
and please provide more specific recommendations because the example which uh, uh, Jim was presenting is was more in the context of uh, hydrometeorological hazards, hydrometeorological events. What about other kind of events which are uh, probably not listed here? For example, it could be geological events. It could be, for example, like. I don't know, sometimes fire hazards are there, forest fires are there. There are many other things which uh, I may not be thinking of them right now. So if you bring out those during your discussions, something which has not um, come to our mind, which are, like, uh, which are there in your country, sometimes there are very specific uh, hazards which are present in certain countries, certain contexts. Please bring them out so that they could be considered while developing the system. Now, again, uh, uh, the, the question number B to B is strengthening the linkages between hazards, event and losses and damages. What role uh, hydromet agencies and NDMOs they can play? What how they can better coordinate? What are the challenges? And some challenges could be generic. Some challenges could be very specific to your country context or region context. Please uh, try to bring them out. I think the whole idea of this uh, um, group discussion is basically to bring out things which are relevant moving forward what should be captured, what should be kept in mind. And whatever uh, analysis we generate from here, uh, yeah. from the system, how do we communicate those insight analysis uh, to their users, policy makers. And typically uh, we have certain things in our mind when we communicate data analysis to policy makers, decision makers, but then are there better ways? Are there things which we have not been doing and we should be doing moving forward? what the system should generate. Nowadays, as you know, most systems yeah, are very sophisticated. They can do a lot of things. So what is it that we should automate? What is it that could be manually configurable? So there could be a lot of other things in your mind. And I'm sure in each group, there are some people who are more like, I will say, informed in terms of what could come out of the systems, in terms of output or in terms of input, what, it, uh, what could be fed into the system. So please bring out all those dimensions. And also, uh, the third question is basically, what are the areas where uh, UNDRR, UNDP, WMO can provide better support? And uh, what is needed in your country context? And Sani gives an uh, idea about some principles, priority area, entry points, wherever, whatever you think is relevant. Again, I will go back to the same point. What is relevant uh, for development of this system? Maybe periodic testing, maybe certain aspects okay. which are not considered. Please bring them out and use this question to guide the discussion, but not be confined to these questions only. Bring out new dimensions which are not captured here, something which would enrich. So again, please remember that this is not our system, it's our collective system. So together we have to develop it and enrich it with the various features so that it is useful and relevant to all of us to the extent possible and different contexts. So I think uh, I will just stop here and in case uh, somebody has any Further, like comments or clarification, we want to seek. So maybe we can raise them now before we break out in the groups. Thank you very much, Rajesh. Um, if that's not the case, um, you have the guiding questions for the breakout groups. Uh, your facilitators and also and have them. The, the breakout groups will last for one hour. We are having a coffee start. and tea break afterwards. And, and we reconvene in this room for the next plenary at quarter to four then this afternoon. So you have one hour of breakout groups now. Enjoy and have good discussions.
Colleagues, uh, we would have the same groups as yesterday. So you can follow the same routine, the same rooms and with your same facilitators. Uh, group A, as yesterday is here. Group D is downstairs. D for Delta is downstairs. Group B, Bravo, and Group C, Charlie, are in the Longer Oigan building on the 21st floor. It's exactly as yesterday.
Okay, we are, we are ready to start. If you could, uh, if colleagues could take a seat. This is group A. No, they have a, they have a group in a group. <laughs> this is record group A. Oh, there's a photo session going on. But there was two groups there, no? English and French. One, okay, okay. Jim, Jim is busy in the photo session. <laughs> so colleagues, this is group A. Those who were here yesterday, basically we are continuing with the same groupings. Of course, it's, it's, it's free flow. It, it's not necessary, you know, it's not hard and fast. You have to be in the same group day, but more or less, just just in terms of language and, and regions, we have tried to kind of bring bring people together with the similar backgrounds. Yes, Justin, please. Hi, Rahul, thanks. Um, picking up on the point that Carlos okay, was making in plenary. I, I sorry, was, Justin, if you oh, want to go into the substance, we just need that oh, rapporteur yeah, sorry, again. Sorry. One, one, so just, just a point of order. Uh, as yesterday, we'd like to get a volunteer for rapporteering. If we can have someone who'd like to wrap it here for the plenary, please. Do we have someone? Volunteer. Yesterday we had Australia and then we had Nepal. So we're looking for some others. Yeah, and uh, and it doesn't necessarily we, we 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 have of course from the countries, but also from the other international organizations. If someone would like to volunteer, and and there's no bar about you know you have just spoken in the previous panel. That's absolutely okay if you have. Justin, you know? I mean, if if forced to, I can do it. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, there's no forcing. Hearing from me. Um, no, 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 there's no forcing. But you you definitely you know bring in the. The right points to the to the table. We can but, get confirmation from others. If, somebody if that's all right, uh, Justin from uh, IFRC will represent us in the plenary. I could be a reporter uh, ad interim in case someone else decides they want to take over for me. Uh, yeah. So he, as he says, anyone would want to take over from him, he's more, he'll be most happy. <laughs> but as of now, it's, it, we go with Justin. Thanks, Justin. Thank you so much. I think we don't need to go through the questions because I have already mentioned the questions. So probably we can just uh, start with Justin and other colleagues have any comment questions, please just uh, let's continue. Okay, I, I just had a, it was a quick point, uh, guys. Um, based on what Carlos had said uh, earlier, I think not that we should do this, I think now, um, or that this would in any way be completely determinant or comprehensive from the beginning, but I think it's important to take stock of the um, known or anticipated use cases uh, of the users so that it doesn't look like we're a bunch of solutions in search of a problem. And I think that's the, the key thing here that we all recognize is that this work is critically important and it will obviously support a number of uh, intended use cases. But if we kind of start with the user and the users in mind and work backward or at least go through the process of, of trying to work backward from what their needs are. Um, I think it helps bring, it might help bring people on institutions on board and make sure that we don't go off track 
again, that, that is, that's more of a meta point, not for this breakout group, but, but for the as we take it forward uh, in the coming months over. No, yes, that, that's a very important point. Who are the users of the system? And that will guide the development of system. Yeah, yes. Anyone else, any comments here? Thanks, Justin. And I would like to, as, as Rajesh mentioned in the, uh, in the previous session, the questions are only guiding questions. Uh, we'd like to hear a free flow of discussion on across, across them and, and what feedback you'd have based on what you heard in the previous session about the system being proposed. Thanks. Professor Davis. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm just conscious of where I don't want to, Jim, to focus too much on this side of the, of the floor plate again. So forgive me on that regard. Um, but just echoing what was being said, I think some use cases would be incredibly powerful and useful. Um, I, I'm, okay, I'm a meteorologist, but I, I think there's some sort of this examples of a typhoon the summer heat wave was mentioned, Australian floods, you know, tangible examples that people could resonate with. And then, Jim, you know, our, 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 where we use in our new standard, right? And how we then use the UUID as a mechanism to capture events and then bring other communities on board about how we could use that and leverage that. And I think just tangible learning exercises using past events and maybe in real time as well, events is why I think we can take this forward. Because at the moment, there's always a danger it becomes untangible. It's pieces of paper. You cannot be people working together in real time using case studies to explore the opportunities that this particular program can deliver. So I echo what was said earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Davis. Nick, please, you have the floor. Uh, maybe just to express a concern. Um, from what I understand and in looking at the data that's being contributed to Disinventar in its present form, there are only five countries that have contributed data up to 2022. Mm. Uh, the number falls off significantly thereafter uh, with contributions, in some instances, out of date from the year 2000 forward. So. Um, moving forward with a new proposal, I think, yes, um, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm also curious and concerned about the way in which reporting will be, again, incentivized is perhaps the wrong, the wrong way to spin it, but how do you encourage countries which have resource challenges, data collection challenges, uh, connectivity issues, where we're looking at already a disconnect between primary data collection at the local level, how it integrates with national level systems, which are owned and operated by NDMOs and national uh, hydromet agencies. Um, and to use uh, an example of a, of a recently developed system, um, which UNDR, WMO and the Chima Foundation have all been engaged with, the Africa Multi-Hazard Early Warning Early Action System Program, um, which only deals with three specific hazards, riverine flooding, torrential rains, and wind. And there again, there is a great deal of restriction in terms of capacity to report into the system from member states in the African Union. There is, in some instances, political obstacles to reporting. Um, and, and the system really works on a, on a five-day cycle. So if you're reflecting on incoming weather uh, and trying to take preparedness actions, either through UN, NGO, CSOs, et cetera, um, obviously that calculus is extremely complex. Uh, so being able to process data, use it for specific purposes, um, and, and then also to do secondarily data reporting into things like the Sendai monitor, um, and into some of those higher level processes is again, extremely complex. And for many countries, a very big ask. Um, and now that I think the, the successor system to Disinventar is perhaps not going to exist in the public forum to overcome some issues with uh, accuracy of data, um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of reporting is, is actually possible and how 
we can all coalesce around ensuring that there is a greater degree of, of data linked to analysis being carried out, which is then utilized for implementation and programming. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, just, just one point I wanted to mention uh, regarding this, and, and you also being part part of the part of the UN uh, larger UN family. You know, we uh, UN the UN Secretary General has come up with a UN data strategy. I'm I'm just trying to uh, kind of draw parallels there. Uh, and the, the the point I want to make was if you look at that data strategy that came out last year, it, it, it's very clear. Data is no more about technology. It's it's now they are it's it's built around pillars of people and culture. I and mean, I'm just quoting it from there: people and culture, technology, and and, um, and and partnerships. And so, technology is just one of the pillars. So those issues of connectivity and all are going to be there. But the emphasis now is really get, being given on what you're saying on capacities whether a data strategy or will, will succeed or not will depend on cap capacities more than the system itself. And the governance mechanisms, obviously, as you said, are different in different countries, uh, and it's not going to be you know, one size fits all. And this is what we are trying to make sure. This is, this is uh, for example, this is not the SDG kind of portal. Yeah, SDG portal is, is where, or the Center Framework or other, other uh, international agreements, they have a portal, which is a global portal where countries are expected to provide data because they're obliged to provide the data because they are they have signed up on a UN general um, GA resolution. This is an offer to the countries that this is a system that you can use. What it requires, the capacities it requires, the technology it requires, the connectivity issue that you mentioned, uh, the partnership that you require, as you said, the, the, in Africa, that, that without that, that would that would not be possible. So, so all I'm saying is that, as as we work on the system, we'll also have to parallelly work on these aspects of of the of of a, of a data mechanism where there is partnerships, there are uh, the governance mechanism, and the capacity building. That's ex absolutely required, and this is what we are we are we are learning to our peril, and and when we are just pushing through. A new system because new systems are a dozen a dime. Really, those aspects really help to build that system up. Thanks. Sorry, please. And the interaction between Met Service and NDMO um, has been a problem, as as uh, uh, Uichi had, had stated for twenty years, and even before that, I think. And I think we, one of the things that we are aiming to do for the CHE anyway, and also from as a vendor side, is to couple our launching events, or should I say kickoff events or that for the regions and that to by bringing both together at a senior enough level, such that um, uh, this dialogue can start and in some cases start or be strengthened. And I think this is really the key uh, to any success, uh, whether it be through the Disaventar tool or the CAG, you need to have the scientific and technical agencies working in unison with the NDMO to be able to provide the best information, best standards for accounting of you know, uh, uh, impacts as well as hazards, et cetera. Uh, and then it, it's across the board, it's not just HydroMet, um, uh, hazards, it could be civil disobedience. They have to work with other agencies on that particular uh, side. So we're going to work to try to bring these two together even more and by put, including them in the implementation side. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, please. Thanks. Uh... Perhaps to follow on the, the the comment from Jim of the joint launching, uh, one uh, one way perhaps to show this uh, use case and also benefit is to have uh, pilot cases. Ah, sorry, to follow on your your comment, Jim, uh, perhaps to uh, as a follow up of this joint launching where uh, NMHS and NDMO come together. Perhaps uh, in the region, uh, we could agree to have a pilot, for instance, to to you to show where where use cases can come and also can when, where benefit can can be derived from uh, from from this uh, joint pilot activity in 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 a 
in a country. Uh, uh, perhaps also we can choose one of the country which has already uh, the, the pilot case of CHE running. That would be uh, perhaps uh, 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 an, an example. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, we've planned a few pilots and maybe Rajaji, you can uh, mention about the uh, maturity assessment study from which we are basically working with the countries. Yes, the idea of selecting pilot basically like uh, in the past we were uh, looking at all countries in the same manner but the study which i presented yesterday the findings from the study that uh, every country is unique and they are at they are at different maturity level in terms of data availability in terms of digitalization etc and uh, when we engage with a country i think we would like to take some uh, assessment in terms of where the country is so that uh, the support to the country can be accordingly provided. So it's not like uh, we don't do the, maybe there could be, for example, if there is a capacity building uh, training program, so the capacity building training program could be tailored differently for a low capacity country and the same program could be tailored differently for a high capacity country. So that way, maybe one country needs only one day course, another country may need five day course. So we, we are aware of this based on our uh, understanding and then we want to moving forward, adopt that approach. I don't know whether there will be three category of countries or five, but again, it will be country to country. Yeah. Thank you, Raj. Please. Can I just support Senna's suggestion? I think that's a very good one. And I'd love that to be a recommendation going forward. Jim, you described very eloquently this morning the role of the National Met Services in observing the weather. Every single day, all 192 nations, developed and undeveloped, record the weather. In WMO, we've designed a technology that we share that data, everyone. So when you Google or look on your, on your phone, the temperature any place on this planet is an artifact of that capability. It's agnostic to the service and the system that we're using. Wouldn't it be a fantastic opportunity that the MET services are able to record the event, the hazard, using exactly the same technology? It's already there. And it means that any country can contribute to that. So that's what I was hoping to get from this workshop, it was an agreement from those who would benefit from the system. Is this the right thing to do? Is the standard usable, useful? And if it is, then let's use pilots to exploit that capability. That would be easy to implement and easy then to sort of have a go and see if it works. I'm not thinking about the impact and the other aspect of the beneficiary of that capability, but from the other side of the hazards and recording the events, there's a quick win here perhaps and it's the standard and agreement on that standard is the way forward so hopefully I, I i get the impression that people are willing and supportive of that and pilots could be a mechanism by which we endorse or otherwise that approach thank you very much thank you professor davis anyone else so i mean Sorry, I'm not meant to be in this group, so I'm really cheating. I've just got a bit busy. We, 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 no one's got it tattooed, so no problem. It's all right. Be on any, any group at all. Rahul, you are lovely. Um, I think that Paul has made a really valid point, and I'd very much like to support this approach and support Jim's approach and to linking to all the work that we're doing, that we can try and pull a lot of this together. Because the other part of it is it's much easier if we get early warning systems for early action from a weather event to imp impact upon health improvements, it's really key that we deliver this. So I think it's a very important partnership, but also I thought the cascade that um, Jim, you were talking about earlier of trying to identify hazards and the impacts of those hazards would be really important. So we start understanding what the health effects might be. There could be infectious diseases, it could be injuries and death. It just depends what the impacts are, but we really need to document these as early as we can, I think. Thank you, Professor Murray. Please. Uh, thank you. I'm Shami from ADRC. So uh, I'd like to know that the, the hydrometric data is totally measurable, but uh, that disaster, once we talk, think about disaster, how to measure or how to count is totally depending on the countries. 
So how and who will be verify? Maybe you discussed earlier, but the what in your concept, who would be verifying? Or is it okay just a country specific issue? So the data set or database itself is not comparable to other countries. Thank you so much. Again, I am responding based on the experience of working in several countries. Uh, the data quality issue, um, it, this has been there for a long time and it, it will remain there. And uh, when we have worked in a country, we have always, again, it's not a criticism, but every country context capacities, a lot of challenges are there and governments operate under a lot of constraints. We need, to, we need to understand that and appreciate whatever they are able to do despite all those constraints. So that needs to be appreciated. Now, uh, when we build a database in a country and we request the government to bring out data from wherever it is residing in some particular department or agency at national level, local level, there are challenges. And uh, I am aware that in some countries when the data is captured at the local level, sometimes somebody just picks up a mobile phone and communicate somebody, okay, and this is what has happened. And it's not recorded at local level. So that, that's a practical challenge. But now uh, when the data is collected from the country, from different agencies put together, we request because you will analyze the data and then there will be findings of data like uh, brought back to the government. So now the data is being collected by the government for itself. It is being analyzed, presented by them. So then it is in their own interest to ensure that the quality is uh, in place. The systems are in place so that, that the uh, data, whatever is being collected is verified by somebody, approved by somebody be, be, before it enters in the system finally. So I will say, even if there is a this, like a large, smaller subset of data, which is not of good quality, but government continues to improve the quality over a period of time. So automatically over a period of time, the bad quality data will reduce. It will be less and less and good quality data will continue to increase. So there should be some, there will be some error that, again, there is no point in having perfect quality data, best quality data in this world. The point is whatever we have, how to make use of it and how to continue to improve the quality. So we need to strike a balance in terms of uh, what quality to maintain, but there should be parameters uh, in place, SOPs in place to continue to ensure that the quality of data is maintained. There are systems in place, people are trained, people are, uh, understanding the definitions, why we are doing it, what does it mean? So a lot, lot, lot of things are there. And I think uh, these are all, I will say country, country specific, but we need to provide a general guidance in terms of, so that uh, country can um, adopt it and use it. So that's what I just want to say in terms of quality. So from the hydromet side and the catalog, uh, it's the nice thing about the WMO is that we have a quality management system within the MET services when we produce all of our data. Uh, it goes through various levels of quality management. And there are countries that are producing um, catalog information already. It's not like we're starting from scratch in this particular area. We have, we have identified those countries in that. And those countries have quality management checks uh, where they uh, verify the data. They say that, you know, as far as the area and coverage and et cetera, and actually link it uh, um, to each other. Um, and so this is part of the WMO framework, and this is what, what we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. So from our side, as far as the, the actual physical uh, event itself, the hazard, we can, we can monitor and record that fairly efficiently. Thanks, so Jim. Uh, and just to complement uh, what my colleagues mentioned, uh, there's also a whole lot of guidance that is being developed, as, as we mentioned yesterday, that the, the UN um, Commission on uh, Statistical Commission has uh, agreed or has given the mandate to develop a common framework in disaster statistics that would go a long way in providing kind of what you said to national statistical organizations, a common parameter against which the, the disaster statistics can be taken because they are the ones who are at the end of the day, custodian of, of data in general in each of the countries. And also there are certain agencies like FAO is here. You, you, sh you would have seen the work that they do with the agricultural ministries. And that is why we have the agricultural loss. There's, there's a quite a bit of, you know, really 
uh, I would say, standardization that has been achieved there. And it's a very good example for, for you to see. But, but there are other examples as well. So, so we are not there yet, but there are these steps are being taken in the right direction. Uh, I just wanted to mention, because there are a number of uh, long questions here, just to be a little more focused, uh, we wanted to basically take your feedback on three main uh, points. I just go through the three points and then we can go back one by one. And, and all the groups are doing the same. So the first question or point that we want to reflect on is, what are the specific features that you think we should have in a system like a, a disaster loss tracking system or a, or a hazard event tracking system? What are the features you think you would want there and what you would not want there? Like, please don't do it. It's a big no, right? That's one. Second is the issue of principles. That's um, also a colleague, uh, Sani from UNDP also mentioned that what kind of principles you think a system like this should follow? And thirdly, how would you, at a personal level, at an organization level, would like to remain engaged in a process of development of such a system? So let's start with the first one. What are the kind of features that you would think would be essential to have in a loss tracking and or hazard events tracking system? Uh, and what, what features you would not like to have if, if there are any? Oh, just to this. Sure. Thanks, Joe. This is actually a perfect segue because I wanted to um, pick up on something that um, Paul had made and it was a recommendation in this vein. I think one feature that we'd like to see at IFRC and on behalf of, I think, most National Red Cross, Red Crescent societies is whenever there's a, a forecast um, to at least put it into historical context. You know, it would be great to be able to say, OK, here are the forecasted impacts and this event that's on the horizon looks like it's going to be comparable to the 1977 cyclone or the 1974 flood or whatever it may be. But if even if you don't have that, at least put the hazard into historical context. I think even things like one in 10 year, one in 50 year, one in 100 year flood sound at, or can remain a bit abstract. But if you can put it into historical context, um, it also demonstrates the the value of the data, the, de the, the initiative basically. Um, over. Thank you, Just. Please. I mean, this seems like a bit of a wish list, but um, it would be nice also to have um, sectors that are not normally highlighted in such systems uh, to have more prominence. Um, of course, I'm speaking, you know, from an agricultural impacts point of view. Um, and I think a lot of these systems focus on, uh, for good reason, initially on impacts on population, infrastructure, et cetera. But uh, we have the data out there many times for agriculture. It's just not incorporated in the structure of, of such you know, hazard uh, or impact projection systems. And, and so that kind of slips off, off the horizon a little bit. I mean, what are the impacts of particular hazard event projected to be on on crops uh you know or on livestock or other aspects so uh yeah again this is, is a bit of a wish list but i think there we could do a better job even given the data we already have uh, you know to highlight impacts in other sectors over thank you so much please shani just, just following on from that, and I think uh, just tying in with some of the comments from Cambodia, I think yesterday, um, having the, the finance and insurance sector involved in being able to help us convert from the physical uh, damage and loss information to, to economic damage and loss, I think is a, a really key step that would be, you know, this is a wish list, but uh, that would be that would be the perfect thing. And, and it kind of ties in with your question three up on there in, in terms of what we need for support. Um, in Australia, we struggle uh, to get uh, a strong relationship with the insurance uh, industry to get the information. Um, we have lots of discussions with them and get promised lots of things. And I think we're slowly making some inroads, but I think what we're doing here over the last two days of getting self-organized uh, and building some momentum and then uh, having other players such as the International Red Cross um, being involved in, and very supportive of this, it, it, it does build a, a momentum um, so that when we do have those discussions in country, um, there is more willingness to be able to, to join in and, and help 
uh, with the co-design and the contribution of, of, of information. And if any discussions are happening from the UN across to some of the big insurers or reinsurers, um, that would definitely help as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Please, Professor Davis. It's an interesting question about what we don't want. <laughs> And I wonder what we don't want is a bespoke tailored activity and whether we should design something which is agnostic to the service and the system we're supporting. Um, in, in that context, we shouldn't be tailored on the visualization or what it looks like and the design of that. The opportunity that we have is the, is the process and the standards by which we can share data that avoids that pitfall, I think, of then tailoring it to specific particular sector at the, at the detriment of other sectors. So I would plead if there was an option, an opportunity, is that we design something which is agnostic to the system or services we deliver towards and support and make it available and usable for all sectors and all countries. Keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you so much, President. Please. I think it would be nice to add special component to this data. I mean, first of all, it's to able to download this information from uh, this inventor in uh, any um, JS format, GeoJSON or shapefile anyway, to use it for, I'm from WFP, to use in our activities so we can make some comparison and might be useful. Another as idea might be to disaggregate this data in uh, district province uh, level. So it might be more visual, we can have more visual comparison. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, like currently the design data we have it as a three administrative levels, but uh, as Jim would tell you, of course, disasters don't know administrative boundaries. So we have, uh, you know, incidents that cross the brown borders internationally or nationally, and, and we, we really need to look at the perspective, but very important point. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, all points already discussed, we are uh, discussing within us. So just one point, I am sure that will be there. Uh, is there any provision to have um, fields for baseline data over there so that we can compare the damages with uh, baseline to real time impact? So we can easily get and view uh, how, uh, what is our uh, level of impact occurred for certain disaster. So one, one that is no brainer is that of course, for data that is there in this inventor that will be forward integrated. So that's not a problem at all. But then we will also look at other systems that countries may have, but that of course will may take a little time. We will build it in a, in a modular function. So first maybe we'll look at this inventor and all that data that's already available mm -hmm. that, that can be uh, like it, it will be almost start off with that data, like already in the system, okay. and then you build from there. But but as as uh, I think Nick mentioned, uh, there are data gaps even there. I mean, it's not necessary that you know what we bring forward has data for every year. There will be huge gaps in between as well. So uh, even the baseline has is doesn't mean a complete year by year baseline. So we look forward to even kind of get some, getting some retroactive data for that. Another point uh, I think already discussed, uh, it's uh, uh, law, damage and loss data uh, should be in sector specific. I mean, for agriculture, food security, livelihood uh, separately. And uh, it would be really great if, if we can access that data in terms of um, time series. So we can see the uh, changes of damage and losses over the time. So uh, that's the point we discussed in our team, but I delivered. Thank you. As a colleague from FAO mentioned, sectoral uh, data is extremely yes. important, and it's it's not just for one particular ministry, but across. Exactly. Yes, yes. Thank you. Nick. Thanks, Arul. Uh, just a couple of questions, maybe. I'm wondering if, with reference to the new system, UNDRR, WMO, UNDP would propose any 
country champions for initial rollout or pilot rollout, um, potentially across different geographic regions, potentially with different hazardous events in mind in terms of trying to generate an initial result towards enhancing or facilitating additional reporting. Um, secondarily, uh, from my point of view and having spent uh, most of my career in a variety of different developing countries, maybe also just to point out, and it's no surprise to anyone, of course, but um, I feel that there's a, a large uh, inequity or challenge in terms of finding financing uh, within national budgets for hydromet agencies, um, especially in comparison to national disaster management authorities um, or civil protection agencies. Uh, reflecting on the case of Timor Leste as one example, I spent several weeks there earlier this year to do a, a disaster risk assessment. Um, the newly elected president of the Civil Protection Agency is extremely supportive of the Hydromed Agency, but having said that, they have, I think, three staff and largely rely on Indonesia uh, and Australia for much of their weather forecasting. So. For smaller states in particular, um, there is that resource gap which hampers uh, quality and accuracy of reporting um, in addition to some of the technical outlays that are currently in place. So um, again, I think no surprise to anyone in this room, but I, I just wanted to put that um, on the agenda as one, I think, major constraint in terms of the your, your second question there in terms of how the two bodies can better coordinate over. Thank you for the question. Those are very important points. Um, it is within the concept from WMO's standpoint with and working together with uh, UNDR and UNDP to be able to um, roll this out where we're bringing in, just like we did here, the NDMOs and the MET services together to, to help them actually work together. Um, this is part of the concept uh, of rollout. Um, the other aspect, what you're talking about as far as islands are concerned, I've done uh, analysis in the Caribbean. It's very much the same way. Some islands just don't have the capacity to do certain things. So you have islands that cover for other islands uh, where they don't have a particular service or NDMO or something like this. And another island actually su supports them in that particular area. Those are sharing agreements that are done through you know, uh, agreements between, between those countries uh, or those island states. And we have to reflect that. I mean, this is something that we have to recognize that we don't have the resources and how it, we implement to recognize that and adapt to that situation. Um, it's not a, a solution, but we have to start somewhere and to move forward in this particular area, just like they have in the Caribbean as far as early warning systems and, and the support mechanisms through CIMH and, and the, 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 the uh, disaster, um, uh, Caribbean Disaster Institute and stuff like that. It's the same with the SIDS. It's, it's a very difficult situation because they're isolated. So we need to be able to support them in a special way. And just on your first point, Nick, uh, the initial country uh, kind of let's a pilot list, uh, as, as Rajesh mentioned, we are looking at a kind of diverse set of countries to pilot with who have diverse capacities uh, and also as the use cases, as was mentioned earlier. So that will definitely be there. And in, in fact, also wanted to mention that the, all the good work that you're doing on the uh, on the displacement indicators, we are very, very keen to have that kind of data as well, uh, an opportunity for countries to provide that because right now, as, as we have heard many times, the monitor, monitoring, the official and seven from monitoring part does not have, even if you have affected people, even if it says you know, in a larger definition that it should have the displaced people, it, it does not have. Though Disinventor does have one data card on that, I mean, sorry, a data field on that, but not many countries are providing data. So this will definitely be there. Raj, please. No, th thanks a lot for bringing out uh, Timur Leste. In fact, there is a colleague who is being invited from Timur Leste, uh, one of the directors from NDMD. He is here probably in this group or maybe outside in a different group. Um, we have been like, because I was aware there is an ongoing GCF project in Timor Leste. And as part of there are some activity which interfaces with this theme of this workshop. So we made sure that somebody is able to participate. And to me, it's not just the launch of the system, but engaging the government in this kind of forums frequently. 
is also another way of uh, helping them being aware of what is going on, what are the challenges, how they can move forward. And also like in the past, we have um, sort of allowed South-South cooperation Timur Leste with Indonesia. We have colleagues from Indonesia also, and they continue to support Timur Leste in terms of capacity development. So those are also modalities. So we need to use all possible modalities, not just uh, this particular software system, so, so that they can be brought on board. And definitely fully agree with you. All countries similar with like low capacity countries, which lot of constraints. We need to um, think of them and how to bring them on board, how to help them overcome the challenges because disasters will strike any country, irrespective of whether you have capacity or not. So it's all collective responsibility to help them and bring them on board. So I'm sure like uh, colleagues like yours who can continue to point such uh, like issues to the group so that uh, we can continue to like uh, engage with them and build capacities, yeah. Thank you, Raj. I think the second point we had is also covered in many of the uh, feedback that we've received is that which is the principles that are to be followed. Uh, like you mentioned, some kind of sectoral orientation or other use of use cases and other others, if, if there are others, we would like to hear from you before we go to the third one. So on principles, we have got a few from you, but if there are some more that would be followed, Justin, please. Be just to be transparent, <clears throat> I think one of the principles is transparency. I mean, I, I've mentioned this earlier about, you know, having um, a window onto existing practice in terms of like, if you're populating, say, disinventar, you know, um, what's the actual source of the data um, for that field, for that metric? How was that metric produced? Um, and I think the more transparency we could bring to the initiative, um, the more confidence um, we, you know, we'll, we'll be able to generate in it. Um, so just that would be one. On that one, you just wanted to mention that this one deviation from the the Trizimentar it would be probably is that we're going to move more to the towards the official data. So the institutional mechanism will be now more with the governments. And so even if we have partners coming in providing information data, it would still have to be through the governments. It's it, which is different from the existing disinventar where technically I can start one disinventar for India today if I want this, because I think I can, but it, it doesn't work. So uh, the, that that is being, because we, we've realized one important thing is that the official data is official data. We have colleagues from the national stats organizations, unless we get the data from the governments or endorsed by the governments, uh, we'll spend a lot of time collecting data, which is not usable then. And, and so that transparency, uh, at least, I mean, for example, on the SDGs, on the center for monitoring, there it's it's a very clear, transparent way that the data is coming from the government. And then the government can say, okay, these are the sources that we have got it from. Uh, so it, the ownership is also much higher there. Please. Yeah, and it's very important. Um, when we look at meteorological data, as I've stated before, meteorological data you can trace back to the station and the station history um, uh, this is important that we encourage through the project um, governments to have that transparency when they're listing data that this data has metadata that says where it's come from and sources and etc so that we have traceability and understanding of the of the uh, how would you say veracity of it um, especially when we talk about social media and that, and, you know, well, there's a difference between an actual survey of data of damage versus social media account. How do you actually account for that? Thanks, Jim. Shoni, please. And just, just a quick point following that from the discussions yesterday, we heard that there are several systems, a real-time system, and obviously a, a more methodical process to, to follow. So one of the features that would be useful is obviously to be able to capture that and to be able to have the appropriate metadata associated with that. Um, and then, you know, in time, uh, the differences between those two figures may actually provide uh, information on uh, how you improve some of the real-time systems as well. But, but being able to capture... Uh, versions of the data, I think, is important um, because if if it's set up just to capture the official uh, level of data, I can see um, some countries being hesitant to put anything in at all um, 
for fear of getting it wrong and wanting to do uh, in-depth analysis to get it right rather than having the real-time system and what they knew at the time go in um, with the appropriate caveats and metadata and then be updated once they're more formal, um, longer-term and, and thorough process is, is captured. Tony, you bring up a very valid point, and I think that we should bring this out within this four in the sense that when a disaster happens, the first three days is really for the Disaster Management Authority about saving lives, clearing roads, getting things situated to where they can respond effectively. Um, then you have the next couple of days, which is more detailed into, you know, uh, structures, getting things, starting to get things back into normal uh in the normal sphere so the data when we're looking at data what is the data used for so in the first three days it's for the data disaster managers to assess the areas that they have to concentrate to uh, their operations it's not necessarily designed for disinventar uh and being able to put this in right away so we we look at the data latency factor from disinventar or from any other system in that light and what data are we actually bringing in at what times and when do we consider that data complete enough to be able to put up as saying yes this is what we have those are questions we have to answer yeah. just to complement that and, and clarify one point uh, please don't uh, also see this as a reporting mechanism this is not for international reporting i mean it is but that is only a secondary uh, you know kind of advantage the main use of this kind of system is for national risk assessments analysis and policy making i mean if it is not helping it you nationally it won't work and australia is a very good example when we were starting work on with australia on the on the center framework monitoring we have a january as you would know january to december you know uh, calendar for for you have to report as of december what's the status australia has a disaster calendar which is about i think july to june or something like that right and obviously then that doesn't align with with what you want globally and and we had a lot of discussion on our regional team uh, from bangkok had a discussion with them uh and, and there was you know they they worked it out around it but but this is it the 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 national systems for loss tracking uh, and hazard event tracking should be for what it is tailor made for the country. It is not about how to make it, you know, in line with international uh, systems. That's secondary. It will help in SDG reporting. It will help in SDI framework monitoring reporting or any other reporting. That's incidental. But first and foremost, whether it's helping on risk analysis and risk, risk sensitive policy making for the country. That's where it would work. Um, my colleague Andrew is also here, and he he can and tell you how he's bringing in data systems from different uh, parts. So it's, so it's not just this is of course impact data, which means uh, post facto data, post uh, post facto post uh, uh, disaster data. But there is also obviously risk data which goes in, and it's it's the analysis of both that that will give really give uh, help in 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 policy making. So in in the interest of time, if I can now just close with the the last question we had, that how would you like to be engaged in this process? Please, madam. I'm from Sri Lanka. Actually, uh, I would like to do a suggestion. So uh, to the Descendentra system, if we can include the platform to show the global meteorological data uh, in the same system using uh, freely available sources, because there are many uh, rainfall data sources and uh, temperature data, uh, wind data, and there are many uh, freely available sources. So we can uh, uh, show these meteorological data in the same platform, I think it will be very helpful to uh, verify the disaster events. For an example, uh, we develop a system to monitor the forest fire using NASA firm's forest fire uh, real-time data layer. Uh, according to that system, we were able to identify that a lot of forest fire events had not been recorded to our system. So we identified that. So because of that, uh, real-time data layer. So uh, if we can so, uh, do this kind of things uh, to show the meteorological data in the same uh, system, I think it will be very helpful to identify the disaster events. So uh, it will be very helpful to verify the disaster events. Thank you. 
this is exactly the idea about the, uh, the hazard cataloging and the impact uh, the, to be in the same system. This is exactly the purpose of connecting it. But Jamie, if you want to. And that's part of the concept or one of the benefits of cataloging the hazards because you can look at the impacts. When we have the impact information, you can see whether the, for instance, warnings or advisories that we that are put out by the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services mm -hmm. Uh, have verified or not. That's not an absolute because sometimes you don't get the reports, you know, that, that would verify it. Sometimes you get an overabundance or uh, the, the, the reports are outside of the area that which are the warnings, warnings were issued. So the important thing for the, for the hazardous event catalog is to make sure that it verifies. And that's the quality assurance uh, mechanism and if we verify, as we verify that, and it is codified within the, the database itself, it, uh, it provides a valuable tool, especially for, you know, Dizaventar and for the countries to be able to say, well, yeah, this is, this is what we're forecasting. This is what we're experiencing. And when we're looking at disaster risk reduction and protection of people, we can say, oh, well, actually these particular areas we haven't thought about before, but maybe they are, uh, uh, possibly going to get new types of uh, systems. Like in Southern Canada, they're having more tornadoes. As the climate becomes warmer, you have more tornadoes moving north. These are things that you can look at from South Dakota and, and, and uh, in the central part of the United States and say, well, they, well they'll start having more of these type of really bad tornadoes. Um, so there's a lot of uses for that. And yes, I, I appreciate your question. I think it'll be um yeah, that's what we're aiming for sorry thank you so much jim professor murray thank you so much um I, I think your question is really interesting thank you for asking it but one of the things that we are planning to do for the next stage of developing the hazard information profiles is what jim describes as parent and child if you have a storm what children would it produce which is always the way he describes it to me but we normally just talk about it as drivers, outcomes and risk management. So trying to make sure that we've thought of possibly most of the impacts from that hazard, from the evidence that's available in the literature, I think will be a really useful resource to support the work that you're looking at. So you begin to see the types of infectious diseases, respiratory illnesses, but equally where you'll lose roads, buildings or other things in these events. And I think that's something that we would love your help in trying to engage with as we start trying to develop this work. We think it would be really useful if we did this in partnership with you and had your learning engaging in delivering this, but preferably via, because I'm a scientist, peer review. Thank you so much, Professor Murray. One thing is for certain, those storms will have some few very naughty children going around causing a lot of havoc. <laughs> Yes, uh, Virginia constantly chides me about parent-child relationships, but uh, <laughs> um, no, this is very important. I think within the work for the ICU and DRR, um, hazard uh, 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 naming and, and, and definitions and et cetera, to include in there are machine readable uh, relationships between hazards that are scientifically viable. Um, because the machine doesn't know the difference between a tornado and a waterfall. <laughs> There's, it, you have to tell it. And if we have something that provides a scientific basic basis of what is uh, possible and what isn't possible, it adds, it aids, uh, provides a significant um, uh, tool for machine learning and for uh, computing, uh, computation of possible risks and, and et cetera. Thank you, Jim. Justin, please. Well, if this is an opportunity to ask for support, um, I've got a concrete example to, to put on the table. Um, so starting in January, um, we're going to map um, for floods and for storms. Um, all of the uh, event data that we can get to observed impacts from this inventory databases, 
MDAT, IDMC's database, and a couple of others um, using well, using a couple of different approaches. But in any case, the request is it would be great to get some validation and peer review of that exercise so that the outcome of that can be taken forward and isn't just, you know, uh, doesn't just rest with the uh, crisis data bank. Thank you so much, Justin. Please, Nepal, and then Jaika, please. Uh, thank you. So talking about the cataloging of data, uh, hazard, exposure, vulnerability, impact. So uh, we'll categorize that uh, in, in, in the system. So uh, I was wondering if we could uh, add um, early warning, uh, like uh, if we are talking about impact, then if we can at least add early warning so that uh, the early action anticipated action can also be uh, added to it. Thank you. No, no, thank you. I mean, this this is more about data. It's about impact data. It's about the losses, right? It, the, the early warning and early action comes based on that those data that if this is happening or or the data that is, for example, the predictive data from from of, of the hazards that could be uh, predicted that what action needs to be taken, that is kind of uh, it's somewhat a beneficiary of that data set. So that's that's what we are looking towards so that we can provide that data to those who are going to provide that early warning and the early action. For example, local governments, if you can provide the data, they will be able to do better early warning and early action. That's the uh, Rajesh, did you want? Oh, sorry, do you have a point? I mean, I can, yes. Uh, I can Basically, uh, the way we are looking at the system, though, of course, in our minds, uh, all the time there is disinventor, we start thinking everything with respect to disinventor. But I think the new system should allow this kind of modular uh, additions. There are features which could be added depending on if you want to add, for example, this early warning. So given the data in the system, it could generate some analytics. And if there is a, another module associated with it, if required by the country, then it helps to generate certain kind of actions or recommendations. So a lot of these things could be automated and that's what we want to do. We want to have a flexible system. So, I, I mean, your suggestion is very good. And I'm sure there are more suggestions like this, which could come from others when the system is in front of you. So we, we really welcome such suggestions and ideas. So that will, to me, this, this will enrich the system. It's, the, it's the utilization in different country context. Nepal, you may need different things. A country maybe in the island building different kind of requirements. So how do we have a system where you could have some modules added to it, certain features added to it? If you need it, if you don't need them, then maybe you don't need to add them. Yeah, very good idea. Thank you. Jim, please. So in the Hydromet side, uh, national governments are responsible for their warning their systems. So early warning systems and that are inextricably linked to the response and protective measures that governments put in place for uh, for um, uh, protecting their people and their infrastructure. This um, this apparatus is triggered by the early warning uh process so what we have done and uh others uh have contributed significantly is the impact-based forecasting where we are looking at how uh, to to articulate warnings and information so that people understand it the information that we get from impact analysis and historical events contributes to that the whole process so we under so that we do it empirically or directly from the information that we have instead of saying oh well it could create you know uh some tree limbs to fall down instead through empirical nature we can say okay uh, large tree limbs can fall down from this or small tree limbs that makes a difference to people when they're when they're actually uh trying to protect themselves so what what we're doing as far as the data for that is trying to make it better and usable by these um uh forecast agencies 
to be able to, to, to do their job better, but also for the government agencies to protect their people. So it's really the, the, that part of impact-based forecasting and using it for protecting people is what comes out of the basic data. Thank you, Jim. And the floor to Jay and Jaika, but also we'd like to close with some reflections on how colleagues would like to be engaged in this process. Please, Jaika. Ah, thank you very much. And uh, so, sorry for just, uh, I, uh, how can I say, the reversing the discussion, but still uh, from the, our uh, experience, our supporting experience for the each government agencies, uh, still uh, before collaborating, uh, how can I say, the, the Met Office and the Disaster Management Organization, maybe still uh, each uh, department need to more, uh, how can I say, support, support to and need to more uh, develop an improvement of uh, the each agencies. This this is our, uh, how can I say, the main concern, and uh, because uh, and 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 also uh, the necessity uh, of the data is uh, different from the, uh, the sector by sector uh, because uh, national uh, disaster management uh, organization uh, basically necessary for the uh, very short term and the reliable and very accurate uh, information and uh, hazard information for the uh, how can I say quick response and to save the people. Uh, so in in that case, maybe Met Office uh, how can I say produce a very quality. Uh, how can I say, quality data. But uh, for the uh, agriculture sector or uh, infrastructure sector, for the disaster risk reduction or pre-disaster investment, and then they, uh, they need uh, the long-term, uh, how can I say, compiling data or the trend of the, uh, the met, uh, meteorological uh, data. So they need uh, basically long-term data for the uh, so, so better future. So the, the necessity of the data is uh, different. So I think the, the, that platform uh, should cover uh, the long-term short term and also the different uh, necessity uh, but uh, for the <laughs> finally we, i'd like to stress uh, still uh, met office and the disaster management agency uh, differently and uh, they need to more uh, improve their capacity and i also jaika uh, of course uh, we will continue to support uh, each agencies for the uh, many different countries thank you very much Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this forum is an example of what what you're exactly saying to bring bring and build our, each other's cap capacities and all of our capacities. And also, uh, just wanted to reflect in this or highlight in this in this the same vein. Uh, recently, we had um, a project on early warning system indicators by the cruise you know the cruise pro program, and that there we have been able to kind of have. Tra joint training programs with the Met Office and the, the system management officers in the Pacific, the Caribbean, and the West Africa, basically covering the SIDS and most of the, a number of the LDCs, let's say. Uh, and that has been very, very successful because the indicators were developed with their uh, feedback and it's been incorporated into the Sendai Framework Monitor as custom indicators so countries can choose from that menu that works for them. And the advantage is like someone like SPC in, in, the, in the Pacific or the SEDEMA in the Caribbean can actually help their, their member states to pick up or you know, have the monitoring system through common indicators that then you have a very easy compar comparability between the, the countries with similar backgrounds like SITS. So yeah, this is definitely uh, this is on, the, on the table when helping us. So is there, uh, before we close, any other feedback, especially how you would, you know, from an organization or a personal point of view, would like to remain engaged. And of course, you know, this is not the last time you'll hear from us for sure. <laughs> and we, we will definitely keep, you know, keep uh, engaging with you and, you know, writing back to you and wanting to hear back from you from, on, on, from different levels and different ways. I mean, this technical forum is only one way. Uh, you know, nowadays we are so much well connected, but anything from your side, we'd be grateful to hear. Okay, if you don't have anything from Jim, Ramesh, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, is there a hand up? Mr. Yeah, please, Bangladesh. Uh, as we already have heard, uh, most of the countries didn't able to give their data to Sunday Monitor, right? Uh, we heard uh, only five countries, they have been able to complete it for all uh, sector data into Sunday monitor. So I think here one thing is uh, very important, uh, local level data collection mechanism need to be strengthened. 
and uh, support from um, development partners is necessary here. That's because we also need to identify the sector, major sectors. We should not go for, uh, as a sector, we should not go for it's an open ending, right? So how many sectors country should consider? As, let ha uh, let's have an example. In Bangladesh, our local data collection mechanism uh, provides only 20 sectoral information, 27 sectoral information. So how many sectors is required for Sendai monitor? That is very important as because maybe we don't have some sectors in our local mechanism. So we'll have to integrate those sector in our local data collection mechanism. So that is very important. We need to consider, I think. We also uh, need to consider the standard or unit uh, measurement unit. So otherwise, uh, it will be uh, time consuming as a, because whenever country will try to enter data into the Sendai monitor, they will have to again convert data unit, right? So we'll have to think about the standard mechanism. Let's say in Bangladesh, maybe in many countries, uh, whenever they are collecting data from the field, they specify the unit measurement unit as mile. Some country consider as kilometer. So Sendai monitor should not allow both the unit for their, right? So this sort of issues need to be think, I think, yeah. Thank you so much. I think just to clarify, I think uh, you may have been a bit of confusion on, on the number of countries. I think the colleague there from IOM was reflecting to countries in disinventor, which may have a long period of uh, time series data. That may be a few countries only. On Sendai Framework Monitor, yes, we have, I mean, we have 150 countries reporting on plus 150 plus 155 countries reporting on at least one of the uh, one of the targets and i think at least half of them would have or a little less maybe having all all seven targets so uh, from a targets point of view yes most of them are covered but from a sectoral point of view uh, the main sectors there are of course health education um infrastructure uh, uh those are the, those are the like uh, and agriculture of course uh, that are that are highlighted and of course, then there are others productive areas that they say. So it depends on, as you said, it depends on country to country. A small island will have tourism sector, for example, and others. So it depends on the country. Uh, on your units of measurement, yes, we, we have the technical guidance and we are tr constantly trying to improve on that so that the technical guidance clearly mentions and clarifies what, what kind of information is expected from each of the indicators. So that, that and, in, and in the annex, if you've got all the in, industries, for example, the whole list of industries uh, that is the, 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 the international classification, and we are also incorporating, and which is a bit of a, uh, uh, it sounds easy, the, the, the hazard classification, the new one, but as you would know that the data has been already re recorded. So we are also working with previously recorded data on, on the hazard class. So, so all of these are parallel uh, processes we're working on. But on, on but thank you so much for the uh, you know feedback on the system, which we've taken rigorous notes. Uh, our note takers have taken the notes and our reporter will try to kind of give the high level uh, you know feedback or, or recommendations that have come in. Uh, and we'll, we'll I guess reconvene, we are waiting for the others to come in and we'll, I guess, convene in about another five minutes. Uh, oh, sorry. This is first is the tea. I think we can break break for tea now. Yeah, we break for tea now, and then we we reconvene at uh, forty five. Oh, it's forty five now. Sorry, four o'clock. We'll reconvene at four o'clock. Okay. You see the picture that I took? Yes, I was going to reply to you. It's so embarrassing. I'm looking for the person who did it. <laughs> no, I thought it was kind of funny, probably. I don't know who did that. Like, I've been asking a few people, you know, that, are you trying to take a Mickey? Oh, God. <laughs>
Colleagues, welcome back for our final plenary report back from breakout groups. And I kindly ask the group rapporteurs to come to the podium. If you are a group rapporteur, make your way to the front, please. Group A is still missing, if I'm not mistaken. A is, a a is missing. Okay, Justin, there you are. A loss or oh, <laughs> it is a loss, but we've we've managed it. We we saved Group A. Justin, if you don't mind, you can directly begin with um, a report from your breakout group. Okay. Um, do we already have a slide? ready for one of the groups which one is ready c okay let's begin with group c then and i ask you one more time for your full attention for our rapporteurs over to you group c Okay, um, good evening again. Uh, we are glad for this uh, technical forum and uh, we discussed thoroughly um, a lot about the proposed model. Um, and after uh, entering to the strength uh, and uh, opportunities, I will uh, highlight two uh, strategic uh, outlines. The first one that uh, these models are important for humanity. Our uh, risks and challenges are unified. The climate change issue uh, uh, gives us the opportunity to work together more and to cooperate. And of course, uh, the shape of threats and risks, not only in its hybrid form, but also in its cross-bordering effect, uh, gives us this opportunity to have more cooperation. Uh, our group discussed uh, a lot uh, the proposed uh, model, and we have uh, three main uh, um, comments about it. The first one, that the model is simple in its shape, which is important to be accessible and easy to use. But uh, I believe that uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, risks should be included, especially that's related to insects, for instance, uh, the change behavior of animal and uh, ecosystem uh, provide us with some uh, uh, unnotable uh, hazards. Uh, we mentioned also that the technologies offer the opportunity for forecasting. Uh, the AI and the open source is the solution. There is uh, uh, an, a survey done by SSC Labs 2021 provides, and I recommend everyone to read this report, provides that 94% uh, of uh, more than 20,000 corporations are preferred the open source applications rather than the uh, in-house hardware applications. So that gives us some hint that the world is going for more cooperation and networking. The other thing that uh, using the hydrometrological data to fill uh, the event data gaps is important according to the country and uh, according to the standards of that country, which means that the risk will be defined in its sort by the data provider. Uh, also, uh, uh, the event recording should be as close to real time as possible, uh, since a lot of risks uh, may be um, 
um, has a lot of challenges in response. So we need that real time as much as we can. And we should use other data sets and statistics in the website to help to calculate the uh, microeconomic impacts and the social impacts. Social impacts, microeconomic uh, impacts are important to be calculated in impact, are very important also to be taken in consideration. The, the international social behavior is changing as well. So this uh, should be highlighted. And uh, next slide, please, if possible. OK. Um, um, we, we are also having uh, to another point, how that countries will take benefit from that model in planning. I'm not talking here about countries rather than local governments. Local governments planning regional planning and country planning will get benefit a lot of using these uh, models that have the databases. Uh, the lesson learned issue from other countries can help the others to be more efficient in preparedness and in response. Again, linking the dots and linking the data is vital for all humanity, not only for the uh, data providers. Uh, uh, query pages needs to be updated. Uh, this is one of uh, the comments for uh, the S inventor, uh, and we agree about it. And building hazard information into the new system uh, so people can understand the uh, uh, taxonomy without reading a PDF, which means we need the information to be visualized in more um, um, dynamic, more, uh, sorry if, for using the word, for more uh, sexy content, I'm sorry for using this, uh, to be uh, adaptable in media and social media and OSINT uh, applications. And uh, I think countries should conduct a survey exercise to generate suggestions on the need from the countries for uh, this platform. Again, uh, simplicity is over human mentality, as they said. The, the model is simple, but it should be accessible. And why we will use it? Because of the risks that gather us together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. And uh, Justin, we can proceed with you, Group A. You also have seven minutes. OK, thanks very much. Um, feedback from Group A. Firstly, thanks to all of the participants of Group A for the lively feedback. And then my apologies that you're hearing from me again. Um, so one of the strengths um, was that we were rather quickly able to um, come to some consensus, at least on some of the principles um, that the system should uh, have or should build on if they already exist. One has to do with transparency of the data and the methodologies used to produce it, um, both from the uh, um, HydroMet uh, event data side, but also um, perhaps more just as importantly on the uh, impacts. Um, and one of the other strengths is that the new, new disinventar um, will underscore the need to use uh, official government uh, data, um, which is both a strength and a weakness. On the strength aspect, it, because it's government endorsed data, um, it should therefore implicitly have the buy-in of the government and the government um, would be more likely to use the data um, since they've endorsed it. Um, another um, strength would be to um, build upon existing methods, uh, particularly in the HydroMet system, um, to verify uh, the data and to triangulate um, the measurements um, on the impact side. Um, another is to build upon peer-to-peer -peer, uh, collaboration and reciprocal support, um, particularly for uh, countries um, that may be lacking um, either the, the skills or the infrastructure um, needed to keep these systems up to date um, in a robust manner. If we can go to the next slide. 
um, some of the specific features that we thought would be uh, important to include. Um, one is to uh, put hydromet uh, forecasts or impact forecasts into some kind of historical context so that um, um, end users um, may um, have a better idea of what kind of impacts to expect and what actions to take. Um, that doesn't preclude putting them into a kind of some probabilistic context either, but um, but 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 uh, there the idea there is to simply just align the the output with the needs of the user. Um, to make sure that we include um, the relevant sector sectors, uh, particularly those that may not be. Uh, obviously um, emphasized or included up to the present. Um, so things like um, the ag sector in particular and impacts on crops, livestock, uh, and so forth. Um, another key principle or feature would be to make the system um, agnostic rather than completely bespoke so that we have a, essentially a common core that can be adapted uh, to specific country contexts rather than 192 separate systems. Um, then there are a number of features for um, uh, at the technical level, so uh, simplified uh, data options, uh, data download options, and, and user interface and, uh, and recording, um, making sure that we can disaggregate the data at the district and provincial level, um, having a baseline data entry, and yeah, while we're waiting for the, the screen to come back, um, another recommendation was to find out where Yuichi is going to be in 20 years from now so we can make sure that he's available to join us uh, at the next every, uh, uh, Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> we can track down Andrew. Uh, to, um, so make sure that the data is collected in a way that's machine readable. As we know, uh, a lot of the time, the data is still being collected on paper um, or is, is captured and then shared in PDFs, um, which is makes, makes it a bit more difficult to, to aggregate. Um, and do not present this uh, new system as a reporting tool, um, because then it sounds like it's a burden for users rather than a tool for which you know they may actually have incentives to use and to support. Um, and to make sure that we also uh, design in it into it ways that makes it that facilitates the data sharing um, across different systems, because obviously, even though this this system um, may need to be internally coherent, um, it's not a closed system, and it needs to be able to um, send and receive data to to other partners, platforms, and systems. Um, next slide. What we need to improve. Um, so we need, um, I think, some some pilots and some and some champions. Um, um, so uh, we build on what already you know where there's interest. Um, we want to make sure that we're aligned with the the, the Sendai reporting indicators. Um, that, that we need to do a better job of keeping the data up to date. And there are a number of different ways potentially to do that. Um, and we need to make sure that we work backward from uh, our user needs rather than, uh, as Debbie mentioned at the beginning of the day, um, you know, being uh, six characters in search of an author. We can't be, you know, a, a bunch of solutions in search of problems. Um, the downside to using the official, uh, officially endorsed government data is that it may restrict, uh, at least for the time being, the data that is available to be used to populate uh, the database. Um, there are examples where non-traditional data um, has been uh, incorporated into official statistics in the health sector. Um, I can bore you with that uh, afterward if you are interested. Um, and um, uh, let's see. Um, I think one of the, the, the key points that Paul had made was the need for us to really uh, demonstrate the concrete use of this um, so that we have some very tangible demonstration and pilot projects so that this doesn't remain some kind of abstract exercise, but that we ground it in a way that demonstrably creates value for key end user partners, um, including, you know, uh, but not limited to the national disaster management organizations. Um, and I think that may be our last slide anyhow.
Okay. Well, the last bullet point on there was to just, we're relevant, a bunch of the, the national hydro, med and NDMO uh, services need to enhance their capacities to, you know, do monitoring um, and, and sharing of information, but. Thank you, Justin. And we move to group B with a colleague from Japan. Yeah, thank you. The Justin and I shared the office in ISDR for the 20 years ago, so he, he can say anything on me. <laughs> okay, the group B. Uh, they are, these are the voices I heard from the, um, the uh, members on the group B. Um, not uh, having a strength and the needs for uh, improvement, I put everything together. So I, maybe I shouldn't depend too much on the slide. But the first, uh, this coherence uh, between the um, those uh, different uh, data set uh, or the methodology, PDNA, MDAT, this inventor, and so on. But the many platforms, the, the countries wanted to have a more coherence on these different um, platform or the methodologies. Uh, it was not easy to understand each of the, the strengths and the, what is the missing challenges and so on. Then I, I forgot to mention, but our group B has a more uh, participants from uh, island countries and Latin American countries. And thank uh, Janet for translation of the Spanish to English. Uh, the, another point was the, um, um, the question um, request for the uh, clarifying the cascading hazard and damages uh, tsunami causing uh, you know um, the, uh, I mean aspect caused tsunami tsunami caused fire and so on so the cascading impacts should be uh, into the system and uh, uh, this uh, loss and damage database uh, the new one to stick to the Sendai framework not too much expanding the framework of the Sendai but the, don't forget about the ultimate goal of this uh, our exercises to save lives and uh, economic losses then uh, there was some confusion in the purpose of uh, what we are doing for this uh, uh, new system so the purpose should be uh, revisited and clarified that was the voice then a regional issue. There are some regional issues. That, for example, the uh, island countries needs a geographically wide area to cover. So uh, remote sensing is a very important component. So and uh, um, uh, by di different geographic um, boundaries, areas has, should have a uh, different uh, kind of hazard. So the specific region specific approach is uh, necessary. Then, uh, um, then here, uh, some governments uh, way ahead some governments are just starting some government not even started so the phased approach i think largest undp mentioned there should be a phased approach maybe three categorizing uh, categorized countries to uh, have uh, support uh, for this uh, exercise then um, data gap analysis should be done uh, before talking about uh, the uh, new system uh, definition and loss and uh, damages are not still very well understood by the governments so it needs more clari cl uh, clarifying this uh, issue and uh, although a minimum standard minimum set of standards are necessary those voices are heard and the technical support is necessary uh, some someone mentioned that providing technical support willingness to provide technical support but the capacity development for this uh, developing the new system is definitely needed then uh, there's a one voice well okay, okay we are talking about the cop 27 and this um, making a new fund uh, for the loss and damage fund but uh, um, there's a um, sort of a um, voices that the climate change ad uh, agenda is so strong that DRR agenda, Sendai, is swallowed by such a big agenda. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when we when people go to the climate change agenda, those negotiators are from the Minister of Environment. The, there's a very small space for DRR uh, people to take a law. So we should be uh, careful about uh, not to be swallowed by the new agenda, but we should be the lead of the uh, loss and damage uh, in the disaster. And uh, lack of political will, this was mentioned by the Sudan that uh, uh, although uh, the Sudanese uh, government, uh, uh, the, I think UNDP provided support, but uh, even the password was uh, used, not used uh, for, by the government. So uh, against lack of the political will of the government, it's a challenge to how to convey, uh, convince this new approach. It would be the uh, same matter in coming up. And the uh, last one is to uh, have a voices that uh, Yes, country level, it, it needs to have a harmonizing this uh, NMHS and uh, NDMO, but at the international level, UN level, again, 
are the UN CCCC, FCCC, WMO, UNDP, and UNDR. They should have a more coherent and harmonized. And this is a good step, but uh, need a more harmonized way of approach. That's uh, about the things, but uh, maybe I'm missing. So I, if, if I'm missing some point, please, Alex, thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, we will have the chance in a minute after we've heard all groups um, to have further contributions by group members from the floor. But uh, we first move to the colleague from uh, Mauritius and uh, the report from group D. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be presenting our feedback from Group D. So our members brainstormed more on the improvement and recommendation, recommendations and support. So the first one is that we, we discussed that it would be good to ensure that we build agreement on the definitions of term, terminologies and effects and of damages and effects and impacts. So, and then we need to invest in capacity development in country on assessing damages and losses and estimating impacts. Also, we need to customize solutions to different institutional contexts. For example, what is uh, what works in big developing countries does not necessarily, necessarily works in small island development states and uh, also ensure engagement of regional centers that can provide support in uh, meteorological organizations and uh, to engage other organizations responsible for other hazards such as uh, the health sector, agricultural sector for pests and diseases. Uh, we should also, we need also to develop concrete guide on what the approach means for the different stakeholders to involve across the data value chain. And to continue the supporting policy development to ensure there are high level guidance and requirements for data sharing. Uh, we should assess well the limitations gapped on existing systems to inform development of the new one and make more precise uh, the level of disaggregation, uh, which will be optimal for impact collection, uh, enabling high level of dis disaggregation, example by type of assets like roads, but also at the geographical level. And uh, uh, like uh, my colleague from Japan mentioned that we should invest more on champions within government that model pilot new applications to motivate others and demonstrate the, the rationale for investing in improved data management. And the flexibility of the system will be very important. So it should be open source, customi customizable, flexible to adapt to new changes, new needs. So we should opt for a contextual approach and customizable platform. Um, also, we should have a prototype as a means to collect more concrete feedback and ensure the testing of new systems and a way to systemize the, the feedback. Uh, we need to identify representatives also from some countries to contribute in the working groups, sessions, and community of practices. And our last point was that it, we need to clarify if the new system is meant to replace others or become the new one platform and what is the offer for those that already have uh, make sure uh, what is the purpose of the data thank you that's all thank you. thank you very much we've heard all group presentations and group reports are there any further contributions from the floor things you wanted to raise and mention Johan? No? Oh, okay. Questions you had on the group reports? Otherwise we have to testify they were perfect and clear. No questions open. Okay, then let's have another round with the colleagues here with the rapporteurs. Um, in one sentence, same question as yesterday, what is your key takeaway from today? 
how does it maybe connect to your key takeaway from yesterday if you want to make that uh, addition justin do you want to start okay <clears throat> uh, my key takeaway from today i think is to really build in from the start um the user uh, needs in the use case and to make that clear uh throughout um as a way to really I think as Jim calls it, highlight the full value chain um, so that we can make sure to incentivize the different actors along the way to keep them engaged and to make sure that what we propose is in fact implementable and sustainable um, and doesn't, you know, something that doesn't, you know, we're not here like the PDF screenshot I showed you um, from this morning where we come back in a hundred years and wonder why we haven't made too much progress. Um, with regard to your other questions, I'm not smart enough to remember my takeaway myself yesterday. <laughs> so I think I might just pass to, to group B. Yes, group B. Okay, I'm, I'm making a determination ladder. So I, I will try to help more on this linkage between the NDMO and the, the NMHS is a database and the coherence uh, to how uh, I can help um, for uh, think about it. Uh, then. Uh, uh, I thank UNDR, the Animesh team, for co-organizing this uh, very good, coherent meeting. Uh, so then the last wheel is, uh, I hope I can leave the uh, next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Um, uh, building on my colleague's uh, point is to build the culture, culture of data collection from micro level to national level and to reflect it on the international cooperation. Uh, my takeaway will be interoperability and the sustainability of uh, the data collection process and the new model that is being proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much again to our rapporteurs. Please, a round of applause for them. And let me just remind the colleagues who've put Rahul as a key takeaway from yesterday that Rahul is actually not for takeaway. He, he wants to stay with UNDRR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So can we have our final round of reflections uh, from the organizing institutions? Um, I asked Jim and Animesh and uh, Rajesh, are you doing it or Sonny, Rajesh, to come to the front and share some of your overall reflections on this technical expert forum. from this way. So thanks a lot, everyone. We have reached the conclusion of this very, very substantive event with uh, very positive feedback from all of you. So I think uh, we have achieved the purpose with which we had planned this event, which was to bring all of us together, put our collective wisdom together, and then chart a way forward, which will have an implication on a very important topic that all of us have been discussing and working on. A few things that uh, I would want to highlight from what was just being presented. It's very important that as we move forward, that we use loss and damage discussion or in losses and damages discussion as a key basis to better align climate and disaster reduction communities because that's a common denominator. As I've been mentioning a few times that as this discussion on loss and damage is transitioning from a political to a technical and substantive issue, let's make the best of this opportunity because we need to know as we move forward towards funding and Santiago network discussions, it's very important for us to be able to say, how much are we losing? Where are we losing and so on? Unless we can become that concrete, this discussion will not move very, very much forward. Now, which is something you were talking about 
COP27 and COPs taking over. No, I mean, it's all coming together. At Sharm el Sheikh, actually, I counted the number of countries that had national disaster management offices in their delegation, there were 40 governments at the COP who came with NDMOs. And this number is only going to increase considering that loss and damage is becoming a bigger agenda. So that's something which we should be able to work further to provide that evidence of impact of climate change so that we can have more concrete discussion. Something else which also I was noticing that uh, we are trying to distinguish between tracking and recording of events and impacts vis-a-vis -vis reporting requirements. And I think we should not look at them at two different things. Why do we report data? We collect data to report so that we make it official to be able to tell ourselves how are we doing vis-a-vis -vis our disaster reduction efforts. So reporting is just not about compliance. It's about following a process to be able to assess our own progress. One thing which also I would want to highlight and flag to all of you before I move forward on the way forward, what is the name of the new system? Uh, this is something which we have had many brainstorms uh, internally as well, and uh, we have still not reached a conclusion, I think we have, we have still a lot of time to discuss this further. It definitely would not be disinventor. It should not be anything to do with accounting, should not be to do with monitoring. Let's be innovative. Well, when, what we should be the name of the new system when it is in place? We have time for that, so let's not move it, but keep thinking and please keep sending your feedback and suggestions on what should be the name of the new system. So let's, what we have been doing is that the three organizations have been uh, brainstorming collectively and thinking, okay, what should be the key steps from here on so that this event doesn't remain an event, but becomes a process. So let's, we have kind of funneled down into a few specific points in terms of the next steps. Um, yeah. So uh, in the next one month, we will document all your recommendations, all the discussions across all the breakouts and all the plenaries into a very substantive workshop report, which will document all the recommendations, issues and everything. And this will work as a kind of a report, a document to be used to inform the design of the new system. And all your feedback, which have been so valuable and so substantive, we will ensure that each of them is considered while we start moving forward towards the new system design. While doing so, many of the gaps and challenges that have been highlighted, we will need to ensure that we fulfill them and we address them. The current system disinventor has been there for the last 25 years and was started or developed first time 20 years before the Sendai framework was adopted. We have reached that stage of, of maturity and our own evolution in our thinking, where we can criticize that system, which has been there for 25 years and being used by more than 100 countries. That shows that we have matured in our own understanding. Let's use that understanding and evolved thinking to develop a system that will at least take us to the next 25 years. The second thing which we, we want your a kind of a recommendation from or a bit of an endorsement, because we were not sure whether this is something we should move forward on, we want to do a kind of a policy paper, a think piece, a publication, which will build on the workshop report that will bring together your collective thinking in terms of how do we work and record disaster, loss, disaster losses, hazardous events, and what, has, what are the nuances in doing so? What is the new thinking? Should we put together as a policy paper on this and publish it in the next few months and at the earliest possibility with all your collaboration? So any feedback on this, we will open up the floor and see if you have any suggestion on that. But that's something which we would be very much happy to work together on a, a co-branded paper between the three organizations, but with all your contributions. We also think that as this work progresses, we will need to do a lot of country level follow up. And I think UNDP is very well placed because they have a network of country offices. Can we start following up with the governments? Can we start building up the maturity report where we had 13 countries participating and all the countries which are present here? Can we start building up the basis for that national level dialogues and interactions? On the side of WMO, we uh, maybe, Jim, maybe you can come in at this point to explain the WMO process on this as well. 
So WMO also has a, a agency in every country. So working together with UNDP specifically to be able to bridge this gap between the NDMOs and the NMHSs is, is imperative. And this process here, as far as the approval, upon the approval of the WMO catalog, which is expected in early March, actually it's, uh, it should be late February, early March. Uh, we'll be embarking on the implementation. We intend to do that in conjunction with UNDP and UNDR as partners to be able to facilitate um, meetings, kickoff meetings in WMO regions whereby the MET services and the NDMOs come together to be able to help start bridging this gap, something that uh, Yuichi has said it was 20 years ago. I think we can make movement on this now, especially with the development of the last comp. Um, so this is something I think that we, we really would encourage engagement from you as well as the the uh, as well as the countries themselves. Thank you, Jim and Rajesh. Over to you as well in terms of any elaboration on the country level follow up or any other point that you would want to highlight on the next step. I just want to add. I mean, in fact, uh, you have very elaborately covered what is listed on the slide. But uh, I mean, we will continue to meet frequently, discuss things, and prioritize as because whatever is discussed now, agreed now, of course, everything is not cast in stone. So we will continue to meet, prioritize, and as things become important. Uh, place more attention to them and as and when required, engage with our country colleagues, bring them up to speed if required, maybe in, from uh, like selected countries, bring them for consultation, their feedback inputs, because as UNDP, we are aware uh, in different regions, which countries have what kind of challenges, where some countries have done extremely well, where they are struggling. So depending on the context and the inputs required, we will engage with the governments and bring them on board in terms of getting their inputs. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to be our system. We will collectively develop this and try to address the challenges, problems we are facing. And it's going to be an interactive process from now onwards. So it is not going to be just one or two meetings or something like that. So it's a very interactive process and uh, we will continue to work together. And uh, I'm sure periodically we will also share the results of where we are in a larger group, sometimes in smaller groups. And uh, among three of us, we will discuss things and probably put down more details uh, uh, early next year. How are you going to uh, work towards it? That's all. Thanks, Rajesh. And just to conclude in terms of our proposed next steps, um, in the presentation that was made right post lunch that this has been a process and this event has been a milestone in that process. So what Iria was presenting earlier that we have done a discovery and needs analysis, we have developed a visioning paper, we have completed a maturity assessment. Now we have brought all of us together to have a brainstorming in terms of the next steps. What we are doing right away, based on your feedback and suggestions, we will start working on a prototype of the new system. And the prototype of the new system should be ready around uh, in the first half of next year. And our suggestion and proposal is that we bring you back as many of you as possible here in April, where we present back to you the prototype. And we'll see how far your recommendations and suggestions that you have made today are reflected in the prototype. We will adjust based on your recommendations then, and then move on towards the real big system design. So that's the kind of uh, inclusive process that we intend to follow from now on. Um, so these are the key recommendations and on the next steps or proposals, but any feedback that you have, please, the floor is open for, for all of you. Saira. Thank you very much, Animesh and uh, UNDP colleagues and WMO colleagues. It was very interesting uh, technical forum. I just have one suggestion because at the regional level, uh, we are dealing with the countries. Is it possible, especially on the new prototype to send, and I discussed this in the breakout session as well, to share a survey analysis you know, with the features of the new prototype because every country has a specific uh, uh, they have a specific need and 
and some of them are interested in new da data analytics part, analysis module, the statistical report, even we discussed on the economic modeling part, how to use that data. So if we can share the survey analysis to the country so that they can get back, it's in, in the countries I know it's a very bureaucratic process and they have to get go back to their, uh, uh, you know, um, to their ministries and they discuss with each other. So uh, in this way, we can have a concrete example of how to move forward for the new prototype. I mean, we can have, of course, partnership and discussion later on, but having this through a survey analysis, it will give us all a clear picture where we stand. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That's a very good suggestion. In fact, that was one of the recommendations of a breakout group as well that use the prototype development process to collect feedback from countries. So I think that's something which we will definitely do. Uichi san Yes. Uh, the, my point for the concern about uh, this uh, COP process is not my uh, voice. It was uh, Costa Rica's representative voice and the uh, government of Japan. Um, we are not under UNFCC. We are not under SDGs. We are following up on the center framework. That needs to be cl cleared. And the secretariat of UNDRR should acknowledge the concern of the governments, many, actually many governments. Of, uh, we are not under anything. We are the one to implement the Sendai framework. So um, I'm going to meet with the government of Japan to meet with uh, Mami Mizutori next weekend. So we will raise this voice. We have to. So please be concerned about this. Thank you uh, with the acknowledgement, but also the point that the success of Sendai also depends on other conventions and frameworks. Kanza. Thank you, Animesh. And I think um, I'm really pleased to hear we're going to be in a position to test the prototype because this is now becoming real and it's exciting. One of my pleas would be is to ensure that we have a good mix of member state representatives when it's being tested, just to acknowledge that all countries have different surveillance type levels, different way of disaggregating data, and we need to make sure that it is as representative as possible of low, middle and high income countries. And if we can build that into the prototype testing, I think it would be, it'd be an excellent approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kansa. And that's also uh, has a pointer towards the statisticians in the room as well in terms of bringing them together as we move forward. Other feedback? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Mohammed Hamid from Sudan. Actually, I am concerned with making a disaster risk reduction forum. Can we consider this meeting as an initial seat for a forum of disaster risk reduction specialists. And we can move forward then if you wanted to make any other practices or exercises in the future, so that it might be a, a suitable forum for exchanging ideas and uh, experiences. Thank you. Thanks for the suggestion. My immediate reaction to that is, of course, it makes sense to have a community of practice. Uh, of practitioners of uh, all the people sitting here. Um, but we would also have to acknowledge that we have existing coordination platforms like the global platform that happens every three years, the regional platforms that happen every three years. And then we have other mechanisms where we can bring two people together as well. But I think it's very important that the collective expertise of this room is retained as we move forward because we have found it very useful. So thank you for that suggestion. Oh, yes, please, ma'am. Merci pour la parole donnée. Oui, je suis Madame Ella du Cameroun. Comme je vous l'ai dit hier, je voudrais savoir comment vous pouvez accompagner le Cameroun euh, dans la collecte des données, parce que, comme vous le faites ailleurs, nous avons vraiment besoin de l'accompagnement du PNUD pour, par exemple, la stratégie, pour élaborer notre stratégie qui va nous servir à mieux faire le reporting. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Do we have any other feedback? Jennifer? Oh, just very specific because I don't recall having heard this over the past couple of days, the importance in terms of validity and quality control, just to ensure that we're not 
uh, leaving out the importance of the metadata behind the data, because as you have changes in government, changes in personnel, that becomes increasingly important. Thanks, Jennifer, and that goes very well with the importance of data standards um, and hence interoperability. Yes, but yes. Yes, I mean, here we see three successfully cooperating organizations, and there was a um, uh, a message in the Zoom chat, um, from, probably from a WHO colleague, I guess, uh, Vladimir uh, Nibedita, probably you know him or her. Um, it, it says, uh, today's forum is a step change to really capture the human loss data. I request UNDP, UNDRR and WMO to collaborate with WHO and national ministries of health and departments because they capture the causes of this, although we are still behind in capturing the circumstances of this. That was from Nibedita. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. From uh, Action Against uh, it's a, it's a good consortium of organizations that's working on target A and B on human impact of disasters. Uh, any final point? Great. Yes, sir, please. Uh, sí, solo, un, solo un comentario final res, respecto a la... A, la nueva, a lo que se está pensando con la nueva herramienta y es que se tenga en consideración eh, el soporte a los usuarios. ¿sí? Eso es fundamental. Y no solamente en términos de, de capacitación para la implementación de lo nuevo, sino hacerle seguimiento una vez se haga implementación, seguimiento y soporte. O sea, que, que, la, que Naciones Unidas tenga el personal técnico para, para dar ese soporte constante, porque... Lo que hemos percibido en América Latina, por ejemplo, hablando de desinventar, es que es importante el acercamiento entre la institución que, que ofrece la herramienta y la institución que la recibe y la usa. Es simplemente es, es, esa recomendación para que el, el proceso tenga un poco más de éxito, tener un acompañamiento constante con el usuario. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot. That's a very important point. Okay. Yes, sir. You too. Uh, thank you. So, a quick one. Um, uh, I just want to uh, to appreciate the efforts that are being made here. And uh, as a country, I think you uh, countries, you have seen that um, uh, almost each and every country here they are moving towards digitization, and uh, uh, it would be very important that uh, we speed up the process of the prototype and the system. Uh, the challenge you have seen that. Uh, uh, if we delay in development of this system, it will be like a retrogressive somehow, because we will not be able to have uh, the countries build the system that will be able to feed into the new systems. And if we speed up this process, it means the uh, individual countries should be able to uh, program their systems that should be able so to automatically feed other data into uh, the systems. But if the countries move ahead and they uh, we go, uh, we come behind, it will be really difficult for the countries to also adapt to the new system. So it's just a plea that we speed up the process for the countries to develop their systems uh, along with those uh, uh, what we have agreed here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think that goes very well with the point being made on the following the maturity levels of countries, because each country is at such different levels. We cannot have one size fits all. Okay, any any final, final, final point? If not, then let me request my colleagues for some closing remarks, Jim. First, thank you. Uh, I've heard it, you've heard it from everybody here, but thank you so much for coming. I think your expertise has really added a tremendous value to this process and really kicked on the ball rolling in a sense in an area that has been stagnated for a long time. And I really hope that this is the beginning that we that we actually move this agenda further, further and that standards can be created. Um, I think one of the big takeaways that I get aside from all the ones that have been listed is the cooperation that's needed at the, at the national level between the National Med Services and the NDMOs, but other agencies, sectors like agriculture and et cetera. 
this ha this is imperative for any system that is built so that we have quality uh, information and data. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let's give a clap to WMO collaboration. Very nice. Ajish. I just want to thank uh, all our colleagues who have come from different parts of the world. And some have come with great difficulty in terms of getting their tickets at the last minute or visa. <laughs> So huge thanks to you. No, really, I mean, we are aware of the challenges. And sometimes being from the government, it takes a lot of time to get approval. So we really appreciate you coming here, participating and spending time with us and contributing to all the discussions so far. Huge thanks to all of you. And also our colleagues uh, from other agencies, other uh, international organizations, who also come here and contributing to various discussions. And of course, we will continue to engage with all of you and get your inputs in the, in the whole process. Huge thanks to our colleague from WMO and other uh, Zim and others uh, who are participating in this. And of course, uh, UNDRR, Laurie Animation, entire team here. I mean, they have been part of it. Uh, each one of them is working tirelessly for quite some time on this. In fact, we have been discussing uh, moving forward with this new next generation of disaster loss database for the last couple of years. This discussion has been going on. And it's really a pleasure that uh, we are holding this forum here and discussing this. So this is really a very concrete step moving forward. Just want to thank everyone who is involved with various kinds of logistics in supporting this, who are probably not part of this room, but they are engaged with us. Also the interpreters who are sitting behind somewhere <laughs> translating all the time. Huge thanks to everyone. And also of course to Matthias for facilitating. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajesh. And I take it here that the next steps that we have proposed on the screen, we move forward with them, with your endorsement. And as I have said, we will not leave you so easily. So we'll keep you engaged in every step moving on forward. And we look forward to seeing many of you in April in the same room, perhaps in a different venue with better IT support. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I mean, I would start uh, by just saying, as I've said in the reception yesterday as well, that just having all of you together here has been its success in itself. I've not seen many events where disaster management focal points, meteorological focal points, together with international organizations, more than 100 of them have stayed on, both in person and online for two days, discussing a very specific topic of importance. And that in itself, coming off us coming together, and no wonder in the morning in the Slido collaboration was on the top uh, as uh, as the highlight of the day. So I think that's something which goes to all of you. So for taking this topic so seriously and making all the way to Bonn. So really thank you all of you from the bottom of our heart in terms of ensuring that you took this topic at the top of your agenda and spent that busy part of the year here in Bonn. Um, of course, uh, UNDP has been our longstanding partner on this specific topic, and uh, we have a collaboration with UNDP ongoing for quite many years, but this topic has been one of the uh, areas of work where we have really progressed very well jointly. So Sani, Rajesh, uh, we have been like discussing on a regular basis and other colleagues as well who joined from UNDP and from different offices. And WMO collaboration, I think, has been a shot in the arm. Really, we feel that we wouldn't have moved forward in the way we have without WMO being on board. So Jim, all the credit goes to you for pulling it all together and all your colleagues as well. And also connecting us with the meteorological offices across all of these countries. So, so many countries have come with both Met offices and NDMO simply because UNDRR and WMO have used our convening roles to bring the two ministries together here. From, I would be uh, uh, um, failing in my duty if I don't acknowledge my own colleagues, but starting with uh, UNDRR colleagues, all of us, um, we have our headquarter colleagues from Geneva, Lori, who's not here in the room because she's in some other meeting, but she has been so supportive of this work, not only in terms of providing the right leadership, but also ensuring we have the funding uh, for uh, doing all of this. And I hope that this will continue. Uh, we have very strong donor interest, including from the German government, which is funding this event as well. So moving forward, that at least will not be an issue. And all the colleagues who have come from Geneva, uh, um, Genty, Andrew there, um, Laura, who has been working almost as our own colleague here in Bonn, and people who have been sitting in Geneva and helping us, but all our regional office colleagues from Panama to the Pacific who have made all the way to Bonn. Thanks to all of us, because we really have worked as a team to make it, make it ensure that we have a successful event. Now, Bonn colleagues, 
uh, we are a very small team. We don't have a big team working for this event. But I must say that each of us here in Bonn work for 150% of our time, all the time. So all the efforts that you've seen going, going into this has really been a very big success for us because we have worked as a team. But one person who, has work, who works for 200% of the time is Rahul. That's why he's part of Key Takeaway. <laughs> so please don't take him away. <laughs> Well. Yeah. So he has been the pillar behind this event, working collaboratively at different fronts, substantive logistics with different uh, people and organizations. So big kudos to him. Iria, who has joined us very recently from uh, another office, but now it's she's part of our team and has really come and started running with the agenda of this specific event. So really has done a very good job on this. Um, you will, wouldn't have seen Tamar in this room, but you would have seen her in the, registra or the registration desk, who has been working as one woman army of our team, working on different fronts and logistics and travel and so on. And of course, Zuan, Adas, Janvi, Martin, Mario, thanks to all of us, because we really have done work very as a team. Matthias, very nice knowing you through this event. I hope we have all co-learned a lot and we hope to remain in touch with you as well. Thanks for all your support. And to the interpreters, people may not have realized that interpreters have been sitting in three different quarters of the world while trying to translate through our colleagues based in Geneva. So with these, uh, I would say from the bottom of my heart, thanks to all of you. And we hope to meet again very soon in the new year. Happy new year and have a safe travels back. Thank you very much. We will share all the presentations, all the photographs with their links with all of you within this week. What you're seeing in front of you is the building where we had all of us standing. Can we see all of us? <laughs> okay, we'll see.